I worked deliveries in a really ritzy neighborhood in the Valley of California. The properties were stretched out along steep canyons and cliffs, so the roads are narrow and the driveways are always straight up and down. I was relatively new to the job and really enjoyed the different aspects of all of it. Driving all day on the clock, seeing beautiful places, unique houses, and the different people were all kind of a bonus for me. The story takes place before COVID, so delivery work was a little friendlier and not so scrutinized. One day, I had a particularly large shipment to disperse, and because of the layout of the neighborhood, I was just getting it done at a snail's pace, maybe even slower. I got a few packages jumbled up, found myself turning around more than once. The addresses on some of the homes were obscured by all kinds of nonsense, so locating some of the places was next to impossible. I didn't have a Tom Tom or Garmin to help me out. This was quite a while ago. I pride myself on being a low stress person, so I just took the one day, one mile, one package at a time. I did my best to lose myself in the scene views and radio hits, which honestly isn't hard to do out here. As the day wore on, I found myself with a rapidly dwindling load of mail, but the sun dipped and I realized that I was now working overtime. We usually had to check this out with a supervisor, but I'd already gone over an hour at this point and I only had a few parcels left, so I just ran with it and decided to finish up. Because I was late, I started driving a little quicker and going right up to the houses instead of the end of the driveway. The less walking I did, the better, especially with the long roadways. I get the address off the next drop and start driving out into a darker area of the neighborhood. There's only a couple of houses out here and even then, and only one or two of them actually have lights on. These homes are the biggest out here. I've seen multi-million dollar homes with all kinds of crazy outdoor wreck. I pass a gate, take a turn, and find myself driving up a very long, lonely driveway up a hillside. Once I get to the top, the house is absolutely stunning. There's a multi-car garage and what looks like a guest house above that, and a terrace that connects it to the house, and then this utterly Romanesque house that towers above the cliffside. My first initial thought is, what the hell could this person have ordered that they don't actually already have? The package is mid-sized and kind of heavy, but I'm not nosy so I don't shake it or anything. I walk it up to the door. Because it's late and the house is so out of the way, I don't bother ringing the doorbell. With my luck, it'll be a celebrity I like and I'll have to disturb their private dinner party or something. As I turn and start heading back toward the van, one of the garage doors opens beside me. Lights spill out and illuminates the driveway. I turn to see a pair of headlights coming up the pass. They slow to a stop when they see me and then park jackknifed in front of the exit. I thought it was kind of weird, but then it occurred to me they might have security up here. I did pass through a gate, so maybe someone is coming to see what I was doing here, especially so late at night. I had the package already delivered, so I figured everything would be very easy to explain. The door opens. Out comes this tall, decently built guy. He's not threatening or anything, just has his hands in his pocket as he checks out my work van. When he sees it's the very recognizable logo, he nods and seems relieved. I say hello and explain that I've been behind all day. He says it's all fine. He didn't know who I was and then explained that he was having issues with trespassers on the property, especially over the last few months. I say how crazy that seems to me, considering how far out of the city we are how isolated the cliff sides are. He smiles, says yeah, and it is crazy, but so are the people who keep showing up. I laugh, but he doesn't react after that, just stares at me with this weird glare, as if I'm one of those people sneaking around his property. Awkwardly, I tell him to have a good night and then start to walk back towards the van. He stops me and says, don't I have to sign for that? I shake my head and say no, not necessarily. He insists, certain that I'm making some kind of mistake. He keeps staring me down with those dark, dead eyes. For as well put together as this guy is, his demeanor is legitimately scary, like crazy scary. I look over the spotless blacked out SUV that he just drove up the hill, and then it hits me. He's gotta be on some kind of drugs. I ask him if he can move his car, to which he corrects me, says it's more like a truck. It has 4x4, a lift all kinds of aftermarket additions. He then asked me if I want to see them, to which I decline. Now I'm getting seriously weirded out. Every time he speaks, he takes these little, almost unnoticeable steps towards me. 
and before long, he's only a couple of feet from me. He looks over my van and asks about the specs of it. I work for the delivery company. I don't know anything about the van. He nods and then does a lap around it, then starts telling me what he thinks about it. He compliments the suspension and then criticizes the paint, but he says he understands it's a car on the clock. Speaking of clock, I really need to get out of here. I ask him if he can move his truck again. He nods, but then holds out his hand. He asked if I have that paperwork for him to sign. Oh my God, you have to be kidding me. This guy was like coked out, obsessed with the notion of having some kind of receipt. I went to the van, wrote a slip for the package out of sheer desire just to get out of here. The whole time I'm riding, he's still circling the van, telling me all kinds of weird stuff about it, like the preferred gasoline and how easy it'd be to cut the brake lines. Now I'm starting to sweat. I can see through the veneer of his wealth, and what I see is a total creep. Bad teeth, bad skin, eyes so dark that they're sunken, and they totally blend in with the dark night sky behind him. I signed the sticker and then handed it over to him. He looked it up and down and nodded, but didn't sign it. He asked me if I knew why he wanted that, and I told him no. He looked me in the eyes and said just in case anything bad happens to you, I can tell them that it didn't happen here. It's got the time you left and everything. He points to the camera on the corner of the garage, but didn't turn to look at it. Just made the gesture. He said his signature lined up with the time on the security system of when I left. I smiled and said, thank you so much for your concern. I appreciate all the extra measures. He laughs. He said it was for him, not me. So now if I drove away and got raped and murdered and thrown off the cliffside, he wouldn't be involved in the investigation. It was like his alibi. These are his words, and he's now closing the last few steps between us. I backed into the driver's seat of the van, but he was so close, I couldn't even close the door. I started to panic, and the emotions rolled across my face. He stops, laughs, then pats me on the shoulder. Don't be so anxious, he said. A job isn't worth getting stressed over. He backed up and then closed the door for me, tapped on the glass, and waved. I slammed the key into the ignition, secured everything in the van while he moved his car and then parked it in the garage. I remember turning around and casting one more look at this guy. He was just standing there in the light of his garage door, hands still in his pocket. When he saw I was looking, he pointed up to the camera then tapped his watch. I've never driven faster in my life. No idea if this guy was coked up, a psycho, or just messing with the delivery girl. But from there on out, I was not as friendly with people that I delivered to. This actually happened two weeks ago. I don't think anything will ever top this experience for me. I had gotten a new delivery location as we totally rotated regions within the station and other DSPs. I got in a town an hour and a half away from the station with only around 90 stops. This was known as a cakewalk delivery region, so I was actually kind of looking forward to it. Everything went well. I finished in the town deliveries, and so far, everyone I encountered seemed to be incredibly kind. This was until my last 10 or maybe 20 stops, which were rural and then outside of that town. When I mentioned this to my last towny delivery, he wrinkled his nose, told me to be careful, some of the locals were nothing but trouble. I was a little excited at this prospect. What kind of weird activity would I get a front row seat to? The stuff in my head was way funnier than what I actually encountered. People were well beyond poor, but actually cratered into poverty. Some of the kids watched me drive by. It seemed like they'd never seen a delivery van before. I got to an address way out in the boonies. As soon as I entered their driveway, it was filled with random garbage everywhere. Microwaves, chairs, washers, dryers, wheels, everything you'd think you'd find in a dump. I was certain that I was going to end up popping a tire driving through all of this stuff. I drove all the way into their driveway to find that there was no house, just a small place to turn around in. I ended up turning around, confused where this house could be. As I was driving out the way I came, I slowly 
looked around to find anywhere just to leave this package. I spot this small shack, probably half the size of my van. I was just going to go tuck it in the inlet so it wouldn't get wet if it rained. I didn't expect anyone to actually be inside this desolate little heap. But as soon as I got close and set the package down, a dude who looked like he hadn't showered in months or even changed clothes came out with a hunting knife and a gun tucked inside his belt. That startled me, so I started stepping back a bit, thinking of ways to retreat to my van without getting stabbed or shot. My van was a good distance away since I parked it on firm ground and that shack was on marshy grass. I also thought running would definitely escalate the situation since the guy came out asking me who I was, why I was on his property. I explained that I was with Amazon. He had a package. He shouted back all of that was impossible. He didn't have Wi-Fi, a computer, or even a cell phone. He didn't get packages out here. I replied maybe a family member or a friend could have sent him a package, but if he didn't want it, I could take it back. He went on to say all of his family is dead, then asked if I wanted to know how they died. I replied back with no, I'm okay, and that I was just going to leave the package. This upset him more. He then told me people who drive unmarked vans out here get shot. At this point, I'm thinking this dude is going to take his gun out, so I asked him if he knew why we had to use white vans instead of our Amazon branded vans, which surprisingly seemed to de-escalate the situation. I explained that some of the white vans have four-wheel drive for the hills and the dirt and gravel roads up here. And Amazon branded ones don't. I'm honestly just trying to talk my way out or de-escalate it, whatever I have to do at this point. Then the guy tells me to wait. He has a surprise. Goes back inside his shack again. I'm thinking I need to fast walk to my van, but he comes out, told me he needed his box. He wanted to trade me something for it. I decline. I told him I would just leave it on the ground for him to take. I didn't need anything. I said it was really time for me to get going because I had a million other deliveries. For whatever reason, logic then seemed to speak to this guy. He goes on to produce this huge Ziploc bag of what looks like meth crystals and weed, all shaken and smashed together. He told me, you can have it. I don't know how I just noticed this now, but when I looked to the guy's right, I noticed something hanging up from the wall. I couldn't believe my eyes at first, but sure enough, it was a dead dog strapped to the overhang. It was mangled and decaying. It had clearly been up there for a while. It was beyond horrific and really put the situation in perspective for me. I looked back at the guy who's shaking this big bag of meth and weed. I told him, I'm good, man. I'm on the job right now. He then pointed his knife at me and started to approach. And then at that point, I just turned around and started walking back toward the van. He said he just wanted me to take his knife and open the box since he thought it wasn't Amazon. He was sure the box would explode if he opened it, so he wanted me to do it instead. I sliced it open in two seconds, then sprinted back to my van. I had actually made it out of there without getting knifed or shot, although I might have contracted something from touching that knife. I drove up the road a bit until I was a good distance from that hut, then had a total mental breakdown. It was just some of the craziest stuff of my career. I just let the anxiety wash over me as I replayed what the hell just took place. I made a statement with my dispatch and they sent it to OTR, but apparently Amazon didn't deem what happened bad enough to blacklist the address unless I made a case number with the police. I didn't want to get that involved, so I just let it go once I transferred to a new region. We all just watch for that lot number now, expecting someone else to have to go pay him another visit. This took place in 2016. I work for the USPS delivering mail in the Midwest. I've been at this job for around five years, and I can honestly say I've met and encountered some very unique individuals to say the least. I will give you a quick description of myself because I feel it's relevant to the story and how I don't look exactly like your typical mailman. I'm a male around six foot, 195 pounds, covered in tattoos with long blonde hair and gauges. Although many people have told me I don't look approachable, I am friendly. I'm kind to everyone I encounter, especially while working. Now back to the actual event itself. 
I had recently started a new route, and since I was so low on the totem pole, seniority-wise, this route wasn't exactly in the nicest neighborhoods. Towards the end of the day, I would finish my route down this long stretch of road with a lot of decrepit houses that were either vacant or even barely livable, at least in my opinion. With only a few deliveries remaining, my last package for the day was for a Mr. Smith and what looked like to be medication from the VA hospital. Myself being a fellow vet thought, well, at least I know me and him will get along nicely. Mr. Smith's trailer was located down a small narrow dirt path that also had three or four other trailers around it. As I said earlier, this was my first day on this route, so finding the actual trailer belonging to him was going to take a moment or two, seeing that they weren't labeled with any actual numbers. Most of the other trailers that were around it had garbage and random objects lying around, as well as windows being smashed and graffiti on them, so I assumed those weren't the ones that were occupied. There was only one that stuck out and looked halfway livable, so I guessed and assumed this was the one. I jumped out of my truck and headed up the stairs, and then gently knocked on the door. I hear footsteps approach the door right before it's yanked open, revealing a very large man, six foot six or six seven, easily pushing 300 plus pounds. He bellowed out this booming, yeah? I quickly stammered out, hey sir, I have a package that needs a signature for Mr. Smith. He replies with, oh yeah, that's my father, but I can sign for it for him. No problem. It's a frequent thing for family to sign for other family, so I handed him the slip of paper. He fumbled with it, trying to find a surface to write on, and it was then I immediately smelled all the booze, quickly realizing that this dude was hammered. It took him way longer than it should have to scribble a name down onto that slip. He finally hands it back to me, and I handed him the small parcel. Immediately, I gave him a, all right, have a good evening, man, as I was about to leap off the porch head back to the office and call it a day and have a few drinks myself it's been a long week just as i was getting off the porch he yelled out at me hey uh is that a michael the archangel and lucifer tattooed on your arm i turned around and replied yeah it is politely chuckling he then told me he's got a painting in the garage of them it looks exactly like that tattoo i'm thinking to myself in the moment all right cool man that's random as hell but out loud, I spoke. Wow, that's crazy, man. Cool. I turned around, walking back to my truck again. But as I did so, he yelled out to me once more. You want to see it? Internally to myself, I thought, not really. I really don't care. But I mumbled out to him. Sorry, man. I need to get back to the office, unfortunately. But before I actually got back into the truck to leave, he darted over to the garage and then insisted I come in. It will only take a second. Without actually saying it, he held out his arm and gave that after you motion, now to an open garage door. Before I even realized what I was doing, I found myself stepping inside, cursing myself for being a people pleaser and having a hard time saying no or being rude to people. Although it was 5 p.m. in the middle of summer and the sun still out shining brightly, the garage itself was pitch black. I noticed the two small windows were covered with newspaper an initial weird, sketchy situation was now getting even sketchier. He closed the door, and I was immediately plunged into complete darkness. I then muttered aloud, Uh, it's kind of dark in here. He followed back chuckling. Yeah, give me a sec, I'll, uh, I'll get the light. A few moments pass, I hear a soft click, as he pulls the string on this tiny light bulb, which barely illuminated anything. It was enough to notice, though, that the floor was completely covered in empty liquor and beer bottles. Trash, and of course, rusty tools were all strewn about. He moves past me and walked to what appeared to be the back room of the garage and then just stood at the threshold. It's back here. Come take a look. With this sheepish grin on his face. Now alarms were shrieking. Red flags were shooting up even higher than before. I've listened to enough let's not meet and let's read stories over the years to know better than to walk back there. I've been in quite a few sketchy situations over the years, with the tour in Afghanistan and plenty of other instances. I'm no Billy Badass by any means, but I'm comfortable and confident enough to know I can hold my own when I need to. I was terrified. Something about this man was just off. His mannerisms, his presence itself just creeped me out. 
and now I need an excuse to get the hell out of here. So I finally took hold of the wheel and put my politeness and kindness in the back seat. I knew if I pressed the enter button on my scanner that was located on my hip, it would beep loudly, seeing as if I hadn't actually scanned a barcode. I took my right hand and pressed the button. The loud beep emitted through the air, and I put on the best acting scene of my life, pretending I'd gotten a message from my boss saying he needed me back at the office ASAP. Shit, I said loudly. My boss needs me back for something. Sorry, man. Another time for sure. As I backpedaled out and lightly jogged back to my truck, as I stole a final glance at him before leaving, that grin was gone, now replaced with this stern, pissed-off grimace. When I returned back to the office, I relayed that story to my supervisor. He agreed it was weird and creepy, but couldn't even comprehend why I even entered that garage. He also told me if I was uncomfortable making future deliveries, I could notice the packages and Mr. Smith would have to come to the post office itself to pick up them. I felt bad that I would be forcing an older fellow vet to go out of his way regularly, but I wasn't wanting to encounter his son again if I didn't have to. So from there on out, that's exactly what I did. Maybe he did have that painting back there. Maybe he didn't. Either way, I really don't give a shit. So to that drunken Ed Kemper lookalike, I don't want to meet again. I grew up in Florida throughout the late 70s and 80s. This was back in the days of the cocaine cowboys and list of unsolved murders when Florida was like the Wild West. I remember headlines comparing the homicide rate of Miami and Los Angeles to see which was the most dangerous city. More often than not, it was a wash. My dad worked for the post office back then and got me my first job as a mail carrier. It was a pretty brain dead gig as I just took letters to the boxes and bigger packages to the porches and doorsteps. Still, I liked it for what it was. I got to drive a four door cut list that had air conditioning and a radio. These were the true luxuries to my 16 year old self, to be able to listen to whatever music I desired, while I made a couple of bucks. My dad didn't work as a mail carrier anymore because he'd been with the post office for so long. He worked in the brick and mortar building, fully promoted to desk work and scheduling, logistics of every kind. That said, he worked the beat for many years, knew the ins and outs, and the dangers one could enter while delivering mail. My dad made sure to always express how careful I needed to be, which neighborhoods required me to be on high alert. One day in the early summer, I was all the way across town, delivering the mail like usual. The neighborhoods I was servicing were outliers, what most of the city dwellers called rural, as this is where one would start to see dirt roads and the beginnings of a small town life. Out here, most of the folks getting mail have delivered it in the big standing communal boxes where there's a little slot with your address on it. I didn't like having the crates of loose mail in the car, so I would always start with these to get those deliveries first. It started sliding around the car if I wasn't driving carefully, and if it slid around, it was much harder to deliver. In the bins, it was at least somewhat organized by destination. If it slid out of the tubs, I was on my own to figure out where it went. And since it was my dad running the post office, I was returning to, well, you better believe I wasn't allowed to return with any mail, not even of the junk variety. I'm back in one of those rural neighborhoods, filling up one of the boxes when a car drives by. I turned and waved, big toothy smile, as many of the people I delivered to had come to know and like me. I didn't recognize this car though. It had the kind of aesthetic you'd see downtown where the money lives. The windows were really dark and the rims were shiny. It wasn't just a cool car, I and mean, it wasn't just some kind of gangster car. To my 16-year-old brain, this thing was certifiably pimp, and that was a big deal to say back then, especially in Florida. As a young white kid, pimp was the pinnacle of cool for me. The car drifted by and gave me a weird feeling. It was definitely out of place out here in the boonies, and with it being unfriendly to boot, I didn't really know what to think. Maybe it was an undercover cop. A few of my friends in school had dads who were cops. Some of them told stories about detectives. They got to drive cool cars, carry better guns. At least that's what we always heard. I kept an eye on it as it rolled down the road, carefully not to turn and fully look through. I just didn't want any trouble, 
Like I said, this was Florida. Shit was absolutely crazy back then, just like it is now. But I had my dad in my ear, telling me just how crazy things could get. My brain was already racing with the notions of hitman, human trafficking, God knows what. I just did my best to focus on the mail, so I could get finished and just move on. I felt very vulnerable with my back to the street like that. It was probably nothing, and by now they were almost out of sight. But just then, that car stops. It lurched with the transmission, and slowly rolled backwards into a driveway before turning around. The car is coming right back at me now, and I've only got a few letters left. I'd taken a few karate classes back then, so I knew breathing techniques could help you focus, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't planting my feet just in case I needed to throw a tremendous spinning back kick. It rolls up on me, and just keeps going. It was an older couple from what I could see, wearing their Sunday best and completely lost. They waved and drove back the way they came. I finished up the mailboxes with little incident. For whatever reason, the slowness of that dark sedan triggered my fight or flight and just put me on edge for the rest of the afternoon. This actually came to be habitat for me for the rest of my life after living in Florida. Personal security is a huge priority for me. After I finished the mail there, there was one job left which was to go to door to door with the bigger parcels. Fortunately, there were only a few of them that day. My system was very simple. I would go to the furthest address first, then slowly start working my way back until everything was delivered. That made it to where, when the last drop off was done, I was relatively close to the country roads that would take me back to town. The first address is a shoebox sized package, nothing heavy, but the address is in one of the neighborhoods my dad has warned me about many, many times. I'm not nervous, but I'm on high alert after my encounter with that weird car. I just wanted to be done with the work day. When I get to the first house, it's pretty deep in the thicket of trees, and the brush are shrouding my view of it. The entire property is lined with a tall fence. The gate is secured with a sign that says no trespassing. I shrug and start to turn the car around when I saw a second sign dangling by some tape from the first. The message was simple exactly what I didn't want to see. It said, Mailman okay. I saddled up the cutlass on the side of the street, grabbed the package, and one other thing before getting out of the car. A canister of pepper spray my dad had bought me from when I started the job. He insisted that I keep it in the car or in my pocket, just in case anything ever happened. He explained that he carried one for years, actually had to use it a few times himself. I slipped it into my pocket and made for the gate. It was a simple, single latch system. I considered leaving it open just in case anything got weird, but decided it wasn't worth all that trouble. Between my karate skills, youth, and pocket full of mace, I fancied myself pretty unstoppable. I casually walked down the driveway until I spotted the house, this ramshackle dump that screamed of criminal activity. Half stripped cars in the front yard a cracked front window. It could have been just poverty, but it felt like it was something way more to me. I knocked, received no response, so I elected to simply just leave the package by the door. The house was private enough that there was no chance of theft. As I turned back to the yard to head for the car, I caught some movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to find a big, ugly dog staring me down. It came out from under one of the cars, and it looked starving and extremely pissed. This didn't deter me at first. I'm a dog guy, I've always been. So I tried to relax and reached one hand out before me as a peace offering. Dog didn't like that. It charged me, all teeth and eyes, literally frothing at the mouth. Mailman okay, that was a sick joke. Did I just get lured into some hillbilly's idea of a practical joke? As it barreled me down, I realized my miscalculation. I wasn't indestructible, and this dog was way bigger than I first thought. It had already made a move which only left one option for me. I pulled the pepper spray out of my pocket and turned the nozzle to the business mode and aimed it right at the dog. The problem with this was, it didn't give a shit. It had no idea what I was holding. My brandishing it obviously had no effect whatsoever. I hit the button. Watched as a big misty cloud filled the air, but not in the right direction. In my panic to get the mace out of my pocket, I mistakenly turned the nozzle so it was aiming right between myself and the dog. We watched as we both reacted to the chemicals, 
retreated, and then respectively started to freak out. For 15 minutes, me and that dog are rolling around in the dirt, howling for help. No one was home, so no one came. After a while, we recovered, but only in the sense that we weren't crying and screaming. Neither of us could see or smell, which turned out to be an advantage. I knew this dog was going to be royally pissed off now, and would still have an interest in tearing me apart. Now that we're both blind, if it gets a hold of me, it's over. Done for. I rolled to my right to create some distance between us, and I remember that it's pretty much just an open yard over there. Nothing to get hung up in. Once I felt the dirt change to grass beneath me, I stopped to get to my knees. My vision is shot, but I can see outlines and some shapes and colors. I can see the striped car in front of me, and the dog writhing off to the left of them. For almost the next 30 minutes, I tiptoed across the yard, desperately trying not to get to the attention of this dog. I couldn't run because if I tripped and it heard me, it'd probably be able to find me. So I walked as slowly and as calmly as I could, stopped whenever I got too loud, until I reached the fence. The dog eventually recovered a bit, started sniffing around the yard for me, but couldn't get the scent. He did get close a few times. I just freezed up until he moved on. Once I got free of the yard, the trouble was just starting. How was I going to get the car back to the post office? I sat on the bumper and rinsed my eyes out with water for an hour or two, but it didn't help. Finally, someone pulled up beside me and asked if I needed help. I didn't get suspicious when I heard the car tires that time. They got a hold of my dad at the post office who came out and finished the deliveries and the car got home. He laughed at my swollen eyes the whole rest of the weekend. The pandemic forced a lot of people to search for new employments and opportunities, especially during the initial economic onset. Uber Eats, DoorDash, Amazon, all of them saw crazy surges in traffic when cities ordered people to stay indoors. Many places deemed these drivers essential workers, which kept me employed for several unstable months throughout COVID. I became a delivery driver out of necessity back then, but actually still had to do it part-time on the weekend still. My story takes place during 2020, when no one really knew what the future had in store. I was working for a big name delivery company, one of the largest cities in the United States. At the time, I was constantly behind by at least a day's worth of deliveries, if not more. Strikes are going on. People are ordering more stuff than ever before. It was a lot to handle and had made a pretty high stress work environment. One day I see a meme about how all we do is pee into water bottles and then lose packages. Honestly, it was the golden age for delivery driver memes. Because of how behind I was on my route, I started working overtime pretty much every day. Instead of delivering from 9 to 5, I'd start at 8 in the morning and then just go until I was totally burnt out, which is usually around 7 p.m., maybe a little longer if I had a Red Bull that day. It was one of my last packages for the night, and I remember thinking to myself that it could just wait till the morning and be my first delivery the next day. I was really hungry and just wanted to put my feet up. But the destination was nearby. I'm a go-getter. So I just went. And the parcel was no bigger than my fist. It wasn't spending the night in my truck, so... I wish I wasn't so stubborn. Why didn't I just go home like I wanted to? The essential worker tag was going to my head. I pull up outside of this apartment complex. And I'm talking chalk line outlines on the sidewalk, caution tape rippling in the breeze. Not literally, but you get what I mean. Groups of guys patrolling the parking lot milling around the dark corner, big dogs barking from every tiny gate, bullet holes in some of the cars. I'm in a big city, and some of the underbelly is seedy, almost unsightly. I scan the package in my hand, and I leave the truck and search the actual address. From what I can see, it seems to be a ground floor resident, and thank God I don't have to climb 10 flights of stairs just to hand off this bulk chapstick, or whatever the hell it is. I lock the truck behind me just to be safe. There's nothing in it to steal, but this neighborhood is just not worth gambling in. After perusing around, I find the building that it's actually in, and then finally the unit. It's a dingy corner apartment with all the windows covered with all kinds of crazy shit. Tin foil, movie posters, food boxes, like cereal, you name it. It's all blocking the light out of this dump. I get a weird feeling the second I see it, but hey, I'm almost out of here. 
I walk around to the front and find a guy leaning against a tree, smoking a cigarette. I gave him a courtesy nod to which he offers a two-finger salute. Standard guy exchange in my city. I turn my heel and approach the front door. I've already decided I don't want to be here anymore, so I hit the bell and place the package on the floor. As I'm standing back up, the door rips open in front of me with this agitated energy. It's every driver's nightmare on shift, the irritated, panicked where you have to be recipient of whoever wants to jam you up like they're a cop. As I get upright, I can see this is different though. This guy is real thin, half-dressed and just covered in what I can only assume to be track marks. He's dirty, unwashed, and the living room behind him was disgusting. We make eye contact, I say hello, and then I turn to leave. What the hell, man? I've been waiting for you all day, he shouts at me. I turn back around and shrug, offer my normal apology. Hey, we're understaffed, man. What more can I say? Well, I think I saw you drop my package, no? I come to a full stop. I have no idea what this guy is talking about. I point at the one at his feet and asked if he meant that one. Yeah, man, I watched you throw it against the door. It's probably broken. I start to argue, but the whole thing is a racket. The guy behind me smoking a cigarette is a friend of the guy in the apartment. The guy in the apartment says, Hey, did you see him do it? And of course, cigarette guy nods and says, Yep, I saw the whole thing. Now this is turning into an actual problem. Not just them trying to report me or something, but being surrounded by potentially dangerous criminals. They try to usher me inside the apartment so we can get it all worked out. But I have my own protocol to follow, and right near the top of the list is never get made to go anywhere, especially on shift. The guy in the apartment pulls out a gun right out of his pants pocket and points it right at my face. The entire conversation stops and we're all just looking at the trigger, waiting. He asked me to reconsider going inside and that all of this is just a big misunderstanding. The guy with the cigarette puts his smoke out, grabs my elbow, and then leads me inside. My heart is pounding through my chest at this point. Anything could happen. After we get into the living room and they shut the door, all of my suspicions are confirmed. This place is a crack house, without a doubt, and these two clowns are a couple of dealers. Radical, exactly where I want to be. The guy puts the pistol away pretty much the second they got the door locked. He seemed even nervous to have it out, which did come as a relief to me. Not a fan of him waving it around either. The scariest part was actually the door. Once they got me inside, the whole situation devolved into an episode of the Three Stooges. They tried to call my office for 15 minutes. They were so strung out, they couldn't even look at the phone for longer than a minute to actually pull up the number and then hit dial. From what I gathered, these guys have run out of whatever they were actually addicted to and were filling out the cravings with whatever they could get their hands on. To say these guys were high wasn't accurate. They looked like they hadn't slept in days, running on fumes of whatever dust was left at the bottom of the bag. That's when they came up with a scam that they were trying to pull. Like everyone else, they'd seen dozens of videos online of careless drivers dumping packages over fences and things like that. So they ordered something small and cheap off of Amazon, then painstakingly waited at the door for it to arrive, just to peg a fake crime on an innocent, unsuspecting driver. I wondered how long that guy had been leaning up against the tree, waiting for me to show up. They were completely crazy. It was actually kind of entertaining. They thought they were going to get a payout of some kind right in the middle of the night, like us delivery guys carry a little fallback cash just in case we break something. I couldn't quite understand the logic, but I appreciate the desperation. I encouraged them just a little, just to see how far they'd actually go, how much more they'd come up with to justify all this craziness. Trying to get them to just focus on the phone was the funniest part though. I had to keep it within reason. These guys did force me in here. They did have a gun so it wasn't all fun and games or anything. Something got their attention in the back of the apartment. Both of their heads snapped and they reacted to something that I couldn't see or hear. I'm assuming it was just typical hallucinations from staying awake for so long. Either way, they both thought that they could hear someone breaking in and sneaking around the back bedroom. One of them is turning the drawers in the kitchen upside down looking for a flashlight. The other guy's just yelling, keeping an eye on the dark hall in front of him. They don't find a flashlight, 
but they're both holding cell phones and this seems to be kind of my chance, so I tell them both of their phones have a flashlight. They just have to turn it on. They both go mental at this realization and frantically flick their lights on. They tell me to keep an eye on the front door and watch their backs. I nod like we're old war buddies and I'd never let them down. As they went down the hallway and checked the rooms, I slowly shuffled back to the door and unlatched the deadbolt. The last thing I saw was the glare of the cell phone lights against the dingy back wall and the shaky silhouettes of the pistol going from one room to the other. Absolute chaos. I wasn't out of the woods yet though. I still needed to get back to my truck in the sketchy complex and then navigate my way out of the slums and back into the city. It was much later than I thought and all I wanted to do was just get home. I went from a walk to a light jog as to not draw too much attention. Everything was going smoothly until I reached the parking lot when I hear something behind me. I still don't know exactly what I heard, but it, it sounded like someone running up on me. So I whirled around and there's no one there. All right, now I'm hearing things. As I turn to face back into the parking lot, I rotate just in time and step into the angled antenna of one of the car that's nearest to me. It had been bent at the base, so it just jutted out instead of going straight up and down. That antenna was also perfectly level with my eye and it pushed right beneath the lid and then right behind my actual eye. I harpooned my own face in a mad dash to get the hell out of this place. There was no grace in that reaction. In a panic, I flailed backward to get away from whatever was causing the pain, only to injure myself worse. That antenna had a little bead on the end, which I could feel putting pressure between my eye. That metal rod must have been inside my eye at least an inch or two. When I pulled myself backwards, all of it slid out the same way it went in, and the pain was beyond all measure. Droplets of blood are now leaking from the base of my eye. I was stuck within 15 feet of the security of my delivery truck, but I can't see the keys to open up the door. I stumbled to the back and sat on the bumper, just holding my eye and praying that it didn't fall out. After around 45 minutes, my vision cleared up a little, but the pain was still explosive. I managed to get back into the truck and then slowly drive back toward my house, as we didn't have to return them if we were behind. We just swap it out for a totally new, fully loaded truck in the morning. My eye thankfully didn't fall out, but I did require some pretty involved visits to the doctor for around 18 months after that. I like to think that those crackheads are still holed up in that apartment, looking for a phantom burglar. They probably don't even remember taking me hostage. I'll never forget hearing about the dark web and all the crazy stuff that you could find on there. My friends and I in high school loved the legends of the internet, spent a lot of time cruising places like Reddit and 4chan for weird stuff, both old and new. We weren't really after anything specific, we just liked the shock factor aspect and the unpredictability of what you might find. I think my generation was really drawn to this kind of behavior because of things like LimeWire. I mean, we were the first wave of kids to be handed electronics, an internet connection, and then just left to our own interests. This was the first era where a person could hear something and then go to the web and learn more about it. Whereas many of us were just downloading songs and music videos, others had learned you could pretty much download anything from LimeWire. This turned the program into a kind of weird roulette where you never knew what you might see. One minute you think you're downloading a My Chemical Romance song and then it's actually a decapitation video. So as you can imagine, we were pretty fascinated with the notion of the dark web. At first, it was just something we talked about, random stuff we'd heard and rumors we made up, or horror stories that we read online. All of it kindled a fascination that just wouldn't go away. Not until we saw it. There's no other way to describe it. The dark web is the last frontier. It's the one place a person can truly explore and possibly see something no other human will. We started learning about what a trip would require. None of us wanted to use our own devices to make that journey, so we entertained getting a burner laptop. Of course, being school-age kids, we didn't have a lot of disposable money like that. The urge to take the plunge was just overwhelming one day that I didn't care. It's not like going on the dark web is illegal. 
It's all about what you do when you get there. I told everyone that I was just going to figure it out with my computer at home. It took me a couple of days worth of research, but I got it figured out. I'm not going to lay it out so you can make the same mistakes I did though. I'll just say it requires a special browser to access. If you really want to go, you'll have to learn the rest yourself. I made the proper modifications, downloaded the software I needed, and then started experimenting. Getting to the dark web is actually a lot easier than they say. The hard part is navigating it. There aren't any URLs like the regular internet. You have to know the highly specific web addresses in order to find the site. This prevents just any crackerjack from getting onto the dark web, taking a tour of some potentially seedy places. Not to be deterred, I went to my old friend 4chan. The anonymous users there had some pointers for me, mostly to tell me to stay away, but after a night of asking and bartering, I was finally given a copy-paste link to a list of dark web URLs. There were thousands of them. I remember feeling lightheaded when I saw it. I couldn't even imagine all the different crazy stuff that lay archived before me. So I started the same way anyone would, one link at a time. I can't even express to you how disappointed I was when I dropped that very first link in and it took me to a dead website. I thought I'd been tricked, totally ripped off. The first 10 or 20 links were all the same dead website. Still, I wasn't going to give up. I spent a year of my high school life talking about the wonders of this place. I couldn't just tuck tail and say, nah, guess I was wrong. There's a whole lot of nothing. I did what any sensible young man would do. I jumped ahead in the links. In fact, I found the sketchiest looking one I could find and followed it. And this time, that website wasn't dead. It was some kind of online marketplace. And as you can imagine, all the items for sale weren't things you could buy in a store. I stumbled upon some kind of fetish site where you could buy urine, and I mean any kind in the world. It looked like the site mostly dealt with clean urine as the kind that would pass a drug test. I hit the mother load. I scrolled for a little while just to make sure I didn't miss anything. After all, I was an explorer. I needed to make an accurate report to my buddies. The rest of the night went by slow, as methodic research does. My friends were floored when I told them. They couldn't believe I'd actually found something and that I've done it all on my home computer. They kept asking me if I was crazy and if the FBI was monitoring my house yet. Despite all the crap talking, every single one of them wanted to see what I'd found. For a few weeks after this, my friends would come over after school, usually when my parents were at work. We tried random URLs from the copy paste list. The list itself was hosted on one of those old text sharing websites so anyone could make a change to the document at any given time. There'd be times where we'd watch someone delete a URL or type out a new one at the bottom. We actually had our own list going of websites we visited and websites that were dead. I can't even begin to tell you all the crazy stuff that we saw. It started with a weird urine website, but that was truly the tip of the iceberg. Hell, that's just the kind of website you can find on the normal internet nowadays. Pee in bags, farts in jars, typical OnlyFans stuff. It's almost as if the depravity of the dark web has slowly bled into the normal internet over the last few years. Anyway, we moved on to cooler URLs. One week we explored another marketplace that conducted itself more as a forum. It wasn't goods that were being moved, but a service. The members of this forum claimed to be hitmen from a variety of backgrounds, all with different skill sets and different types of targets that they were comfortable killing. This last part varied greatly and it was reflected in the price tag. Average killers willing to kill average people were asking for about $20,000 in either American or Mexican currency. The higher prices were in the ballpark of $100,000 to $50K up front and then $50K after the kill was carried out. These were typically for the more high profile targets. The seller accepted only American or Russian currency. It was definitely mind blowing to see, but there was no way to actually verify any of this. Part of us was convinced that it was all just people role playing, just pretending to be what they said they were. We got curious, so we made an account on a hitman forum. It didn't really require a whole lot. As you can imagine, less is more for a hitman forum. It seemed to be a way just to network and then the actual details and money would be exchanged later. 
most likely in person. We perused the website, but we didn't find anything we considered proof that what we were seeing was actually real. While poking around the website though, a little blue bubble appeared in the top right corner of my screen. It kind of looked like an eyeball, but it was only the size of a pinky nail. I didn't think anything of it at first, honestly. I just thought it was something with the browser, like it needed an update or something, and just kept on exploring. It wasn't until we were done for the day and everyone was going home that I noticed it again. Even after closing the programs we used to surf the dark web, that little blue bubble was still in the top right corner, now set against my monitor background. I did everything I could to scrub the bubble from my computer, but to no avail. Restarts, long-term shutdown, antivirus scans, software purge, everything. It was a part of my computer. I guess I just had to deal with it, which turned out to be not an issue. Being a young dumb kid, forgetting about the bubble was like second nature to me, and believe it or not, we kept on exploring the dark web, despite that little eye looking out at us. Another couple of weeks went by before we found a website that greatly interested all of us. It was a black market for hackers and data pirates. There are resumes for hackers on there, a list of things they could do for you, even some stuff they could teach you. It was like a hub for keylogging and backdoor sneaking. For whatever reason, being on this website didn't scare us, even though this seemed to be the spot where the bad stuff would really happen. We hung around that website for a while until one day, that little blue bubble disappeared from the corner. We all looked at each other and laughed, letting the fright pass over us and then kept on exploring. The webpage grayed out. A text box popped up on the screen. We all started whooping and hollering as if we just finished a video game level, despite having no clue what we just stumbled upon. The message went something like this. Hello. I'm one of the administrators for this website. We log everyone who passes through the best to our ability, but I've continued to monitor your activity since your first appearance on our website. I've seen you on our servers every day, and I've come to the conclusion you have no interest in buying or using any of the services listed. I suspect even if you had an interest, you would have no way of paying for it because you're a group of high school kids who bit off more than you can chew. The guy went on to explain that we weren't in any kind of trouble and that the admin team didn't mind them looking around, but others would. Because of the sensitive nature of the website, lots of real hackers lurk just below the surface. And since I was on my home computer, using my family's internet without any kind of virus protection, my connection to the dark web was comparable to a flashing red sign with all of my personal information on it. I had no idea that my presence on each website was a flagship for people to come and take advantage of me. He then said if I took more precautions to protect my connection, I would be safe and secure in my exploring. He went on to ask if I had noticed a little blue bubble on my monitor screen. I typed back yes, it had been there for a week or two. The administrator explained that I picked up a hitchhiker on one of these dark websites and that the person was tracking everything I did. They couldn't see me through the screen or anything, but they could see everything I did on our home internet, likely in an attempt to blackmail us. The administrator explained that when he looked into my connection, he took the liberty of removing my hitchhiker. You should get off now if you know what's good for you, was the last message that I received from them. We all looked at each other with that same sense of disbelief. Being high school boys, we needed more than just a spooky message. One of my friends leaned over my shoulder and typed, how do we know this is legit? Anyone could be making this up. The admin proceeded to respond with my full name and address, the whole names of several other friends inside the room, the school that we all went to. We frantically closed out the browser, and I can tell you that I've never been on the dark web since. While randomly clicking around tour one night, I found a site with a riddle and a text box to enter the answer. After figuring out the puzzle, it took me another page that had a message to decode and another text box. Basically, every page was a puzzle and it got harder every time. I was 15 years old and not very smart with those kind of things, so I found a forum where other people had discovered it too and were all talking about it. 
Apparently on the final page, it displayed a date and a quote from Alice in Wonderland. I believe it was just a site just to be some sort of entertainment for very experienced decoders and programmers, but there's also some speculation. It might be a hacker recruiting site, similar to the Cicada 3301, but either way, it creeped me out a lot. Despite all these fears though, I couldn't look away. I was big into breaking secret codes, and this seemed to be a brain buster. The forum I found became incredibly handy, almost like a video game guide, to help me figure out some of the later puzzles. You see, I wanted to do them all on my own. Any good code breaker knows that there's possibly more than one way to solve a puzzle, and the results could yield different outcomes. I'd spent a few hours after school each day, trying to figure out the latest riddle. It didn't take long. Soon, I was at the same page everyone else had arrived at. A date, and a quote. But there's something else too. This disgusting bloody pig mask, sitting on the end of a table, next to the text. Maybe it wasn't even a mask, it could have been a legit pig head, severed right off the body. I mean, it was that gory looking. There were a few people in the forum claiming that there were additional levels after that one, that I had already reached, but the vast majority of the decoders denied this, and said the text box with the quote and date was the end of this puzzle. I didn't know who to believe though, but having a lot of free time and already being invested, I decided to keep at it. Maybe there was more. I reached out to one of the conspirator guys, asked him how to move beyond the pig head page. He didn't respond at first, but after some prodding, he came back pretty hostile with all kinds of threats. This guy didn't see the decoding as a puzzle. He saw it as a race to some kind of prize, so he wanted to keep his progress to himself. He said he'd hack me, turn my life upside down if I bothered him again. This only fueled my interest though, as you probably figured out. I was a supreme nerd throughout high school, somewhat versed with the dark web. I had some smoke and mirrors in place to mask my IP from unwanted investigation. As the week went on, a few more decoders moved on from the last level. I was one of them. I don't want to get too deep into what the puzzle was, but but we figured out that there was a code hidden in the date and the quote on the screen. If you typed in the missing characters, it sent you to another screen. The next screen had a question in a text box and a timer starting at three minutes and the rest of the bloody corpse of the pig. Now I knew it wasn't a mask. It was a real series of photos of a decapitated animal. The gruesome nature of the photo made it incredibly hard to focus on the puzzle at hand. The timer made it even worse. When it hit zero, it kicked you back to the latest puzzle text box where you had to wait 24 hours to input the secret characters. Here's the rub. Every time you returned and went into the next puzzle, the timer was 30 seconds shorter. You were only given six attempts to get it figured out, and if you spent all six tries, that was it. Puzzle game over. This one took the form a little longer to figure out, as no one wanted to be the martyr and sacrifice their attempts. It also really cut off what little communication and cooperation was left between users. After nine or 10 days, people started dropping like flies, unable to stay away from giving the next screen a shot. People were going nuts in the forum area after they lost. I tried to be as patient as I possibly could, spent night after night trying to piece it together on paper rather than waste my tries. It wasn't good enough though. Eventually, after conversing with a few puzzlers that were still helpful, I decided to give it a run, see if it worked out for me. I didn't really believe this would end in fame or riches, so I didn't think I'd lose out on anything. It was just a fun pastime for me. Needless to say, I failed, quickly at that. All the stuff I came up with on paper crashed and burned as soon as my screen was frozen on the previous puzzle, doomed to only lurk in the forum now. It was whatever. I hung around for a few more days to see if anyone passed, and got bored and moved on. The dark web is a deep place, there are lots of other things to see. In my defense, I didn't totally fail. I actually saved my last attempt just in case anything came to me, or in the event the answer got posted somewhere. Still, I forgot about the whole thing as I moved on to other strangeness on that web. Not even a week went by when I got an email from an encrypted account. And I don't mean that message itself was encrypted, although it probably was. 
I mean the actual email account itself was unreadable, untraceable. I had no way of responding because to my email sender, the account that sent it didn't exist. I had a bad feeling the second I saw that mysterious point of origin. It had one simple message. Hey, keep at it. You were really close and we'd like to see you succeed. Give that last try a shot from your friends on the other side. I started to sweat before I even finished reading it. All the precautions I took were meaningless. Someone from the dark web had found my personal email account and then reached out to me. This meant they knew my name, house address, really everything about me. Privacy was non-existent. Suddenly I found myself afraid of the electronics inside my house. This was when my interest in the dark web really soured. I quit with it altogether. I didn't really do anything online after that. I'd unplug my Wi-Fi as soon as I was home and if no one was using it. I changed my passwords to things that I had to use, like stuff for school. I was so nervous after that email that I could hardly sleep at night, just waiting for my life to fall apart. What would it start with? Another email? A phone call? A text message? It came in the way I would least expect it. The mail. I came home from school one day to find something waiting for me on the kitchen counter. It looked like junk mail at first, your typical you've won type of envelope. It wasn't until I saw the symbol stamped beside the heading that I realized what it was. It was an image of a pig's head, except this one had a smile and a wink instead of all that blood. I tore it open with dread, tremoring throughout my entire body. Part of me hoped it was full of anthrax and would just kill me right there. I would have been lucky that that happened. Inside I found a photo and a small white card that read, You work so hard. The picture was me, hard at work on the last puzzle in front of my computer. It looked like the picture had been taken through my webcam or, or some program. I was leaned back in my desk chair, one finger against my temple, staring at the possibilities I'd written out on paper. It was a gut-wrenching thing to see. All the notions I'd been safe were washed away in an instant. I took the envelope and its contents to the fireplace and burned it right there on the spot, sweat dumping down my body as I watched it turn to ash. Nothing more ever came from it, but the fact that it happened changed the way I looked at the world. I don't do much online, and when I do, it's limited, through various layers of security. No one is safe anywhere on the web. I think this was in 2012 or whenever the Silk Road was at its peak. My friend had told me he ordered some MDMA off of it and I actually received the package in the mail. I had him show me how he used the program. I think it was called Tour. I'm bad at computers, so I'm not sure if it's a program or not. Either way, we spent the better part of an afternoon marveling at the stuff that you could buy. Eventually, we came across someone who was selling children. The offer was that you could list the characteristics of the child that you want, depending on the difficulty of acquiring that type of child, and then pay somewhere around 5 to 50k, then have it sent to you. There were pictures of one he had in stock, where they were mostly naked in a dirty room, or he could go find certain ones that you wanted, and take them. We immediately turned the computer off, didn't get back on for a few days. I wish that we called the police, but we were stupid kids and scared of getting in trouble for my buddy's drugs. We didn't mess with the dark web after that, but we did experiment with the product that he got, and frankly, we were blown away. It was some of the best molly that we've ever had. I couldn't believe that he ordered this straight to his doorstep from a hidden website. Fast forward a couple of weeks, my friend calls me, says I need to come over ASAP. This is pretty unusual, but I just roll with it. Tell him I'll be by after work. By the time I get there, I find my buddy sitting on his porch, chain smoking what looked to be an entire pack of cigarettes. This is a red flag from the get go. I get inside and he tells me he got a piece of mail today, something from the dark web. I nod along, expecting him to tell me he ordered more drugs. Not the case though. He didn't order anything. So when he saw an envelope, he panicked and didn't open it. He called me instead. 
I guess he wanted me to witness it or something, just in case. It's a plain white envelope, but with nothing but his name and address on it. He pops it open to find a letter to a hyperlink to a website. The letter says something along the lines of, we made a mistake viewing the child selling site, and now we're involved in the bigger picture. It said we needed to visit that link by midnight, or our dark web searches would be made public to our friends, family, local authorities, pretty much everyone in our town. We freaked out. Who the hell are these people? They even made references to multiple people, as if they knew he wasn't alone. I got dragged into it for no good reason other than guilty by association. I told myself that that would be the last time I say yes to a person asking if I wanted to see something cool. My buddy gets his laptop out, fires up the program, and then slowly begins punching in the URL. We watch in horror as it takes us to a website, and all it's playing is a video recording of my friend and I using the laptop, audio and everything. If you had this link, you could watch and listen to my friend and I look over a website for buying children. It felt like the most incriminating evidence I could ever imagine. Despite not really doing anything wrong, I felt sick to the point of vomiting as we watched. Below the video was a message that said, Boys, 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 what do we do with this? And below that was another URL link. We couldn't click it, so my friend was forced to type it in another character, one at a time. This time, it pulled up an electronic receipt for the MDMA my friend had purchased. The amount the crypto wallet he used to pay for it, the matching IP, the home address. The text box along the top of the screen said, The plot thickens. You guys didn't use this, did you? And then next to that was a little skull and crossbones, like you'd see for something toxic. And of course, there was another URL code. At this point, my buddy was losing his mind, absolutely sure he's going to prison. Whoever did this went the extra mile to build a damning case of all kinds of criminal stuff. We didn't know what to do or where to even begin. All we could do was follow the codes until the next website. When he punched it in, it brought up a blank page with a video screen, and on it was another recording of us, except we were just staring blankly at the screen. I blinked, and then I watched myself blink. I looked down at the clothes and realized it wasn't a recording, but a live feed through the laptop camera. As we looked on, a text banner rolled out above the video that said, 24 hour access, free to view. We scrolled down a bit, found a whole menu of different URLs this time, each one with a title. Since it was my friend's laptop, most of them had to do with him and his alone time, if you know what I mean. Going to the bathroom, self gratification. It was all captured and available for people to watch. He just shook his head and stared into the screen a truly defeated man. I was involved, but only to a certain degree. There definitely weren't any videos of me making an O face on there. Then we got an alert. A text box came up and asked, would you like me to make this go away? Options were yes, no, maybe later. He clicked yes immediately. Despite my protests, we didn't know who we were messing with. I honestly thought we were being guided into another trap. He moved away from the camera lens and let him continue on. It was pretty simple from there on. The blackmailers had a menu of prices set that my friend could pay to make each video disappear, and it wasn't cheap. I'm talking thousands of dollars, tens of thousands when it's all said and done. There was no way to verify that the exchange was legit, so he was just left to gamble and trust these cyber psychos. When he explained this, they had no understanding, simply said pay or suffer. They asked for his crypto wallet, and he punched in the digits. This allowed them to link to his wallet, but they didn't have the password, so they couldn't just drain it. He gave him a crypto wallet of their own, some kind of burner, and requested their first payment. He sent it over, and right there on the screen, one of the videos vanished from the list. It wasn't a huge relief, but it was better than nothing. Word has it, he's still paying them to this day. While perusing the dark web, a lot of what I found was repositories for semi-sketchy information. 
like various extremely specific ways of human torture and signs of when to stop the person so they don't die. Extremely detailed list of materials to buy to create bombs and how to wire them up for remote cell phone detonation and just odd sexual books. Each was its own topic of repository, like one for torture, one for explosives, one for sex. I digress. A lot of it reminded me of the anarchist cookbook. This kind of grab bag, all kinds of stuff that Uncle Sam would hate for you to have, like how to make LSD in your bathtub, DIY landmines, how to detect or prevent hypnosis. There were a lot of blueprints for making things like single barrel shotguns and flamethrowers. I didn't venture into any of the porn sites on the dark web. I can find what I need on the regular web. The sites on the dark web are usually extreme and feature illegal content. If you aren't operating on a secure connection, it's the easiest way to get caught up in busts and blackmailing. Like Epstein, a lot of these people run these disgusting websites in order to obtain information on others. Sure, the content itself satisfies their fetish, but information and blackmailing is what gives them true power. These places should be avoided at all costs from a moral standpoint. But if you don't want any trouble from a security standpoint as well, one interesting but not really scary site I saw was found. MacBook Pros of that year and the website claimed to have a couple hundred of them for like 300 each. They had a picture showing like five or six powered up with a pile of them behind them. Likely some kind of scam, but you never know. Lots of users were clamoring in the comments that they bought and received them and they made perfect burner laptops for various dark web work. Another interesting one was someone selling two Glocks with their serial numbers removed for like $2,000. I didn't really do much on there, so I'd take the legitimacy of all of those services with a grain of salt. My time on the deep web was exploratory, and just for curiosity. My friend can attest to buying drugs off the dark web though. He'd buy pills for cheap on there, then sell it on his college campus for huge profit. I was absolutely fascinated with the packaging they mailed the stuff in. It was cutting edge, modern criminal camouflage. It'd be the most unsuspecting stuff of all time. It all started with the brochures. He started getting one in the mail every week. I didn't think anything of it, but this also coincided with him all of a sudden having cocaine all the time. When asked, he told me he was getting it from the dark web and that he'd love to show me. Sure enough, he takes me to the back of his apartment and shows me this stack of brochures. Everything you can think of from electronics to real estate to spirituality. They were professional, full of real information, and all had different print and follow-up information, like phone numbers and websites. Then he'd show me the special flap in the back where he could cut it open and access the powder stored within. Someone was mailing him drugs on a weekly basis for a small upfront fee every month. He showed me the website and all the different stuff that you could order. The next one he bought was a double sheet of acid. It arrived in a sealed collector's copy of some old comic book. We were both honestly stumped as there was nothing in the envelope to clue us in on how to find it. It was only after removing the plastic and thumbing through the pages a few times that we realized the back page didn't match the rest of the book. It was the double sheet of acid printed right into the comic book. It fit exactly with the trim of the cover and everything. My mind was blown to say the least. My buddy had it all sold within a week and was soon making his next purchase. After riding the highs of coke and acid, he dove into pills next. He said there was a big bundle deal at crazy prices, plus he wanted to experiment. When the goods show up, I laughed so hard I hit the floor. Inside that box, a bunch of pre-packaged Pez dispensers totally sealed up in a cardboard and plastic, like how they come in the store. This shipment is pretty self-explanatory. He rips one open and inside, each dispenser is filled with a different pill. It was some of the most ingenious criminal masterminding I could think of. This went on for the better part of a year. It was a crazy roller coaster ride that only seemed to go up, if you know what I mean. My friend started to see some wild profit and was ordering weight pounds and pounds throughout the week. Nothing ever came sloppy or obvious. It was like discovering a money machine. Until one day, it all dried up. 
My buddy placed his usual shipments of massive quantities, made his payments, but nothing showed up. A week went by, still no funky envelope full of Pokemon cards that were actually blotters. My friend turned into a ghost, an absolute shell. He wouldn't confess to me how much money he had tied up in all the unarrived orders, but I'd guess it was somewhere north of $10,000. After that, the website he was using on the web disappeared, just gone. The URL led to an empty black screen. It's not like there was any way for him to make an appeal anyway, but now it felt final. It was the end of the line. He'd been caught with his ass out. Until one day, something showed up in his mailbox. It was a brochure for a cult or something, as the whole thing was in the theme of, this is the end. The front page said something like, We are all in great peril, with a pair of hands coming together in a prayer. He interpreted it as a calling card for the website going under, and everyone being in potential danger. It was almost like an announcement to tie up loose ends or get rid of evidence, because it was the end of days, so to speak, for this black market company. Sure enough, this timeline coincided with a big Silk Road bust of 2013. My friend never got his money back, but he also didn't go to prison. I can't say that he did, but I'm sure there's a lesson learned here somewhere. This is from way back, when Silk Road 1 was still going strong. I was looking for a certain substance, but couldn't find it in my part of the world for a decent price. This was really frustrating because it had been plentiful and easy to find in the past, but for whatever reason, things were dry and people were starting to look to alternatives. I was told about Tour and the Onion Rotary and how to access the Silk Road. For anyone that doesn't know what I'm talking about, Tour is like Google Chrome for the dark web. It's the program that you need to access the unique web page URLs that only have those websites. Silk Road was a dark web marketplace where you could buy and sell literally anything to one another. You had to use Bitcoin and you had to trust a backwater system to get you what you paid for. The whole experience is totally surreal to look back on, but probably one of the coolest aspects in the early 2000s. Tour was called the Onion Rotary because it randomized your IP with every click of the mouse. So one minute it might say you were in Vermont, the next you were in Peru, and then Helsinki. You get the picture. It's an untraceable system, unless, of course, you underestimate the means of the system and can trace people, but that's a whole nother discussion entirely. So I got Tour, and I got onto the dark web. I found myself on Silk Road. All seemed to be pretty straightforward, so I just made my post like I would on Craigslist or any other messaging board. Hi, looking for mushrooms, please respond. It was pretty much the gist of it. It felt sketchy and stupid, but out of options, I gave it a whirl. When I checked the next morning, I hadn't received any messages, and I pretty much wrote it off. The hell was I thinking anyway? But after a few days, someone did respond. They had an offer and requested to message me, which I accepted. We parlayed the details. Suddenly, I found myself agreeing to send the stranger around $800. This was way more than I originally planned on spending, but for whatever reason, I found a person I was talking to charming. Drug dealers seemed to have that effect on me, so that's how I knew this guy was legit. I only had $200 set aside for the purchase, so the additional $600 was biting into my rent and bill money. I had to convert all of it into Bitcoin, then ship it off to a random wallet address. Honestly, the whole thing felt pretty high tech and cool at the time. After payment, the guy agreed to ship me one ounce of mushrooms per week for six weeks. The delayed nature of it kept it safer, more secure, and would allow me to make more sales over time. It all made sense in my head. Lo and behold, the delivery never arrives. Two weeks goes by, nothing and the guy's account vanishes from my contact history. That charm I felt, it was that of a scam artist. I just couldn't tell the difference through a computer screen. I felt stupid, as there was nothing I could do, but, but the real problem was, I was planning on selling that first shipment to cover the rent money I'd spent. I wouldn't be able to cover my ass in two weeks when the first of the month came. 
I had all kinds of problems to deal with in real life now, so I did the one thing that I could do to get revenge on the dark web. I left that guy a bad review on the Silk Road forum. I said he scammed me, had probably scammed many others, and then not to give him any money. Do not conduct business of any kind with this guy. You will definitely steal your money. After that, I did my best to forget. Just start hustling to get the bills covered. It's grueling, but I did find some side gigs and start filling up the coffers before the next month. I come home one day and I just want to relax, veg out on the computer for a little bit. I remember that whole dark web ordeal and decide to go take a look at my Silk Road post. And that's when I see I have a new message and went along like this. Hello, I'm a reputable vendor here on Silk Road. I saw your post this morning about the scam artist user. I had an exchange with him a few days ago, wherein he also tried to scam me, so I'm taking actions against him. I've used one of my alternative accounts to sell him several ounces of MDMA. He's already paid for the product, and what I put in the mail was a quarter pound of sweet sugar crystals and a sticky note with a frowny face with his full name written on it. Is there anything else you'd like this user to suffer? I had no idea who this person was that was messaging me, but they were allowing me to come up with the consequences for that guy. It was some kind of honor among thieves, and honestly, I found it enthralling. What a message to receive, that the Silk Road system was self-correcting. Unfortunately, I didn't really have any creative ways off the top of my head to make him suffer, so I didn't make any suggestions. The vendor told me that was okay, the user would have lots to deal with in the coming weeks. Then he asked for my Bitcoin wallet address and the amount owed from the scam. I thought long and hard about my answer. Part of me wanted to lie, see if I could turn a profit from the whole ordeal. But another part of me was sure this person could find out the truth. It was the dark web. These people could find out anything. If I lied, it might cost me more in the end. So I just told him the truth which even then sounded pretty steep. He gave me the okay and said to be back to me soon. No way. It was unbelievable, but my bad review was actually going to get me my money back. After the experience that I had, I wasn't really sure any of this was legit. When I woke up the next morning though, all the money had been returned to my wallet. I wish I could explain the sensation that I had, like my spirit had been refilled. I believed in humanity. And of course, carried a deep respect for the dark web community after this. I used to work at a video store in Los Angeles in the 90s. We had quite a few celebrity customers, even a few porn stars too. It was a wacky work environment that could feel pretty unsafe at times. But that unpredictability was half of the allure. I honestly loved the job and the crazy unhinged customers that came with it. There was a porn star that would come in frequently, I'll call her T, whose visits I would absolutely dread. She only seemed to come in when I was working alone. She would always ask me the same question. Which of my movies do you carry? Now, she didn't ask this in any kind of unreasonable manner. T was a little older, clearly had a whole career behind her. She looked and acted a little crazy, like she was out of her mind, but she was also very obviously high. She'd come in jawing, grinding her teeth together, and her eyes would bulge out of her head like they were some prosthetic special effect. She was skinny from years of substance abuse, probably various personal issues with weight and image. T also reeked of booze and cigarettes most of the time. She would scream, which of my movies do you carry? over and over again with that crackhead energy. I repeatedly told her over and over, our computer system would only look up movies by title, not by actors or actresses. But this fact never seemed to get through to her. Every time she would start screaming at me. Remember this is 1995, so the computer I used to look up things and check rentals was a dinosaur. But it didn't really matter because T would always forget. How in the hell can you find out which of my movies you have then? She would scream. I offered to walk her back to the adult section. She could see the stock shelves for herself, but she would always scoff, as if totally disgusted at that idea. 
This is where it gets bewildering because she's a porn star who's already come into the adult film store. I'm not going in there, she yells. Lady, you're already in here. What's it gonna hurt to go scan the shelves real quick? In my head, I'm thinking she's a porn star and she won't walk the aisles and look at the covers. It made me think she was even crazier than she was leading on. What'd she think she'd find in there? Just how out of touch with reality was this woman? Anyway, she would yell at me for a bit before calming down and then leaving. But this scene played out at least a dozen times. She wasn't the worst customer I had, but she came to be the one that I dreaded the most. But then one week, she didn't show up. Monday, Tuesday, the whole week went by and still, no tea. It was a huge relief, but part of me wondered, did something bad happen to her? Was she getting extra spun out and would come in even more crazy? The reasonable side of me figured that she'd OD'd. When another week went by without her presence, she left my mind entirely. Fast forward a month or so, guess who comes slithering through the double doors? It's T, and she looks like hell. First off, she clearly hasn't showered for several weeks, maybe since the last time that I saw her. You could always tell when she was really unwashed because her hair would just get more and more vertical. I don't know how else to explain it, other than the grease would just hold up this overly dyed, frazzled hair. Her clothes are about the same as always, nightwear and half-sporty valley mom. All of this is nothing when I see her face though. She has a huge black eye, and her eyes themselves are just completely insane. She's got pupils like dinner plates, and the outer rim, instead of white, is tinged with a deep yellow. I can't tell if she's sick or more hungover than any human I've ever seen. She comes to the counter and sparks up that same shtick she always does. What movies do you have? Where are they? How many copies? I try to be a little personable and say, hey T, it's been a while since I've seen you. We still don't have an updated system that allows me to search for those specifics. I can show you the shelves that might help you though. I'll never forget the look she gave me. Just this faraway nod, half smile with her mouth all jittery. She asked me if I was sure, to which I said yes. Then she started backing up towards the exit. Unsure of what was going on, I figured she was in the middle of an episode and would see herself out, probably disappear for another few weeks. I would heard of mentally ill people being stuck in loops of behavior. Maybe visiting the video store was part of her loop. Boy, how wrong was I though? The door opens not 30 seconds later and a big, tall, sharp-dressed guy strolls in. I extend a welcome but hesitate. This guy looks pissed. He's storming right up to the counter. I ask if there's anything I can help him with. He sets his hands on the countertop and they are blinding, studded with all kinds of gold and silver, crusted diamonds in between them. He calmly explains that I'm the problem and that he's here as a solution. Huh? I start to come back with something about how I'm just at work, just an employee here. If he wants the cash in the register or the pornos in the back, he can have them. The guy laughs at me, shakes his head, then explains that I've just upset his friend who was just in here. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. T, the crazy cracked out porn star who's been pestering me for months, somehow secured backup? I tell him that I don't know her at all. She's just a needy customer who wants to find her films. There's not an easy way for me to do that, so she'll just have to look over the titles herself. This guy cuts me off with a wave of his hand says he knows. He's heard every word. He's heard it so many times that he feels like it's happening to him, and now he needs to get involved. It turns out T was pretty much what I pegged her for. This guy was clearly gang or drug related, maybe even a kingpin. He acted like he was T's handler, almost like a pimp or something. She was so old there was no way he had her tricking. I mean, I guess there's a market for anything, but I got more of the vibe that he had a relationship with her and for himself. Whatever the case, it's now my problem. I'm looking up at this coke machine of a man, deciding if I should hit the security button. This is just a video store, so part of me didn't even think that would work, but, but it was down at the other end of the counter, and if I moved, this guy was going to snatch me up for sure. He states T's full name, then her stage name. They were similar, probably more similar than you'd want them to be. I realized then that T was probably pretty easy to look up in the phone book if you were clever enough. 
He then asked me which movies do you have with her in them. Obviously, he didn't want the same excuses I'd given before, so I threw my hands up in defeat. I logged into the computer beside me, pulled up the inventory list of the entire store, started doing it the old-fashioned way. I jotted down a short list of titles that I recognized and just started from there. It took me almost an hour to find every single tape, constantly double-checking the shelves and discount racks for hidden copies. The whole time, that guy just casually followed me around, not saying a word, just watching me gather them all up in a tub on the counter. He'd crack his knuckles, roll his neck, textbook intimidation stuff. It was like a scene from The Goodfellas. It was only after I started to pile up all the tapes that I realized just how extensive T's career was. She was a mainstream actress for like 20 years from what I could tell, and had been produced by some of the bigger studios throughout the decades. It occurred to me that this crackhead burnout probably still received checks for some of this stuff. Now the guy behind me made sense. As I said I did it, that was it. I told him it'd take me a minute to ring them all out. He asked what I meant by that. I set a charge for all the films. I explained I couldn't just let 80 or 90 tapes just disappear from our store. The guy picks up the bin of movies with one arm, slides a pistol out of his waistband with the other, looks me up and down, sets the barrel on the counter, then asks me if we're good. I just nod, and with a sigh, tell him to take care. I called my boss after I saw them leave the parking lot, who in turn told me to call the police. Both of them showed up 20 minutes later, the police took a statement, and my boss filed a report of robbery then fired me right there on the spot. I've thought a lot about that guy, who he was, and why they wanted those movies. I work in retail, and there are only five of us that work in the store, including our manager. We are a very, very tight-knit family so we naturally have each other's backs for anything and everything. Tonight, my coworker and I were minding the store, and he needed to leave early for a dinner reservation with some friends that just got to town, so I covered the last 30 minutes alone. We work in an area that has a prominent homeless population, most of whom are wonderful people. After he left, within a few minutes, a very sketchy character came in that set my hair on end. This guy was about six and a half feet tall, heavier set, and was generally intimidating. To add to the already scary vibe, he was holding a big gulp and a golf club, nothing else on his person. I'm a shorter, smaller female, so now I'm just on edge. He didn't hesitate to make conversation with me, and it's my job to be friendly and make sales, so I jumped in, hoping I'd learn he was harmless and coming back from a driving range or something, even though there's no golf courses within 20 miles of our workplace. Obviously, since you're reading this, I was terribly wrong. This man still had a hospital bracelet on from his two month long stay in a mental hospital, was very, very interested in me and every aspect of my life. He asked what I was studying, which was psychiatry, and then he was immediately put off as he'd had a very bad experience. And I mean literally the moment he heard the word, it's like an alarm went off in his head. His whole expression changed completely. My heart does go out to people in this position who are clearly struggling, and it's my life's mission to help people like him. But no matter how much my heart went out to him, I was still very vulnerable. He then asked me the following questions. What's your name? Where do you live? Where do you go to school? When do you work? How often do you work? When is your next break? How old are you? Do you live alone? Is anyone else here? I lied to every single question, and when he demanded my phone number, I gave him the store phone number. I also told him my name was my manager's name, so that if he tried to make contact, he would be directed to someone that is not me. Thankfully, I was able to boot him out at close. Some of my answers were pretty vague, like where I lived, and that seemed to upset him a bit. Still, he left without much issue. When I left, I had changed my clothes and my hair to be a little less recognizable. And thank goodness that I did that, because he was waiting in the alley out back. I did my best not to notice and make it obvious, but I beelined for my car, which was in a parking lot across the street. This, unfortunately, gave him a bit of time, 
and he soon came wandering out of that alley. I didn't turn around. I just played it cool and stared at the crosswalk icon glowing across the street. It changed and I proceeded. Just as I heard this guy sprinting up behind me. It's late. There's no one else around. I know what's about to happen. He's going to hit me in the head or in the knee or whatever and then drag me into that alley. My nerves break and I finally turn back. He was standing at the edge of the sidewalk just staring at me. Once I turn, he can see my face. He grumbles something and then keeps following. Shit, I gave myself up now. Now he knows it's me. He even starts hollering the fake name that I gave him. I didn't respond, just picked up the pace and hustled to my car. I figured as long as I could get inside, I could probably get myself out of here. Still, I hear his shoes scuffling the asphalt, gaining on me. When I think he must literally be right behind me, I want to turn around and look, but instead, I just break into a full-on sprint. I can hear his steps stop a little and then hesitate. My outburst to get away must have caught him off guard. Just as I reach the door inside the key in, I turn back one last time. I don't see the man, but his hand. Fingers wrapped around the handle of the golf club. It's so close that I can read some of the print on the hospital band that's hanging from his wrist. I was so terrified and reeling with shock that my knees buckled. My legs totally gave out from underneath me. As they did, the golf club went whistling overhead. It was all that that prevented me from getting my brains bashed in. Not instincts, not training, just sheer terror. Fortunately, I fell backward, right into the driver's seat of my car. I yanked the door closed, locked it, then sped out of there like I stole the damn thing. I called the police and then my manager. The guy was picked up and booked that night. I even had to identify him at the station. Always, always trust your gut out there, people. I work in retail. Receiving shipments for our location is one of the things that I do for my job, since I do the paperwork for it. I have to interact with the truck drivers who also bring the shipments in. It's a task-driven job and requires a lot of organization, but also demands a pleasant personality because of all the interaction time with the drivers. Most of them are older men in their 40s to 60. I'm a woman in her mid-20s. This is relevant. Most of the drivers are great, helpful, and professional. But there was this one who was oddly talkative all the time. Nothing really weird, but sometimes irrelevant or mildly inappropriate conversation topics, like stuff he did back in college, his ex-girlfriends, you get the picture. I just figured he was outgoing and a bit quirky, so I was friendly with him, like I am to everyone. Until a coworker, a guy who also works in receiving, but in a different apartment, told me that he only ever hears this driver talking to or about me. Apparently, when I'm not in the room or in earshot, then he's silent or talking about me, asking where I am. Then a completely different coworker said he overheard this guy referring to me as his wife when I wasn't there. So after hearing all this weird shit, I become less bubbly around him, kept the conversation strictly to business. If he ever said anything about his personal life, I would just ignore it and then went about filing the paperwork. I wasn't rude to him or disrespectful, just simply stopped going out of my way to engage him in conversation. There was one time he got a little too friendly in the clerk's office, and my reaction was pretty knee-jerk. I couldn't help myself. I felt cornered because he was really laying in on the lovey-dovey stuff, right in front of other people. It was the strangest, most direct form of gaslighting I've ever seen. As if I just slide right up underneath him, like we'd been dating for years. He made a comment and I spun around and told him, and the innocent bystander clerk, that we were in no way involved, and our communication would be strictly professional from there on out. That was when he turned on me. Everything he said was an attack on my personality. They must be working you too hard. You're far less fun to be around than you used to. You used to be a happy person. I love my job. I'm very happy here. I just don't like being creeped on by old men. Eventually, he went as far to telling other people that I was unprofessional, basically a bitch, just straight up gossiping about me behind my back, and that was when I confided in my boss about how uncomfortable this guy was really making me. 
I actually pride myself on my outgoing nature. I'm bubbly by default. And the fact that he was causing me to have to change my personality around him and then telling others that I was cold hearted simply just for keeping my distance. That was the line I drew. My boss filed a report. Everything died down after that, at least for a little while. My coworkers would still overhear something every now and again, but, but it seemed this old timer was keen to who was on my side. I figured it was water under the bridge at that point and we just let bygones be bygones. That was until the phone calls, every day for three or four weeks. My phone would start blowing up at random times throughout the day at work, at home, and even in the middle of the night. I thought it was spam, but no one ever said anything. The number came up as unknown, so I didn't even know how to block them. Part of me had a suspicion that it had something to do with that old guy. During some of his good old day stories, he'd mistakenly cop to doing stuff exactly like this, prank phone calls, leaving stuff on people's porches and cars, whatever. He got a kick out of messing with people he deemed to have wronged him. I started keeping tabs at work, asking my friends in other departments to keep their ears open for anything, especially anything the old guy thought was funny. I keyed them into my situation and that if he talked to anyone about what he was doing, it'd be in a braggadocious way and he'd be proud about it. Nothing came through the grapevine though, but every day my phone continued to ring. Some days, especially if I was at work, I just turned it off, dump it into my purse to get a little peace of mind. The more I thought about it, the more it made sense. Of course this sour old man had the time to mess with me. He drove a truck for a living. He was probably on the phone 18 hours a day. With renewed confidence, I let the calls roll off my back. I'd answer them and call the guy by name, tell him what I thought about him, then hang up. Even at work, I'd look him right in the eye, shake my phone at him like we were long lost pen pals. I could see it was getting underneath his skin. One night on the weekend, I woke up to my phone light. It wasn't buzzing, just the constant on and off screen. It was enough to get me. It's an unknown caller. I roll over and answer it. As I get ready to let out a string of vulgarity fly out of my mouth, I hear a loud honk outside my house. And I can also hear it through the phone. Now I'm legitimately creeped out. I get up and peek through the curtains to see this guy's truck in the middle of the street, the same truck he used for work. He hung up on me the second he saw the curtains part, then roared off into the dark. No more honks, no turnaround. I didn't know what to think. First my phone and now my house. How the hell did he learn any of this information? I didn't go to sleep that night, but started putting together as many puzzle pieces as I could. By the end of the weekend, I'd constructed a pretty solid case against this asshole. I took it straight to my boss on Monday morning. I gathered that he must have been stealing my personal information from the files at work. This was the second time I was in his office about this particular guy, so I'd already created a paper trail. When I brought the new stuff against this clown, my boss was floored. He couldn't believe it. He went on to file a second report, but this time he made a direct announcement to the entire company and other companies that we were working with. It was the start of a chain that exposed a lot of scummy weirdos harassing the office girls. This isn't technically retail, but it was a sales position that I took one year when I was in college. A few of my friends were in the music program and naturally joined a few bands as they networked with other local musicians. One of these projects they actually joined ended up taking off, creating a bit of local buzz, and by the end of the year, they had a couple of regular gigs around town. They started getting asked about a small regional tour, essentially just bounce around the cities and college towns throughout our state. The guys contacted some venues, made the plans, and set their first tour for the end of the summer, right before we went back to school. One of the guys in the band had toured regionally before, so he knew some of the obstacles to watch out for, one of which being theft on the road. He encouraged bringing a van keeper to help manage the equipment, keep track of merch and sales, and generally make everything accounted for. My friend in this band asked me if I'd be interested. I was over the moon. I agreed and cleared what little planned I had and got ready for life on the road. It was nowhere near as glorious as I thought it would be, most days were spent cramped into the back seat, fighting for room to stretch out, trying to breathe in what everyone smelled like. 
I'm sure you get the picture. We'd stop every few hours for gas, bathrooms, and food. All of us would get in this conga line, walk around the van a few dozen times just to get the feeling back in our legs. The actual music side of it was amazing. Watching these guys jam in a different way every night made old songs sound brand new. It was magical. The parking lot warm-ups were fun to record, and the after-party shenanigans went down in the books as some of the craziest shit ever. The light show alongside the music put me in a trance every night behind the merch table. Handling the sales wasn't really a big deal. That was until the shows actually ended. Only then would I get totally swarmed. People crowding in three or four different lines. All of them thinking they're at the front. All of them sweating and shouting. You get the picture. The first couple of nights were actually scary, but as time went on, I got the handle on the flow. It got easier and I became more confident. About halfway through our tour, I meet a guy named Alan. He was at one of the smaller shows in a college town where it was easier to have a conversation with somebody. We spotted each other across the showroom a couple of times. I wasn't hiding my vibe. He was cute in the music scene and he seemed to be around my age, maybe a little older. Sometimes in the alternate scenes, it's hard to tell how old people actually are. As the night wore on, he got closer to the merch table, would occasionally wink at me, to which I would just smile and wave back. I knew he was going to come talk to me. I just enjoyed the music, sold some shirts, and wondered how far this would actually be able to go, considering I was sleeping on the road with four adult men. I couldn't take him back to the van, if you know what I mean, as we could only afford hotels every other night. Needless to say, Alan and I hit it off hard there at the venue. We talked for an hour while I worked the merch table. He just leaned against the wall and spoke whenever he had a chance between sales. We both said we were students, but he only had a semester left in his program. He was a nursing assistant and was going to switch to x-ray work or something along those lines. It was medical through and through and required a decent amount of school. He was beyond nice, and after the show was over, he helped me box up all the merch and carry it out to the van, then went on to help us get the music equipment inside too. I introduced him to everyone in the band and they immediately clicked. Alan fell in with us and hung out with us the rest of the night. We found a Taco Bell and enjoyed a glamorous midnight fifth meal, as poor touring bands are known to do. Then everyone turned into sleep, one by one. The van had a tow hitch for a little trailer, so you could cram everything in there for when we slept inside the car. Alan kept me up until almost 3 in the morning. We talked, smoked cigarettes, and gazed at the stars, and enjoyed a sense of company that I typically crave. Flirty but within reason, intellectual but not technical. I love what he said, and the way he said it. That said, I'm a realist, and I knew this was some guy who I'd just met, who I was idolizing a bit because of how I met him. The whole being on tour mentality really punched a hole in my ability to reason. After a relentless back and forth, Alan finally agreed to head home and let me get some rest. I explained that we didn't have much to do but drive the next day, but it was miserable without any sleep. He said he understood, as he didn't actually live in the town that we were in. He'd driven from a couple of hours away to see some friends, just ended up coming to the show on a whim. We exchanged numbers, had one of those cringy forever long 2000s emo kid hugs, and then had our first and only kiss. I climbed into the van, watched him walk across the parking lot, climb into a nice car, and zip off into the night. In that moment, I had a huge regret of not spending the whole night with him, but I was clinging to logic and knew that there was a lot of time to gamble on a guy that I'd just met. Better to sleep on it and touch base the next day. Who knows, maybe he's just a player and didn't even give me the right number. The next day, we gassed up, get some snacks and directions, and drifted towards the next gig. I got a text from Alan before we even got on the highway, wishing me a good morning and to drive safely on our way out of town. It was nice and refreshing to see that he was a genuine guy, maybe even interested in me for real, so I hung on every word. He said he just made it back home, just before sunrise. Don't you ever sleep? I jokingly asked him. Nope, was his only response. Of course, anyone with a brain would assume he's kidding, but Alan? turned out to be a serious fucking weirdo. We get to the next venue to do it all over again, 
unload the van, unload the trailer, then organize everything so it's in the right place. I can't tell you how many times I'd get a crate over to the merch table just to pop it open and find it full of wiring for the instruments. Then I'd have to lug this 40 pound case back behind the stage and swap it for the one actually full of shirts. At one point early on, I stepped outside really quick to grab a cigarette. I was running on fumes from the lack of sleep and wanted nothing more than just to pass out right there in the alley. I checked my phone, but as I did, I noticed something in the parking lot. A car that looked exactly like Alan's was down on the corner, parked away from the light poles. Same color, same rims, same everything. Now Alan drove this pretty basic sedan, kind of like a Camry or a Cord, so I didn't think anything of it. There are millions of that model of cars on the road. I'm sure if I looked, I'd find 10 more in the parking lot just like it. I went inside to get back to work and powered through one of the biggest shows yet. This place was totally packed as the boys weren't the headliner tonight, but were opening for a super popular band from this town. It made for really good marketing though, because the crowd they got to open for was five times bigger than any of the turnouts so far. That also went for the merch sales. I got absolutely slaughtered back there to the point I started running out of smaller sizes. Through the chaos and crazy lighting, for a split second, I thought I saw Alan leaning against the back wall. He was chilling, smiling, not waving or anything. Before I can react, my line of sight is broken and the crowd swarms me again. I forget about the whole interaction and just assume it was some kind of lookalike. The night was ripe for all kinds of new fun, but we were spent from the drive the show and now just wanted to break down. We bucked the equipment inside the van, did a very loose inventory count of the merch and then locked it all down until dawn. There was a dingy hole in the wall Mexican restaurant in the same plaza in the venue, the kind that's open 24 hours, filled up on burritos and rice. We elected to skip the beans because of the close proximity to one another. After dinner, a couple of the guys wandered down the lane to a bar they could see. Me and the other two retreated to the van to get a couple of hours of sleep. We originally planned to get this hotel in town as the rate was a little cheaper, but everything was crazy overbooked. This weekend was apparently some big event for the community, and even the headliner band had brought in a few hundred extra people. We just took the L and slept in the van. No big deal. Everything was normal until about 1am rolled around. I could hear a very subtle tapping on the shell of the van. Half asleep, I barely even noticed it. I just figured it was the wind or something else. Not a minute goes by. The tapping turns into a knocking, like someone would knock on a door. Both me and the other two guys shoot upright, totally bewildered. We look around and see that the other two bandmates aren't in our van, and so get irritated. It must be them coming back from the bar and they've lost their keys. The windows of the van have this reflective cover on it and allows a little privacy also to keep the light out in the morning. Because these covers are up, we can't actually see who's knocking on the van. One of the guys slides up to the front seat, pulls the passenger cover back, and I'll never forget his face. It was pure disbelief. His eyes shift from the person outside to me and says, I think it's for you. I laughed, but there was a sickening pit growing in my stomach. I didn't know a soul in either direction for 200 miles. There's no way it could be for me. I switched places with my friend in the passenger seat, peek through to find Alan. Holy shit, it is for me. I open up the door and ask him if everything's okay. He says, of course, asks how the night went. I tell him it went okay, I'm just confused as to why he's here. I look back at my friends in the back and they're both giving me this what the fuck kind of look. One looks more concerned, the other looks more annoyed. I feel a mix of both, almost perfectly blended. I remember that they asked a favor of me and now I'm creating drama in a weird situation of having this guy stalk us, for lack of a better word. I mean, we're in a big, dumb white van with shiny windows, you can't miss it. I climbed out of the passenger seat and onto the black asphalt and let the door shut behind me. The least I can do is let the others get some rest while I deal with this situation at hand. The first thing I say is, huh? I didn't realize this is the town that you were talking about. He shakes his head and says, No, I don't live here. Oh, what brought you here? The tour, he says, with the creepiest fucking smile I've ever seen. 
I look around and the place is a ghost town. No late night stragglers or passing cars, just me and Alan. That's when I remember seeing the guy leaning against the back wall. Were you at the show? I asked him. He nods at me with that same creepy smile. I didn't want to bother you. It looked like a very busy night, he explained. And now? I asked. What do you mean? He asked. You don't mind bothering me now? It's the middle of the night. I didn't even know you were here, I say. He doesn't react well to this. We go back and forth for a bit, arguing about how we arrived at this current situation. It turned out he took everything I said literally, and I mean to the T. The night before, when I said that I'd love to pick the conversation up again sometime, he meant literally, the next night at the same time. When I said I wished he could ride around and tour with us, he cleared his schedule to make that happen. Nothing that I'm saying is getting through to this guy. He just keeps trying to smooth it over with me, with his glassy, emotionless smile. Just as I'm getting ready to bow out, tell him to get lost, the other two bandmates come rolling up to the van. Alan gets spooked the second he sees them rolling up. I mean, totally shook, went pale and everything. I look to see how drunk these two are, but fortunately they look alert and not too pleased to see me talking to Alan. They immediately understand that something weird is going on. Now with these two in tow, I restate everything that I was saying to Alan, who is clammed up and is nodding, listening more intently now. I let him know this was all a big misunderstanding and that maybe it was moving a little too fast. It's not appropriate for him to be showing up in the middle of the night. He apologizes, turns on a dime and heads for his car. We hang out in the parking lot for a few more minutes, have a cigarette and compare notes on what the hell just took place. Everyone had a slightly different theory, but they all had the same conclusion. Keep an eye out for that dude. He didn't really appear overly dangerous, but he did have the means to follow us around. And that's exactly what he did. We awoke the next morning. There was a series of letters tucked underneath the windshield wipers. Naturally, they were all addressed to me, and they were all creepy as hell. The weirdest part was that each letter was written as if it was the only one. None of them mentioned the other nine pieces of paper plastered up and down with lovey weirdo bullshit. It almost teetered on Old English. The next week was way more stressful than the first. Every day became an I spy game of looking out for Alan and that slick sedan. The unbelievable part was just how often we spotted him. On the highway multiple times, we could see him lagging behind a half a mile trying to stay hidden behind other cars. It had to be him because we'd see it every single day. We'd see him driving around the venue, or gas stations in every town, or even parked having lunch across the street from us. He could tail us anywhere because of the van and because we had a whole tour posted on the internet. Each town, each date, each place the band would be playing. We were sitting ducks for this guy, or at least I was. Everyone in the band was just teasing me about the stalker that I created. They weren't anywhere as concerned as I was, but they were on stage for some of the night. All eyes on them. I sat in total darkness in a back corner. Alan showed up more than one time and had me cornered back there. I'd have to get security every time to kick him out after explaining the situation. It became an almost predictable occurrence. The crazy part was some of the staff at some of the venues knew him. He was a regular, totally normal to these people. I couldn't believe it. It painted a much bigger picture. Like, is this a hobby for him? We started taking measures to actually avoid him, like taking alternate routes and heading to the next town right after the show, rather than wait till morning. We lost him, but who knows? Maybe he was just being coy. I never went on tour again, not even as a van keeper. And I can confidently say I haven't heard from Alan in over 10 years. So I lived near a ghost town in Elvira, Pennsylvania. Back during World War II, the government claimed eminent domain and booted everyone out then built a munitions and bomb factory. Fast forward to now, a chunk of land was given back to the community as state game land. A portion of it hosts a federal prison, and a bunch of it 
sits unused by the government itself. The game land contains the remnants of the town, which is just foundations and wells at this big point, and a bunch of bunkers. These bunkers are concrete igloo-like structures, with a big metal door on one side, once used to store explosives. Now, used for teens to get drunk and do drugs inside. Over time, they've become covered in dirt and plant growth, so you might mistake it for a hill if you didn't see the door. There are local rumors that devil worshippers hang out in the game lands and have strange rituals in the forest and in some of the more out of the way bunkers. Me personally, I never believe these. Every single town has a place with devil worshipper rumors. But last year, my friend claimed that it was actually true. He said his parents were hunting that fall, saw a group of people in robes around a fire, chanting. A figure wearing a deer head mask stood in the center of them. His parents hunkered down and kept eye on that ceremony, kind of in a daze like state from the whole spectacle of it. Maybe it was a movie set or a weird old religious practice. They said that they only stuck around because they were sure some reasonable explanation would present itself, but none ever did. As they watched the entire situation continue to devolve, the chanting grew into a roar and the choir slowly began to disrobe before the masked stranger. The very first to get naked took handfuls of some substance from a large bowl and started to paint the deer mask figure around his neck. Only then did they realize it wasn't a mask at all, but a real deer head, hauled out and still dripping with gore. The stuff they were palming out of the bowl looked to be blood. Without a word, my friend's parents started to backpedal and get the hell out of there. As they did, one of them took a bad step and crunched on some underbrush. They said the entire cold stopped and then turned in their direction and began wailing and moving all kinds of crazy. They used the darkness to their advantage as well as their camouflage and charged through the forest in the direction of their truck. After running for a few minutes, they finally turned to look back. In the distance, they could see a fire glowing between the trees and slender figures chasing them in the moonlight. They weren't as quick since they were naked, but still, they were putting some ground behind them. Only the guy with the deer head mask remained by the fire, his creepy arms extended up in the air. My friend's dad said the guy's arms looked like they were eight feet long, but, but he was sure it was some sort of illusion from the firelight. He also said, one time while him and his dad were scouting, he heard the chanting and singing and then saw smoke coming out of the trees. This time it was earlier in the afternoon, so they still had some daylight to investigate. My buddy said his dad turned him with the most serious look and asked, you want to see something crazy? Of course my friend said yes. They're dressed appropriately. They know the area, even have sidearms. There couldn't be a better time to go check something like this out. Even with that perfect opportunity at hand, my friend told me as they got closer to the singing, he got a sick feeling in his stomach. He realized, no, he didn't want to see whatever was going on behind that tree line. He said it was the most unnatural thing he could imagine out there, and the fact that they were drawn to it was a huge red flag in his mind. He compared it to being in a haunted house. If you heard someone screaming bloody murder in one of the rooms down the hall, you would probably run the opposite direction. So why was it that they were hearing something out of place in an area known for Satanists, and they were pulled toward the sound rather than driven off? It was almost like a fight or flight trigger had clicked in his head, and he felt like they were making a giant mistake. My friend expressed this to his father, who he turned to find was ghastly white, his dad said he didn't feel up to it either, so they turned around and made for the truck. That chanting never faded, but only seemed to get louder as they got further away. He also said there was a vile smell in the air that seemed to be riding the smoke cloud, as if they were burning roadkill or something. Personally, I never believed this story, not even when I heard it. It sounded too perfect, so I just figured they wanted to come up with something to mess with us kids. To be fair, it was a good attempt. That's not the kind of story you just forget about. Most of our group were constantly talking about it, half obsessed with the notion of a cult just outside of our town. It wasn't long before we started planning little explorations of our own into the ghost town of Alvira. Now for my own experience. When I was in high school, myself and about five friends were all having an all-nighter at my house in the summer. 
playing manhunt in the woods, shooting each other with airsoft guns, the usual stuff. At night, we all went out with flashlights into the woods because of course we did. The woods around my house are the same woods as the game lands. There are only two properties between mine and where the bunkers begin. We saw an orange light through the woods, except it was in the wrong direction for any neighbor. There weren't any buildings in the direction of that light. Slowly, almost one by one, we all stopped playing and became transfixed on that glow. Is it a car? A bonfire? Then the smell hit us. That same awful smell my friend had described from a year before. Like smoldering flesh, burning hair. It's honestly unmistakable. We've all driven by a dump. We've smelled gases and mountains of rotting trash. But this smell was far worse. I have no idea what it was, but I can for sure tell you that it was dead. My friends claimed it was the devil worshippers, and then all started to freak out. As I said, I didn't believe in those stories, but I played along to scare everyone. Little did my buddy know that I was just playing around, assuming we'd find something normal just a few hundred yards into the forest. Like I said, there were some properties between my house and where those bunkers began, but they didn't have houses on them. Both acreages were used for logging, hunting, and camping, and all manner of outdoor recreation. I figured one of the property owners was having a family reunion or something like that. So we all went out on a quest to find the devil worshippers and went toward that light. There was an overgrown road that led into the forest, but then tapered off into a pretty clean path. We walked in a little cluster, with those on the outer ring warding off the dark with a couple of flashlights. A couple of us had the airsoft guns, which might look real in the shadows, but ultimately wouldn't protect us from anything. The light drifted off to our right now, away from the trail. We left the path and began bushwhacking in the dark, now quite far from the house. I couldn't even see the back porch light through the forest anymore, so it had to be at least a mile away. Whatever the orange glow was, it lured us much deeper than I anticipated. We heard my neighbor's dog in the distance, barking its head off. Assumed it was at us, but then it got really intense. Made a horrifying noise no dog should be making, and then just stopped. We were all a bit taken back by that noise, so we stopped and listened. In the dark, from just beyond the reach of our light, we hear footsteps bipedal sounding footsteps not a squirrel in the brush or deer crashing through bushes but a clear crunch 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 of the leaves my buddy and i point the airsoft guns into the tree and start spraying in every direction after a few seconds we stop again and just listen there's nothing except the occasional set of steps through the leaves sometimes they're close other times they sound really far off like the person is leaving we didn't really know what to do it felt like we were trapped. After five minutes or so, the footsteps stop altogether and there's nothing to be heard. At that point, we all unanimously decide to head back. My friend and I wanted to keep going though, but we didn't want to do it alone, so we all agreed. We were sleeping in the guest apartment over the garage, which is a separate building from my house. It has one of those 70s accordion style doors halfway up the stairs separating the upstairs area from the hallway and bathroom downstairs. We kept it shut to keep the warm air trapped upstairs with us, but also as a layer of security. It had a little latch to be locked to give us an extra second in the event someone actually came for us. We talked about the cult, that light we saw, and the crazy sounds that we heard. It was heart pounding for the first 15 minutes, but as the night went on, nothing else happened. The rest of the group slowly began to lose interest. Later that night, well after midnight, when we were settled in and starting to doze off, those of us who were still awake heard something brush against the door from the other side. It was a flimsy plastic linoleum thing, so it was moving as something had bumped it. We could hear the noise clearly. I gathered up the courage to say out loud, does anyone hear something bumping the door? I got a few shaky yeses from around the room. Is anyone going to get up and check it out? Now I heard several nopes from the others, as I sure as hell wasn't going to do it. It went away a few minutes later. I got up a bit creeped out and went down the stairs. 
I could see that flimsy accordion door was still latched in place, but it looked like it had been pushed inward. I took my finger and dragged it back and forth along the folds of the door. It sounded exactly like what we heard earlier. I went back up as quietly as I could, told the others about my little discovery. Just as I'm talking, a weird shadow passes over the room. There's only a few of us awake now, and we can see each other in what little moonlight can make it through that big panel window. All of us reacted to it, so we knew whatever we saw had to be something real. Slowly, trembling, we turn to look at the window. Right there in the middle of the pane is the longest arm I've ever seen with this gnarled, twisted hand right in front of the glass. Like I said, we were on the second floor above the garage, so for someone to raise their arm up, it'd have to be 15 feet long. The fingers alone were 12 or 10 inches. We watch in horror as it rears back and then begins tapping against the glass. It starts quietly, but with each rap, it gets a bit louder. Those of us that are awake hit the floor. I remember being in such a panic that I couldn't even breathe, feeling as if we were about to be drowned on the carpet floor. Some of the others started to cry into their pillows. I watched the arm bang against the glass when I realized that wasn't a hand, but a knot of sticks. The arm itself was a branch, but all of it had been shaved to look like a limb with fingers at the end. In the dark shadows with our already panicked minds, it was easy to see it for something else. It was a bit of a relief to see that there wasn't a 20 foot tall man standing outside the apartment, but still, someone was out there banging around. After a few minutes, the branch slowly sank back into the shadows below the window. As it did, we heard the rustling against the linoleum door halfway down the stairs. This time it wasn't just scraping against the plastic. Someone was really trying to yank open that door. We could even hear footsteps shuffling on the level below. Someone was inside the garage. We all went into a meltdown at this point. A few of us decided it was our last stand. We grabbed some various items in the apartment, like a hammer and a 2 by 4 and lined up at the top of the stairs. We all played airsoft, so we thought we knew basic tactics. Cut them off of the bottleneck was the only logical defense. If they got into the landing with us, we're dead. I remember that charred smell from the woods and realized we could all be burned alive. But just like that branch in the window, the rustling against the door stopped too. We heard the footsteps retreat until they went back outside. By then, we were all far too scared to get to the window to look. None of us could breathe. After what seemed like an hour or two of silence, we packed up our stuff and made a life flight into the main house. All of us, at a full sprint. Nothing came out to grab us, though. When I turned to close and lock the door behind us, I saw that same glow out in the trees. It was a bright orange fire, warding off the dark. I bet if I listened, I could still hear them singing. Instead, I pulled the curtain closed and hunkered down with my friends. We passed out not long after we got into the house. We never went out to those bunkers again. About two years ago, I was driving home from a family reunion party pretty late at night. The drive itself was about two hours. I didn't stay the night because I had to be back for work the following day. Most of the drive was on roads with dense bushes and trees on either side. The real creepy ones that you see in a lot of movies. I've been driving for about 45 minutes and I start to get really tired. You know how sometimes you suddenly become really tired out of nowhere? Well, yeah, that happened to me and I knew I wasn't gonna last, but I didn't come across any place I felt like I could park and safely sleep. After a while, it became clear to me that I wasn't gonna find a place to pull up. My tiredness was just not going away. I did something very questionable. I pulled over to the side of the road onto the grass behind these bushes, tried to hide my car from anybody else who's gonna come past. The roads weren't empty. I came across another car every few minutes or so. I made a mental note to myself. The time was 11.22, and then fell asleep. This was by no means routine behavior for me, 
I honestly was just exhausted. Didn't feel tripped up by the area. It was rural enough that there wouldn't be anyone out in the woods, and the road was trafficked enough that I wasn't truly alone. Other commuters were drifting by, which would make it hard for someone to creep up on my car. At least, that was my logic. Sometime later, I was awoken by a scratching sound. I looked at the clock. 11.50. The sound stopped a few seconds later, and because I was still extremely tired, I didn't really bother looking around and simply went back to sleep. Barely a half hour had gone by, and I'd only really started falling asleep. I wanted at least an hour's worth of rest before I hit the road again, so I closed my eyes and tried to forget about the noise. I was later woken by that same sound. It was now 12.40. It scared me for some reason when I saw the time. I really didn't feel like an hour had gone by, yet there it was, the reality glowing back at me. For whatever the reason was, that amount of time that had gone by made me feel even more vulnerable. This time it really freaked me out because the sound did not stop. The thought ran across my mind that it was an animal inspecting my car, but why would it return almost an hour after it left the previous time? I looked in my rearview mirror, just managed to catch a glimpse of something running away into the forest. At the time I thought it was a hook killer, you know, the one that scratches the couple's car then slaughters the guy when he got out to investigate. Hell no, I thought to myself, I'm going to get out of here. There was a bend no more than 100 yards up the road. As I came around, there was a car, parked off to the side of the road with a driver's side door open. I slowed down just to look to see if anyone was in there, and there wasn't. I let the car roll to a stop right next to that open door. This was just beyond weird. It felt like I was in a dream or something. I actually considered trying to do something crazy just to see if I was dreaming. The inside of the car was dark, washed only with moonlight. It occurred to me that someone clicked the dome light off to keep the car somewhat hidden. It also occurred to me because I was doing something similar when I tucked in my car behind the bushes. Whoever that person was, they didn't want to be seen. I don't know why, but I put my car in park and got out to take a look. It might have been because of the dream thoughts that were still in my head, but for whatever reason, I was more curious about whatever was going on. Any other reasonable person wouldn't have abandoned their safety in a situation like that, but I was looking for answers. The situation was too weird not to. I walked around to inspect the driver's seat. The car is somewhat kempt, a little trash in the front and back. It looks like your average person's daily driver. In the back, I see a duffel bag, moderately packed, zipped with a small padlock. This seems like a long distance traveler to me. You don't see people locking their luggage much otherwise. Also inside the back seat, a coat hanger that had been straightened into this weird twisted form. Only after I see that wire does everything truly come into my head and I realize just how dangerous this situation is. I turn to jump back into my car, but something catches my eye in the front seat, something glistening all over the front steering wheel. I lean over and nearly vomit when I realize what I'm looking at is a certain bodily fluid that happens after you do a certain act. Some weirdo was self-servicing out here in a country highway. Yep, definitely time to get out of here. I jog around to the driver's side of my car, jump in and slam that thing in drive. Forget the rest, forget the exhaustion, I can't be here. The car starts to glide forward as I make my escape. Then I look in my rear view mirror. At first I didn't see anything, but then all of a sudden, this guy comes sprinting around the bend of the road. He looks insane, deranged, with these big white eyes bugging out of his head. He looked embarrassed and kind of surprised. He must have been lurking around when my car was originally parked. Maybe he dozed off or something, and when he woke up, I pulled away to find his car just up ahead. Whatever the case, the guy was just barreling right for me. In the red reflection of my brake lights, he looked absolutely terrifying like he was possessed by a demon or something. Even his teeth were rinsed in this crimson color. He starts screaming at me, shouting like, Hey! Hey you! Get the hell out of your car, now! I just sat there in shock, unsure of what to do. He keeps screaming which finally snaps me out of my stupor, and I sped down the road. It was just in the nick of time too. 
because that guy was inches from touching my back bumper. Without missing a beat, he jumped inside his car, fires up the engine, and starts chasing me down the road. Not good. Actually, I was totally unprepared for this. I'm not really an overly confident driver, and my car is not a speedster by any sense of the word. I look into my mirror again, just in time to see the psycho turn his headlights off, his black sedan simply vanishing in the darkness behind me. I let my speedometer hit 75. I don't want to do anything too crazy. We're still in the woods. There's animals and other cars potentially I could crash into. This guy would definitely catch me if I jam my car up for any reason. Still, I couldn't tell if I was making distance or not. I kept my eyes divided between the road and the rearview mirror. He wasn't there though. Something caught my eye in my periphery. And I looked outside my window to see his car now parallel with mine. He was staring at me giving me this insane smile. He gestures down to the steering wheel and the coating he gave it, as if he wants to know what I think. He shows me a screwdriver in his free hand, all 10 inches of it. He makes a motion as if he were trying to get my door open with it back when I was parked. Thankfully, some headlights cut through the dark up ahead. There's an oncoming car shooting right for this crazy guy. He's forced to brake and get behind me. The oncoming car slows down a bit, as if it's seen him squirreling all over the road. Now there are witnesses, so I flash my headlights and try to communicate that something is wrong. This totally spooks the guy. He turns off the highway and starts cutting back into the woodland. He was driving this pretty average sedan, now definitely outfitted for four-wheeling. This guy was desperate to hide. Whatever he was up to, I wanted no part of it, and I learned my lesson. I'll never sleep on the side of the road ever again. This is not supernaturally creepy, but one of the more disturbing and surreal experiences of my entire life. One early morning, a few short years ago, I was walking to my bus stop eating a banana. It's dark and misty, around 5 a.m., and I'm internally debating something trivial, like if I want my daily Starbucks before or after my commute. It was a walk I'd made a million times, not particularly far distance and not anywhere dangerous by any means. My worst fear was getting jumped by a dog. I'd heard a story about a woman walking home from the store when I was a kid, and she was snacking on something she'd bought as she strolled along. Well, a mangy dog got a whiff of whatever she was eating, came out of an alley, and started tailing her down the street. The lady had no idea, so next time she let the hand fall to her side, and it was holding that treat, the dog jumped up and bit two of her fingers off. And they never caught that dog, so they were never able to reattach her fingers. The whole thing was so crazy to my child brain, it became a deep-rooted paranoia for many, many years. That being said, I knew my block well, and there weren't any dogs that lived on this end. As long as I kept an eye out for the strays, I was in the clear, so I let my guard down more than I may have otherwise. As I approached the dimly lit corner of my street, a tall man in a black mask steps out of the dark alleyway to my left. Sleepy and disoriented, I barely even acknowledge him. I'm a bit of an introverted person, so it's not uncommon for me to not acknowledge people even slightly. It's rude, but it's my personality type, and frankly, it's 5 a.m. I don't need to greet you with a smile. Still, there's an energy I start to feel as I walk past. I couldn't put my finger on what it was, but that was because I wasn't looking at him. Since I was a foot between this guy and already catching weird vibes, I decided to not chance it and look up for my banana. As I'm deciding to do this, the guy yells for me to freeze and don't run. All kinds of weird stuff. Out of the edge of my periphery, I can see him pull a gun out of his pocket. I don't need to look up now to know the barrel is aimed right at the side of my head. The guy lets the cold steel bounce off my forehead and tells me to put the bags down. I say, okay, okay, I'm putting them right down over here. I was carrying a small duffel and a messenger bag, just trying to place them more on the curb to create a little distance between myself and that gun. I was still processing exactly what was going on, still really not in the moment. Part of it may just be shock, 
Maybe that's how we all feel when we're looking down a barrel, though. He shakes his head and lunges for me, really showing how aggressive he is. There's no way to create any distance, so I stop moving and nod along. He orders me to walk over to him, into the opening of the alley that he just came out of. I step over, but I'm still in the street. Now he tells me to get on the ground, to which I agree. My heart is pounding a million miles a minute against that concrete. All I can smell is the banana in my hands and my mouth. It's a scary but soothing combination. I know I need to make a break for it the second I have an opportunity. I don't know why, but my mouth just won't stop working. Look, see, I'm on the ground. My stuff is over there. Please just take my stuff. He doesn't like it. Shut up. Let me think. He gets on top of me and puts the gun to my head. As I do this, I realize that this guy isn't a career criminal. In fact, this might be his first time. He needs a moment to think? Are you kidding me? Without any other options, though, I nod and try not to blab too much. At this point, I should mention the fact that I'm on my way to coach a high school practice. I'm dressed like a dude. Huge baggy pants, hat, jacket. If not for my telltale voice, I'd look like a pubescent 90s rap star. Anyway, this guy gets on top of me, gun to my head, looks at me and then pauses. I can't tell you why I know this, but I swear at the moment, it clicks for him that I'm actually a woman. He gives me this disgusting smile and starts to nod. What do we got here? I like that voice of yours, he says. Everything about this guy has now changed, even the way he's handling the gun. He was apparently threatened by me before, thinking I was a dude. Now he's easygoing, charming, trying to be slick. I won't go too deep into it, but his hands wandered for a bit, trying to get me figured out underneath my clothes. He gets off me, stands up, and then points to the dark alley. Come with me, is all he says. My stomach hurts. I remember that there's been a bunch of sexual assaults in my neighborhood, and during the daytime, no less. When the man points down that dirty alleyway, my internal voice speaks up. Voice number one, there's no way in hell you're going to go down there without a fight. But he has a gun, you idiot, replies voice number two. Get up. The real voice, his voice, hollers. It snaps me out of my trance, just laying there hugging that sidewalk for whatever security it might lend me. Staring down the alleyway, I was happy to lay on that ground. The voices in my head stopped trying to offer advice, so I was left with my own logic. The alley wasn't an option. I'd let him shoot me with every bullet before I went down there. I ran a few quick scenarios through my head, but nothing really made sense. There was no cover, nowhere to hide, no one to call out to. The guy is getting a little manic again, fidgeting between myself and the alley, looking back and forth. I'm on, he says again. That's when it comes to me. I'll do what I do best. Talk. I'm coming. I'm following you, I called. And the man makes a crucial mistake. He believes me. I take one, two tiny steps backwards towards that sidewalk. He turns his body and his gun toward the alley. This is my moment. I take a deep breath, tuck my head down in case he starts shooting, and start sprinting away. I hear a voice screaming in a high-pitched wail before I realize that it's me. After running six or seven blocks, I head back to my apartment, hoping he's not there to see where I actually lived. The police checked out that alleyway an hour later, but the potential attacker was long gone. The only evidence of the encounter is my banana peel browning in the alleyway and the adrenaline rush that couldn't shake for days. I would be lying if I said that experience doesn't bother me still, but I'm so fortunate, mainly to be haunted by the what ifs and not the what dids. Thankfully, I had a job that was understanding. No one razzed me about missing practice or showing up late. The strings of attacks kept on in my neighborhood for another couple of months until one day, I saw a headline in the paper, the story about that attacker, the history of assaults, and the general area of the crimes. There was a picture right beside the text. It was the same guy that jammed me up that foggy morning. He looked like he didn't have a care in the world, which was honestly one of the scariest things for me. You could tell the man was heartless when you looked at him. 
God knows what he would have done if I actually listened. Every time I stay at my grandma's house, I hear someone walking upstairs. It starts at one end of the room, casually walks to the other, and then stops. This happens maybe twice a night. I didn't start hearing it until I was 14. My grandmother made me start sleeping in a different room on the first floor because they started sleeping in a separate bedroom. Either way, both of the rooms are on the first floor. That being said, their old original master bedroom is on the second floor and is the only bedroom upstairs. Now it serves as a glorified guest room and the general storage for the grandparents. It's beautiful with all kinds of collector decor, antiques, I'm sure you get the picture. Just for a little backstory, I've always been afraid of the upstairs at their house. I really don't know why, but it's just always freaked me out. I refuse to ever go up there alone. I'm 23 now, still won't go up there by myself. There's one room specifically though. It's a long, narrow bedroom. When you open up the door, there are closets on your left and your right, and a bed placed roughly in the middle of the room, and a window on the far side opposite the door. I was told growing up, by my grandparents that the sons of the previous owner claimed to see a gorilla come out of the closet at night, dance around the room, and then go back inside the closet. Obviously, I didn't really think much of this story until I had to start sleeping in the other room, the room located directly below the scary room upstairs. I mean, seriously, what a truly unique story to hear. The story would have been back around the turn of the century, early 1900s, so a gorilla was such an odd claim for these children. Of all the things, why that? What could be so overwhelming that these kids thought that they were looking at a big ape dancing around the room? It always stuck out in my head though. Obviously, there aren't any answers to be found. It's just something we heard growing up. So I didn't really think much about it until I started sleeping under their old room. That's when all this craziness started to go down. Now to the story. We're hanging out at the grandparents' house. A very busy day of visiting. It's gotten late. We're all starting to turn in for bed. All the lights in the house are off. I'm still awake though, lying in bed. That's when I hear it. Thump, thump, thump. Starting at one end of the room upstairs. It got close to me, passed right above me, and then continued to the other end of the room. Then it stopped. I'm wide awake, terrified out of my mind. It was no question to me that I heard those footsteps. I knew that slow, casual pace. I was freaked out. I went to my grandpa's room, told him what I heard, and he told me that the house is old. It creaks and moans. But he turned the dining room light on for me, so it made me feel a little safer. I tried to go back to sleep. It started up not long after that, this time from where it ended the first time, by the window upstairs. It walked over me again and stopped when it reached the door. I thought it was over until five seconds later. I hear it coming down the stairs. One, two, three, four, five. Silence as it reached the landing. Then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Silence again as it reached the first floor. I was frozen in shock. Whatever it was, it was now on my floor of the house and sadly unaffected by the dining room light. I was staring at the doorway to my room, with the dining light room shining in. My vision began to distort. I felt so dizzy with fear that I pulled the blankets up over my head, and suddenly I heard a scratching sound from inside my room. I knew exactly where it was coming from too, my grandpa's gun case. It was a very obvious sound, scratching on the wood long scratches down the front of the gun case door. I could even hear the door ever so slightly tapping against the frame as each scratch began. I tried to scream to get someone's attention, but nothing even came out of my mouth. I took a deep breath and tried again. This time a shriek rips out of my lungs. In seconds, my grandpa had made it to my room and was asking what the hell is going on. I explained everything, how I heard the steps heard them come down the stairs, creep down the hall, and finally scratch the gun case. 
I tried to space out the timeline so we understood that this didn't happen all at once. It was something that's slowly moving from room to room. Needless to say, he didn't believe me, so I did what any normal person would do. I draped the sheet over the side of the bed and slept underneath the mattress. I wrapped myself in a tight comforter and put on headphones, turned my back to the door. There could be a party of ghosts in my room, I wouldn't even know. It was actually pretty cozy underneath the bed, as there was a good clearance and nothing else was under there, so I just zoned out until I fell asleep. The next morning, my grandpa told my grandma about what happened the night before. And she just said, Oh, that's silly. You know your cousin woke me up the last time she stayed here. She came in my room saying that she heard footsteps too. I take a shaky breath. Then my grandpa and I shared a look. He makes a comment about how my grandma never mentioned that to him. She says she didn't find it important at the time. It's an old creaky house. Of course there's noises. With more information on the table, I can tell that Grandpa is now a little shaken up himself. Still, they come to the conclusion that they've lived there a long time and they've never experienced anything like it. I slept under the bed for the whole rest of that trip. I've stayed there countless times since that happened. I hear footsteps every single time. I sleep on top of the bed now, but keep my back to the door and sleep with headphones on. At least until one specific trip. One summer, my cousins and I stay with my grandparents like usual. One night, as we're playing a particularly heated game of Scrabble, the evening just got away from us. The game ended and we realized it was well after midnight, past the time most of us went to bed. We hugged, said our goodnights, and everyone turned in. Because of the hour and the distraction of playing Scrabble, I kind of forgot about my sleeping routine. Since my cousins were visiting too and sleeping on the couch, I wasn't concerned about the creepy stuff. I crawled into bed without the comforter shield or my headphones, started to drift off. Just as I'm about to pass out, I hear the first of several thumps. I don't even open my eyes. I felt like I betrayed myself and didn't feel like getting up and getting my stuff together. I wanted to power through, sleep like a normal person, so I just rolled the dice and stayed inside the bed. I listened to the thumping for probably 45 minutes. It stayed in the room above mine, but after a while, it ventured into other parts of the second floor. At times, it was so far from the part of the house that I could barely hear it. Part of me was a little excited, as I thought maybe my grandpa would finally hear it himself. The weight of those steps was not subtle, not even in the slightest. Full weight with each and every step. If they trounced overhead for even 10 seconds, they'd wake anybody up. Sure enough, at the one hour mark, my bedroom door slowly creaked open. I sat up rigid and wide-eyed, expecting to see that gorilla step into my room. It's not an ape though, but my older cousin. She has that same crazy expression that I do and asked me if I heard that, to which I almost start to laugh and wave her over to the bed. We discussed it for a minute mostly how long we'd been hearing those sounds and what it might actually be. Then we got into the history of it, how long the footsteps had been going on for. I thought I had the most experience, but it turned out my cousin had me beat. Her first night dealing with it was more than 10 years ago, whereas mine was only four or five. Just as we're talking and comparing our notes, the thumping comes back over to my bedroom. We freeze. It was the first time I ever heard it in the company of another person and frankly, it made it even worse. When you're alone and you hear a noise like that, it's much easier to write it off as wind or board settling in. Having someone next to me confirming every step made me spiral. As we listened though, it had the opposite effect on my cousin. I mean, I can't lie. She was scared shitless at first, just like I was, but it only took a minute and then she was fired up. She kicked the covers off of both of us, jumped up and started looking for a flashlight. There was one in the bedside table, but it was very close to dying. She didn't care. With one hand on the doorknob, she turned and asked if I was coming. Slowly, without any confidence, I slid out of bed and went down the hall with her. Just as we started to move into the kitchen, the thumping upstairs seemed to follow. Sure enough, the steps started down the staircase. 
All three of us would hit the landing at the same time by the sound of it. My cousin squared up, then literally ran around the corner and shone the light up the stairs. I watched her eyes go wide and her face go blank. She didn't like whatever was up there. I came around the corner, but there was nothing there. Just the flickering light from the flashlight. My cousin said when she first looked up there, she saw pale white feet and a linen gown. Then they disappeared up the stairs. I begged her to go wake up our grandparents, but she refused. We'd been waking him up on every visit for a decade. Now that she had some backup, she wanted to get to the bottom of the thumping once and for all. As we climbed, we could hear it shuffling deeper into the second room, moving between room and room. I'd never heard it up here. The steps didn't sound as heavy, almost hollow now. The flashlight went totally dark for a minute, and I almost pissed my pants. I mean, literally. I couldn't believe how dark it was. When the light came back, though, I saw what my cousin was talking about. A figure in a gown, shuffling around the corner. We both jumped and screamed, but we jumped in opposite directions. She went toward the room it went into, and I went back towards the stairs. At this point, I'm screaming for my grandpa to please wake up. My cousin snatches my wrist, drags me towards the guest room that that figure is in. The light is failing badly, but she's hell in. We get to the threshold and peek in. For the first time, the bulb gives us some solid illumination. There's a gowned figure standing in the middle of the bed. The person is like a full four feet above us with their back to the door. It looks like a woman at first, but I honestly can't tell. Whoever it is, they're humming to themselves, gently swaying in the dark. My cousin takes another step forward, just as grandpa steps into the room and flicks the light on. That's when everything comes together. The person that we see on the bed is my grandma. She's been totally out of it. It turned out she'd been sleepwalking for a number of years, maybe even longer than that. She would get out of bed in the middle of the night, go to her old bedroom and relive memories or whatever. Apparently it's pretty common. Either way, it scared the hell out of all of us that night, even my grandma. My cousin to this day isn't totally convinced. Like I said, she heard the steps 10 years prior before they even started sleeping in a different room. She thinks grandma sleepwalking just overlapped with something else. Whatever the case is, we all make sure to visit together. I graduated high school just after the economic collapse of 2008. The meltdown was catastrophic in the state where I reside, so I went from living poor at home to living in a true poverty on my own. Myself and a friend got an apartment in downtown Phoenix. He worked in retail, and I worked security for a department store. We both made less than minimum wage, just barely enough to cover the bills together. The apartment complex that we lived in wasn't just a dump. It should have been condemned. Our unit had a bare concrete floor, unpainted plaster walls, and you could see light around the frame of the door. Fortunately, we lived in the valley, so temperatures weren't a huge issue, but security was pretty much non-existent. The place wasn't just trashy. It was a common occurrence to hear fights going on in the middle of the night, or to come home to a building totally taped off and police officers everywhere. I'd heard about a guy getting stabbed in the alley just a few streets over. He limped back to the complex and called for an ambulance. Another time, there was a late night dispute at a party and one guest ended up shooting another. To say it was a colorful apartment complex with lots of wild neighbors was just an understatement. This place was legitimately dangerous at all hours for anyone from any walk of life. Even cops and gym rats were getting caught and beaten by street gangs and other violent offenders. We never really felt safe anywhere inside that neighborhood. I didn't even have a car to get around. I spent a lot of time walking or riding the bus, wherein I did my best to lay low and not catch any attention. All that being said, I grew up in the city and spent my time going to late night metal and rap shows at sketchy venues. I knew how to navigate seedy areas 
I had to de-escalate situations, and ultimately, I had to handle myself. I had been in more than one physical altercation, and always managed to walk away. My roommate and I were both potheads, so naturally we came up with the idea of selling weed on the side for extra money. We both already worked full time, to the point of extra hours every week, and would still come up short every month. In our heads, the logical move was to sell weed that we always had a stash of in the house. The idea was we'd both be able to smoke for free and maybe kick up a little profit here and there. So that's what we did. We started with a half a pound, invested an entire month's rent to get it, and started flipping it immediately. We kept it real low profile, under the radar at all cost, because we did not have the means to protect this stash. Our front door barely even locked, for Christ's sake. We definitely couldn't afford a gun. Frankly, I don't even think we wanted one. We never discussed the possibility of getting robbed or anything like that. This was just a side gig to make a little cash, not anything we wanted to get wrapped up in. By that logic, the only people we sold to were direct friends and family, co-workers, people we could trust, and hold accountable for anything that went awry. We weren't really huge party guys, maybe the occasional weekend turnout, but we mostly just chilled at home. We liked getting stoned and playing video games, watching movies, vaguely nerdy stuff. So this is what happened. I have to tell you in two parts because I wasn't there for the first half. I'd gone to work at my normal shift, but ended up having to stay late due to filing some last minute reports. While I was at work, my roommate, who we'll call Mike, got home and did his normal thing, put on a pair of basketball shorts, grabbed a Pepsi from the fridge, and saddled up to the TV after smoking some weed. He'd play some solo campaign or whatever until I got home. Then we'd get online and team play or something. It was normal routine for our work week. Right around the time I was supposed to get home, the door handle jiggled. Mike didn't think anything of it. It jiggled a second time. This time my roommate hopped up and went to the door and actually opened it. Instead of finding me, he found a squad of gangbangers who pushed their way inside. Mike couldn't even scream before a hand is slapped over his mouth. He's ushered into the kitchen and then laid on the floor. At this point, I'm starting to wrap up my extra shift at work. I'm getting close to clocking out. There's a 40 minute bus ride between me and the break in going on at my house. Either way, we don't even know that it's happening, so it's not like I'm about to call the cops or get our buddies together. I just finish up and head to the bus stop like I normally did. Meanwhile, Mike is getting jammed up badly. Three of these are holding him down, slapping the absolute hell out of him, demanding to know where all the valuables are. Behind them, the fourth guy is already starting to root around the living room. He's put our PS3, games, and controllers into a pillowcase. He's sizing up the flat screen, deciding if it's worth the trouble. Mike decides in this moment, he's not going to go down without a fight. He struggles, shoves, spits, but it's no use. It just gets him in deeper water. A couple of these guys ring his bell, almost break his nose. The punches are so hard that his head is bouncing off the exposed concrete flooring. But still, Mike isn't out. His muscles flex against these guys out of instinct, not having any more in him. Two of them roll my roommate over, while the third ties his hands and feet with a pair of bootlaces. They were organized, well practiced, and methodical, and Mike knew he was outgunned. But for whatever reason, he still did not want to give up. He starts shouting for the neighbors to call the cops, call anybody, he's being robbed. One of the guys comes back and stuffs his own sock into the back of his throat, before going back to turning the place upside down. By now, I'm just getting off the bus, and I've started a short walk to the apartment. I've taken my headphones out because I don't want to stroll with music through the neighborhood. It just seems like the easiest way to get jumped. I avoid the alleyway shortcuts and just wander the main roads, which is the longest way. All the while Mike is getting his head bounced off the floor. I've always felt bad for the leisurely manner in which I went home. I enter the complex, make it to my building, ascend the exterior staircase to the second floor. I can see our unit. The door is closed, but behind the thin curtains of our front window, I can see two or three bodies hustling around. There is noise, but it's nothing that seems totally crazy. My first thought is to knock, but 
but then I dismissed that immediately. It might be a shithole, but my name is on the lease. I twist the door handle. It's locked. I slip in the key and push open the door. Three big, shadowy ski mask goons turn to look at me. My first instinct is to bolt. It's as clear as day we're getting robbed. I don't even make it two feet before I feel a pair of hands snatch me up and then yank me back into the fluorescent hellscape that I call a home. The tour was horrific. Our TV is smashed to shit. The electronics have all been bagged up. Papers and mail scattered everywhere. Everything in the kitchen is on the floor. I remember all the silverware and broken glass just being shiny. I couldn't look away as they carried me down the hall. The hallway is like a bomb crater, holes punched in the drywall, clothes and random stuff scattered everywhere. I didn't resist as much as Mike did, so I just got hauled into the back bedroom, where I found my roommate face down. They'd hogtied him. He's thrashing like a crazy person against the bindings. I can see his wrist and ankles rub raw and are starting to bleed. They throw me on the ground next to him and roll me over. My hands get tied in a similar manner, but I guess they ran out of cord because they never bound my feet. They get me laced up and return to searching the place, but with what looks like a quickness. I got the vibe they weren't expecting me to just show up and now figured anything could happen, even cop interference. Mike turns to me, spits the sopping wet sock out of his mouth. He'd apparently been working on it for a while, but didn't have a reason as to they probably just stuff it back in. We're in his bedroom. It's already been ransacked. His video games are gone. Signed concert posters, even his mattress was flipped over. We gotta get these guys, is all he says to me. I shake my head. How the hell are we gonna do that? We need to call the cops. Mike nods to my laces and asks me if I can get free. Cautiously, I start to work the lace binding my wrist together. I'm staring down the hall, waiting for a shadow, any sign of someone coming back. I assume if they catch me trying to get out of the knot, it'll result in a savage beating, like they did on Mike. I don't want any part of that. I'm not a hero. I just want the situation to end as quickly as possible. But I do find that my knot is loose. After picking at it for only a minute, the whole thing unravels and I push myself to my feet. The adrenaline dump hits me. I fly over to Mike and start undoing his knots. These are much more tight and intricate. They take me much longer to pick at. It felt like almost an hour, but was probably closer to 10 minutes. Mike just laid there, still as could be, slowly clenching and unclenching his fists. Surprisingly, no one ever came to check on us. We could still hear them rooting around the living room and my bedroom. And the weirdest part, I didn't even care. None of it mattered when I looked at the blood dripping from Mike's mouth and nose or the rapidly bruising flesh around his eyes. There's a part about Mike that I've left out. He was a little older than me. He'd actually served in the army. He was a combat vet who'd been deployed to Afghanistan a year or two prior while I was still in school. He was a bit of a wild card as he struggled with PTSD after coming home. Now, he was a combat crawling across the ravaged cement of his bedroom. It was totally crazy to watch as he disappeared into the folding doors of his closet, then reemerged with a baseball bat and an old military helmet on his head. A green steel one, like from World War II. The only thing he had on was one sock and those goddamn basketball shorts that he'd wear every day after work. I waited in the bedroom, out of pure fear, before finally glancing down the hall. It looked like the place had cleared out, except for Mike, who was stalking through the shadows with a bat lifted over his head, staring at something. Sure enough, one of the robbers steps out from the kitchen and into the hall, moving left to right. The front door is in front of him, maybe 10 feet or so, and Mike is closing in, mere steps away. The guy's back is to us. He's rummaging through a box of our stuff. Mike clocks the guy over the back of the head, and somehow, this guy weathers the blow. I mean, it was a full body blow to the back of the cranium with a steel bat. It was unbelievable to watch. The guy stumbles forward and then starts to recover. Before he can yell though and warn his buddies, Mike peels his helmet off and pitches it. This piece of steel hits the guy in the head, full tilt. 
He starches and then falls limp against the cement floor. Mike turns around and points at me, tells me to come sit on the guy he just knocked out cold. I was petrified, but slowly under Mike's encouragement, I crept out and put a knee on the guy's back. It didn't matter though, he was literally snoring on the ground. Mike tells me to check the guy for a cell phone, and if I could find one, call the police. Before I can reply, my roommate re-equips his helmet and charges out into the night after the remaining bandits. I turn back to the guy that's underneath me and shakily check his pockets. Lo and behold, I find a phone, two of them, mine and Mike's. He's also got our wallets and a little cash, which I pocket all of. I call the cops and let them know what's going on, and they actually arrive pretty quickly, well before the guy wakes up. As I said earlier, this apartment complex that we lived in was notorious for all kinds of crazy criminal activity. There was a squad car hovering around at all hours, it seemed. Mike returned just as they were loading the single guy into the car and taking a statement from me. Our apartment was absolutely destroyed, so everything was pretty obvious, and I could actually point out the evidence to corroborate the story. They found all our weed and smoking material and stole all of it, so fortunately, we didn't have to worry about catching any charges. We also failed to mention the extent to which Mike beat that guy. He didn't find any of the other men. They were loading our stuff into a getaway car the whole time, so when they were done, they were gone fast. They never caught them, and we never got our stuff back. And we weren't even able to move out of the complex as quickly as we wanted to. We did invest in a stronger door, a better lock, and always made sure to check before we unlocked it for anyone. We also stopped selling weed. As near as we could tell, those guys had heard from someone that we were a plug so they decided to roll us. I like to sleep in. It's the number one thing that I look forward to on my days off. One morning, I was doing exactly that, just rolling around in bed, first sleeping past the time that I usually got up for work and then past the hour I typically eat breakfast. I don't really set a time for when I want to wake up, I just keep turning over until I decide I'm ready. I guess it would have been a bit after 7am when I got this weird feeling. I don't know how to describe it other than a low sense of anxiety. I felt like something is wrong. I chalked it up to work stress, like maybe I'd left something undone, I'm just trying to get my sleep in. Not long after this, I hear my cat ripping up the stairs and down the hallway. I turn over just in time to see him, jump in sails with the air, and nimbly land on the top side cover of the bed. He quickly nudges his way underneath the blankets and hides near my feet. All of this is very out of character for him. Firstly, my cat is elderly and very overweight. Running anywhere is strange, but jumping and scrambling is totally bizarre. And hiding? This is a stereotypical cat, but he doesn't really cuddle, let alone get underneath the blankets with me. Now I'm much more alert, and I'm starting to think that that feeling earlier was a premonition of some kind. Maybe the feeling of being watched. Whatever the case, I take a deep breath and decide it's time to get up and investigate the house. Just as I get halfway upright, I make out the form of two men slinking up my stairs. They're dressed all in black, looking right at me. The whole exchange made me feel like I was supposed to feel intimidated and for whatever reason, it just really pissed me off. Probably because I worked hard for my stuff and these two clowns were going to rob me of some of it. At that moment, I felt like time stopped. There's no really other way to describe it besides total limbo. It felt like those dreams we have for whatever reason, where something bad is happening around you but you're powerless to escape or act. Suddenly everything is in slow motion as if trying to move underwater, and all your strength fails you. It was sickening in the moment, but it was my house. No one else was going to do anything but me. I snapped out of my trance and started to move. This gave time opposite the sensation, like everything was in fast forward now. I threw the covers back and leapt out of bed. I remember I made sure to land heavy on my feet. I wanted to shake the entire house, really let them know how this was going to go. I remember making sure to wrap my cat up in the covers, make sure he was secure before I started my war cry. 
I don't remember exactly how it went, but it was something to the effect of, get the fuck out of my house, over and over and over again at the top of my lungs. They froze in place as all this happened. I crashed through the doorway and into the hall. They turned and bolted for the door, and that fanned that inner rage I was feeling, that primal urge to protect my cave from these invaders. My mission quickly shifted from defense to offense, and I sprang after these guys. As I was screaming, my voice seemed to get deeper and deeper. I thought I sounded like my dad or my grandpa. It was such a weird thought to have at the time, but those were the people that I'd seen in their angriest. And they sounded a lot like me right then. I think it motivated me, because the next thing I knew, I was soaring down my staircase like a missile. There was a bend in the staircase, and one of these wannabe robbers was just shuffling around it when I jumped. I crashed into him. We both slammed into the adjacent wall. In this guy's defense, he fought his way free pretty quickly. Then we collided with the hardwood of the wall. I fractured my arm in two places. My grasp on him suffered greatly, as you can imagine. That didn't stop me though. I kept after them through the front door, which had been opened with a crowbar or some kind of tool. The entire door frame was chewed up from the effort, and my bare feet were assaulted by the splintered wood as I ran over it. They stabbed me all over, including underneath my toenails. I didn't even realize how bad they were injured until a few hours after the break-in. Adrenaline is a crazy thing. We all get outside and these guys are sprinting. They have their proper shoes on. It isn't long before they leave me in their dust. Still, I'm huffing it. I see the getaway car. They both jump in the back and this thing peels out, but not before I see the seven digit license plate and whip around the corner. I stood there, aching arm and throbbing feet, and just repeated it out loud over and over again to myself. I think subconsciously I was hoping a neighbor would come out to assist, but, but no one was home evidently. By the time I made it home, I'd forgotten the license plate number. I was furious, but there was nothing I could do. If I'd brought my phone, I could have saved it and locked those guys up for a couple of months at the very least. Justice, from my point of view, was never served. They didn't steal anything, only scaring me and my cat half to death, but they did bust my arm up, and that wasn't convenient. The sense of adrenaline and the fight or flight response is almost indescribable. It's so overwhelming, it's like your only sense for a moment. I'd become hyper-focused on a certain detail, but obviously things would completely escape me, like my ripped up feet. The time dilation was something to behold. When I made my report, I was told that the area was ripe with break-ins. Several other houses had been hit in similar manners. I went out and invested in a full home security system, complete with a camera on every door and corner, full hard drive and cloud storage, the whole shebang. I even started taking shooting classes, because whereas I kept a gun in the house, I wasn't confident enough to run and grab it while being robbed. Our world is so crazy. So everyone, stay vigilant out there. When I was younger, I was in a relationship with a guy that we'll call Jay. He and I were very unstable, but we were totally in love and had been through a lot in the years together. We struggled with a lot of things, even teetered on being homeless. But Jay pulled through and got us a place to stay for a while. Things were tight, but it seemed like we were going to be able to manage for at least a little while. Jay and I were staying with two of his friends, Tim and Derek. Derek had left the apartment an hour or so before Jay and I decided to head to bed. This really wasn't that uncommon, as both of Jay's friends were into all kinds of weird scenes. They were both big party guys, loved to drink, but one of them liked to gamble and the other was into drugs. I don't remember which one was which, but it made for an uncomfortable situation at home. A few minutes after Jay fell asleep, I heard a knock at the door and Tim answered it. It turned out it was Derek, but he wasn't alone. Two guys that also lived in the apartment building forced Derek to knock at the door so that they could force their way in, as he didn't have his keys with them. Once they were inside, I could hear what sounded like a scuffle from where I was in the bedroom with the door closed. I woke Jay up, and all of a sudden, we hear two unknown voices yelling, get down, get the fuck on the ground. The energy just escalated from there, as Tim and Derek shouted back, and then there was more of a scuffle. 
It sounded more one-sided this time. Jay wanted to go see what was going on, but I begged him to stay in the bedroom with me, which thankfully he did. After what seems like a couple of minutes of arguing and fighting, everything went absolutely silent. It's maddening to be in a situation like that, especially inside your own home. Everything you take for granted just flies out the window. You're left with whatever chaos is left waiting for you. There wasn't a door or a lock that could keep us safe, based on what we were hearing. Jay persisted that we needed to make sure that his friends were okay, and at this point, I didn't know what to do. The silence was just eerie as hell. We opened up the bedroom door, didn't see anything, so we slowly crept down the hall until we saw a pair of legs sprawled out across the living room floor. Blood was starting to pull beneath the torso. It was Tim. He was struggling to breathe. There was something sticking out of his chest. It looked like a spear or a sword to me. Later, the police would tell me it was a barb machete. Derek was frantically calling 911. He was almost incoherent, trying to make his report. Caught between speaking to dispatch and trying to keep his friend awake. Jay went mental at the sight of his friend. He tore the bathroom apart looking for medical supplies, but ultimately just came back with lots of towels and adhesive wraps. He tried to staunch the bleeding, but the wound was crazy. It was like something out of a movie. Tim needed an ambulance immediately. Derek told us the police were on their way, but didn't have a time of arrival. What were we supposed to do? My first initial thought was that I needed to get the hell out of here, but Derek stopped me. He said dispatch said because of the nature of the call, everyone needed to remain in the residence until the police arrived and could start their own investigation. I had to stay in the apartment with a guy I barely knew, bleeding out, gasping for help. It was horrendous. I wish there was more that we could have done. Soon, we could hear sirens cutting through town. One at first, then a couple more joined the choir. They were a little more different from each other, so I assumed one was an ambulance and the other two were police. I realized the guy that did this could still be around. It also occurred to me, they might hear the sirens and come back to finish everyone off. We were all witnesses, technically. The apartment building didn't have buzzers to let anyone into the building, so when the police got there, Jay let them in and showed them to where our suite was. After that, they separated us all and put three of us into the back of three different police cars. They left us while the paramedics tried to save Tim. Unfortunately, they weren't able to save him, and he died inside the apartment. I knew he was dead when the paramedics wheeled him out to the ambulance, but didn't leave for at least another five minutes without working on him at all. He just sat back there on the stretcher, shapeless under the blanket they draped over him. Blood slowly starting to spot through the fabric. I couldn't do anything but cry as I watched them drive away. The police took us to be questioned, again keeping us separated the entire time. About 12 hours later, they were ready to let us go, but told us we were not allowed to go back to our apartment as it was an active crime scene. We were dropped off by the police at a coffee shop with no money, no phone or wallets, or even shoes on our feet, as they wouldn't let us take anything from the apartment before they put us in the police cars before being questioned earlier. We ended up going to a friend's house where we stayed until we were let back into our apartment four or five days later. The whole thing was dehumanizing, being separated because we were all essentially suspects into the killing, not able to support one another just in case we were covering somebody. All the time we spent sheltered at the friend's house was just a fog, a complete haze. We all really wanted to talk about what happened, but no one really knew how. Jay and Derek would whisper about it sometimes, especially if I was elsewhere in the house. This was because I would get so emotional at the thought of everything, pretty much lose my mind. Once we were allowed back into the apartment, the first thing I had to do was clean up the blood, which I'm sure you can imagine was pretty hard to handle. There seemed to be gallons of it pooled in the same spot. Just coagulated, endless blood. And I'll never, ever forget that smell. Obviously, this isn't protocol, but the police don't clean up crime scenes. They give you a card to someone who does, and the charge is thousands of dollars. We could barely afford rent, so that wasn't even an option for us. We just took shifts sopping up the blood and wringing into a bucket. The whole thing was pretty traumatic.
After graduating, I got into a bit of a situation with a guy that I knew from school. He and I weren't friends, but we had a few classes together, so we were familiar naturally. Well, for whatever reason, after we both graduated, this guy started coming to my job pretty regularly. I worked at a restaurant. It wasn't entirely out of ordinary at first, but after a while, I really started to get this weird feeling. It started with the staring. He would eyeball me from one end of the building to the other, looking me up and down without so much as a blink. It was weird, but soon other people started to comment on it, and that's when I really got creeped out. I realized how little I actually knew this guy. Then after that came the text. He'd harass me every hour of the day. Fortunately, this didn't go on for far too long as I was wise enough to just to block him. I really didn't want to entertain any part of his crazy, so that was enabling him in my mind. I just needed to be shut down on the spot, and by doing that, I hoped to shut it down entirely. It didn't go the way I hoped it would, though. Soon this guy was showing up at house parties that I attended, lurking along the fringes like a true weirdo. I gave him a polite hello at first, but he just stared. Sometimes he'd nod his head, gesturing like he wanted us to get out of here and go somewhere else. It wasn't until he showed up at three or four of these house parties in a row that it occurred to me how strange it really truly was. I had a lot of friends. What were the odds he knew this many of them? I asked the girl hosting if she knew him. Her answer was no. She'd never seen him before. And she definitely didn't invite him. Okay, the plot thickens. How the hell did this guy know how to find me? Over the next few days, I pieced it all together. He was following me from work, from my house, and he figured out my entire schedule. That was my best guess, and really the only thing that made any sense. While well, the guy who was stalking me broke into my house with his friend. I had messed up my sleep schedule, so I was awake at 3 or 4 a.m. I grabbed my little dog and phone and went to the basement. It was this little cellar almost. A trap door in the floor with stairs that led down to a small space with a furnace and hot water tank. The second that I sealed myself down there, I regretted my decision. I really didn't know how dangerous these guys were, and I just cornered myself with absolutely no way out. If they found me, I was completely at their disposal. I put a lot of faith in my cleverness and their lack of awareness. Bit of a gamble, but I didn't know what else to do. Thankfully, my dog is nice and well-mannered and a little baby, so she didn't make a noise the entire time. I was worried that she'd bark or growl and give up our hiding space. I'd had some cardboard on the top of my door, so they didn't see it when it was closed. I turned my phone on silent and texted my best friend asking her to call the police for me. Meanwhile, I can hear these two skulking around from room to room, trying to surround me. They figured that I was in my room when they entered and you can almost hear the surprise in their footfalls. They came to a stop and just stood there, almost directly above me. After the longest 15 minutes of my life, the cops eventually get there. They arrested the shithead and his buddy, and then came to find me. These two assholes had what police described to me as a rape and disposal kit. Duct tape, lube, sex toys, a handsaw, and a box of heavy duty big black trash bags, which implied intent and planning. They went away for conspiracy to murder, conspiracy to commit rape, breaking and entering, and something else that I can't remember. The guy who actually stalked me tried to pin it all on his buddy, so his buddy ended up going away for five years and is still in prison. While my stalker served three of his four-year sentence, he threw his buddy under the bus and took a plea deal for himself and later got out on good behavior. I got a restraining order, which he violated a couple of times right away. It had been quiet for a bit until he got a girlfriend a couple of years ago. He told her his version in which he was the victim and I was the villain who sent him to jail for nothing. She sent me this long nasty message telling me she'd find me and make me pay for it. So predictably, the cops got to go talk to both of them, but thankfully, I haven't heard from either since. For some reason, a few hours leading up to this event, I was feeling uneasy and on edge. This was three hours prior, and I even consciously thought it was weird because I had a buddy over who was playing my favorite video game. 
I just couldn't enjoy myself. Unusually, my father was also up very late watching TV in the lounge, and he too later commented he felt like he was being watched. Approximately an hour after he turned into bed, everything happened all at once. We believe at least three men tried to quietly pull a window out of our double doors to get in, but they dropped the pane and when it shattered, everyone was alerted. Shouting, barking, and screaming commenced and they tried to break the door down and get in, grab anything convenient. Unfortunately for them, we had a large bird cage blocking the door on the inside and they couldn't get in. They decided to make their getaway and while doing so, one of them threw a brick at the window my father was looking through and broke that pane as well. While this is all going down, my buddy and I stayed inside my room, door shut and locked. I grabbed a nearby skateboard, the only thing I had that could be weaponized. It felt like everything was happening very slowly, especially because I could hear but not see what was going on. For reference, we have a freestanding house that at the time had an empty plot next door. We think they jumped over the concrete wall as there's a palisade fencing in front of our house. Once the brick came through the window, all hell broke loose. My father interpreted this as an act of frustration because we caught them coming in. He took to screaming profanities at the shattered window while getting himself together. Light coat, shoes, belt, everything he might need to give chase to the neighborhood. The last thing that he grabbed was a taser and a flashlight from the drawer in the kitchen. I'll never forget his voice as he shouted through the house for us to call the police and slam the front door behind him. The rest of the family started to come out of wherever we were all hiding. Me and my friend, my mom and sister, even the dog came together. My mom dialed the police while the rest of us started cleaning up the glass and finding a piece of cardboard to tape over the window. Anything to provide some kind of security through the night, even if it was just tape. As we're sweeping and talking, I can hear my mother's voice taper off into the silence. It sounded strange to me, but I decided to poke my head into the kitchen and see what was up. I assumed she was getting special instructions or information from the dispatcher. That's why she wasn't talking. What I find instead is my mother standing on one side of the kitchen and a man in a black mask standing on the other side. He's holding a large knife out before him. His other palm is open and face up beside it. The gesture says, give me everything valuable and do it rather quickly. I'm not exactly sure if this was part of their plan, but after they broke the window, and saw my father was going to chase them. One of them circled back and snuck in. This guy wasn't going through all this trouble without a payout. My mother was slowly unclasping her necklace when I looked in. My first reaction was to go to war with this guy, but I looked down at the flimsy broom in my hand and knew I was outgunned. He was much older than me, larger than me. Even with my mom, we probably didn't stand a chance. She slid her necklace across the counter and waited. He pocketed the necklace but doesn't leave. He's looking us both up and down, scanning the kitchen for anything else shiny or made of money. My mom is careful to hide her hand so he doesn't see her wedding ring. And that's when I notice the phone still sitting on the counter. I can hear the tiny faraway voice of the dispatcher asking if she was still there. I picked up the phone and said yes, we're still here. The men have returned to our house. I say this into the receiver just as I make eye contact with the guy across the kitchen. I could see that he was in shock, the sheer disbelief unfolding in his eyes. He was panicking, must not have thought we had any courage to make any kind of stand. The dispatcher told us to get as far away as possible and help was on the way. By now, my friend and my sister have realized that something weird is still going on. They step into the kitchen from the living room and discover the situation. Even though we're all young and unarmed, half of us women, there's a sense of power now that all four of us stood together. All of the confidence the burglar had drained out. He took slow, unsure steps back toward the exit. Across the villa, we could hear the first chirps of a siren. Help really was on the way, and this emboldened us even further. Who was this man to enter our home and demand our valuables? Like my father at the window, I was suddenly overcome with personal rage that needed to be expressed accordingly. Without any thought, I lifted the broom over my head and charged at the man. I cracked him over the head a few times before he tried to get away. By then, my mom and sister were both shouting and throwing plates, which were also hitting him all over. He managed to get out of the house, 
only to encounter my father in the front yard. He just returned from chasing the rest of the robbers up and down the lane, tasing them when they were in reach. The majority of the crew was arrested that night. My mother reunited with her necklace. I've never had any braver moment to this day. If only I'd had that skateboard instead of that broom. I lived with a couple of friends when I was younger. We rented a property on the edge of town where the hustle and bustle wasn't as crazy. There's still traffic and commerce, but nothing like you'd seen in the heart of town. It had its pros and its cons. One of those cons was the weird foot traffic that you could encounter. Because we lived on what was considered the outskirts, lots of strange people could usually be seen walking around. If a new hobo was coming to town or one of the old ones was leaving, They'd wander through the neighborhoods like mine on the way through. Because our area wasn't as busy, these folks just really stuck out. One day we were relaxing at home. We noticed a man stroll by our house a number of times. We didn't think anything of it at first, but then my roommate's sister pointed out he'd walk by four or five times and was always staring at the house while he did so. We found that strange, so we kept an eye on him. But after that, we really didn't see him again. As the day went on, it got a little warmer. Being cheap kids without a whole lot of disposable income, we elected to open up the doors and windows rather than turn on the AC. It was a nice day, not a cloud in sight, so getting all that fresh air throughout the house sounded like a good idea to all of us. The house had a front and a back door, regular box windows along the side. The front of the house, though, was adorned with these three massive windows that exposed all of the front rooms. They allowed tons of natural light and airflow when they were open, but obviously were a bit of a security issue at night. People could see into the house from the street if the blinds weren't closed. We'd never really had any problems, but it was definitely something that we noticed after coming home late a few times. Well, that weirdo that had been walking up and down the street earlier took our open doors and windows as a personal invitation. It was the middle of the day. I was in my bedroom getting some work done. My roommate and his sister were chilling in the living room. We'll call them Ben and Candy. They said they watched as this guy peeled off the street and walked right up to the first big window. He cupped his hands and looked through, then moved to the second window and did the same until he saw them sitting there. He then gave the creepiest smile of all time, a small wave, and then proceeded to enter the house. So he knew clear as day someone was home. He'd even walked the property multiple times at all the indicators of someone casing the place. My roommate just assumed he needed help at first, but after that creepy smile, he knew something was off. He assumed it was a mental illness or some kind of psychosis. Ben confronts the guy at the door, tells him that he needs to leave right now. As the conversation goes on, Ben quickly figures out that this guy isn't confused and isn't having a mental crisis of any kind. He deliberately approached the house and entered. Now the conversation turns eerie as the stranger in the door starts talking crazy. Ben heard the gibberish and just made a snap decision. This guy was already in the house and teetering on dangerous. He has no intent on leaving. It was now just talking about robbing and hurting people, making threats essentially. Ben shouted two things. He called for me to come out from the back and then called for his sister to get his gun from the bedroom. Before the guy can make a move, Ben springs into a full-on sprint and tackles this guy into the doorframe, so hard that it cracked the wood. Hearing all this crazy commotion, as well as the yelling, I exit my room just in time to see the stranger give Ben a couple of serious blows to the back of the head. This guy's elbow is cracking my roommate in the jaw and the neck, and that's all I needed to see to jump into action. After I get involved, Ben and I manage to wrestle the guy to the floor and pin him there. Candy emerges from the back room carrying a big black 45 and then passes it to Ben. The guy sees the gun and immediately calms down, says we can talk about it. It's crazy just how much a weapon can change a situation. Ben nods and racks around and presses the barrel to the guy's neck and tells him to stop moving. The stranger complies. Both Ben and I back off and disentangle ourselves from the fray. We back up 10 or 12 feet spread out just in case we have to rush him again. Andy grabbed the phone and had dialed 911. He's now putting a report in to dispatch. The stranger does not like what he's hearing. 
goes back to crazy talk, saying things like, I thought we were going to talk this out. Why are you calling the cops? He goes ballistic again, but Ben isn't entertaining any of it. He's clearly pointing a gun at this guy's chest and telling him not to move. It doesn't matter. This guy is already committing to freaking out, starts going mental, pushing furniture over, throwing stuff at Ben. Just as the guy is pacing back and forth, flexing, yelling, he suddenly turns to Ben with this crazy look, reaches into his pocket, and starts to charge. Ben doesn't hesitate, simply pulls the trigger until it clicks, sending every round sailing into this guy's torso. I froze out of fear and pure shock. I knew Ben had just killed this guy. Fortunately, the police arrive and immediately clear the situation. Ben is stripped of his gun and given a medical check, then placed in the back of a squad car. Candy and I are questioned, but ultimately allowed to remain in the house. We start the process of crime scene cleanup and removal, and went to our family's homes until all of that was done. Shooting was ruled self-defense, and roommate got cleared. It was a long, tedious process, as it should be, and he never got his gun back. There were times I thought he was going to be locked up forever, but the system ultimately did its job for once. The fact that there were so many witnesses to corroborate everything really helped him out. I believe the guy was found to be heavily under the influence, but I'm not sure of what. If I had to guess, I would say meth or PCP, based on what I've read and the way he was acting. His eyes were just crazy, and that back and forth aggression was just beyond unpredictable. Since he's dead, I guess no one will ever really know what his issue was. My roommate ended up struggling heavily with PTSD from this event as well as follow-on events that happened inside the military. This was a couple of weeks before my 19th birthday. I woke up one morning, around 4 a.m., while someone was trying to break down my bedroom door. I'd fallen asleep with my light on after coming in tired from work. When they came to my room, I could at least see what was happening. Not that it helped much at first. There were two guys, and one of them immediately attacked me with a hammer. I just told them to take whatever they wanted. The other guy started to load all my electronics into a backpack. My family lived inside a poor neighborhood, so crime like this wasn't exactly uncommon. Still, this had never happened directly to us. We're a kind, honest family. No history of crime or anything like that. We'd lock our doors at night, that type of thing. Still, anyone can be targeted, as this story is evidence of. I think this gang of thieves targeted us because of my weird, late hours of work. I'd come home sometimes in the middle of the night, the only person wandering down my street. I'm sure they built a loose schedule of my day and planned the robbery appropriately. Meanwhile, my mother down the hall had woken up with a commotion, started shouting to know what was going on. Thank God that she did this from the safety of her own bedroom. The next moment, though, they both ran out of my room and shut the door on the way out. They were now headed for my mother's room. She managed to hold the door closed on them for a few seconds, giving me time to open up the safe in my cupboard. It required a six-digit key code, but somehow I managed to input correctly. Despite my shaking fingers, inside laid a 380 handgun, an heirloom from my grandpa. I checked for a round in the chamber and went to open up the door and make my way to my mother's room. A 380 isn't exactly ideal for personal defense situations, but these guys were clearly poor too and definitely didn't have a gun. I figured the second I brandished it, they'd be on the run, and if I pulled the trigger, they'd surrender for sure. Boy, was I wrong. I opened up the door and one of the guys turned around and ran at me with a hammer. I fired two shots before he could get to me and pushed me back into my room. He wrestled me on my bed, where he tried to take my pistol. Meanwhile, the other guy started to cut my arm and head with what turned out to be one of my mother's own kitchen knives. My mother eventually joined the fray and managed to take the knife away from the guy cutting me. I was just holding onto the pistol with everything I had into me, because I knew that if one of them got control of the firearm, my mother and I would be dead. It's just a crazy feeling, not being able to protect my head and face from an actual blade. Just watching this shiny steel dip into my flesh, coming away covered in more and more blood. My mother froze after she took the knife away, and the guy got up. He sprang to his feet, 
grab my DVD player, and knock my TV to the ground. I didn't know what he was doing until he bashed me in the head with it. By this time, I managed to sort of wrestle my gun hand free and shouted to my mother to get out of the way, for me to try to get off another shot. She rolled off the bed. I managed to turn the gun enough to get a shot off into the guy on top of me. It was then that they decided to finally bolt and grab my bag of electronics on the way out. When the cops came, they found a body with two gunshot wounds in my garden just a few meters away from the house and a blood trail leading away to where it disappeared onto a nearby road. The second guy was never caught and I was cleared of any wrongdoing despite killing one of them. I even got to keep my gun as the laws here in my country differ from most of the others. The entire situation was surreal. The amount of blood in my bedroom was perhaps the most unbelievable though. Between the knife and the hammer and the gun, myself and those two perps must have lost several quarts. When I fired that last round into the guy on top of me, the amount of gore that poured out of him sent me into shock. It was like I turned a faucet on that was tapped into his insides. I will say this though, movies, TV, they really don't get gunfights accurate. I thought those guys would run the second they saw my gun. Instead, they attacked me without any hesitation. I even shot the first attacker, and he still managed to push me back into my bedroom and onto my head, despite having a bullet wound. His adrenaline must have actually made him stronger than me. What I learned from this whole ordeal is that you can never be too safe, especially if you have a family to protect. Back in 1997, a man named Osil Gillian took control of Mexico's Gulf Cartel following the arrest of the organization's leader. The powerful vacuum left behind by his predecessor's capture sparked a violent turf war in which rival cartels faced off against each other as the Mexican military tried in vain to keep the peace. As the conflict raged on, the Gulf Cartel began to suffer heavy losses to both men and material and for a while, they were dangerously close to being overwhelmed and annihilated. But luckily, Asiel had an ace up his sleeve, and that ace was named Arturo Guzman de Sina. De Sina was born into a poor working class family in the Mexican city of Puebla on January 13th of 1976. Like many of his peers, de Sina realized that his best chance at escaping economic hardship was to join the military. So on his 16th birthday, he volunteered to join the Mexican army. The Sina proved to be a talented soldier. So talented, in fact, that he was chosen to undergo selection for an elite group of airborne special forces, known as the GAF for short. After joining the unit, the Sina received training in both the counterinsurgency tactics and the interdiction of narco traffickers. He first saw action during the 1994 Chiapas Uprising in which more than 30 rebels were either killed or captured by DeSena's squadron. His unit received praise for the decisive victory over the rebels, but, but some noticed an exceedingly chilling detail in regarding the condition of the slain insurrectionists. Once they'd been killed, the shooting died down. DeSena and his men had apparently gathered up the bodies of the dead rebels and set about dissecting and mutilating their corpses. To his commanders, the desecration of the rebel bodies was something they could overlook due to the overall success of the operation. Yet, the Sina felt hideously underappreciated. Mexican special forces are paid slightly more than their regular army counterparts, but the amount still pales in comparison to what the Sina believed he was worth. He became more and more bitter, watching his superiors rake in millions of pesos in bribe money, while he and his comrades lived off crumbs. Then one day, Desina received a home visit from two mysteriously well-dressed men. He was reportedly given 100,000 pesos, along with a piece of paper with the phone number written on it, and was told, if you're willing to work, there's plenty more where that came from. Less than 24 hours later, Desina was setting up a secret meeting with his potential new employer, and when they met, he realized how they had all the money to burn. He was being sought out, to head up the Gulf Cartel's brand new military wing, one that would defend them from the incursions of both rival gangs and the Mexican authorities. 
At first, the Cena approached only his closest comrades in the gaff and put forward a very simple proposition. Join his new unit, enjoy bountiful compensation, and continue hunting narco-traffickers. The only catch was, they'd be doing so on behalf of the golf cartel. By that point, the Cena's former comrades were so jaded that working for the cartels seemed no different than working for the government. Both were morally bankrupt, but only one had the money to pay them what they actually deserved. It's also believed that since a huge political shift was occurring around this time, many Mexican Special Forces soldiers believe that they'd be held accountable for crimes that they committed during the cheapest uprising. And so, rather than risk having their service rewarded with prison time, they jumped ship and joined De Sina in his brand new unit. Within just a few months, De Sina had put together a group of 13 exceptionally well-trained and viciously ferocious killers all of whom had served with him in the gaff. They organized themselves in the exact same manner as their formal special forces unit, allowing for the lightning fast deployment of small but highly mobile teams of lightly armed but heavily motivated personnel. The Sina also employed the same military communication style as that was employed in the gaff, with members of the unit being referred to by only their call signs. In Mexico, the radio code for lower level federals was Y or Yankee, meaning individual officers would be referred to as Yankee 1 or Yankee 2, etc. But the higher ranking officers, those in charge of an entire city or county, would be referred to by the code Z or Zeta. Seeing as he was the leader of this new paramilitary unit, the Sina was given the call sign Zeta 1, while second in command was referred to as Zeta 2. Soon, every member of the unit had a Zeta call sign, which in turn gave rise to the names they're known by today. Los Zetas. At first, the Zetas focused exclusively on helping Asiel consolidate his position as head of the Gulf Cartel, and they did so with surgical efficiency. They castrated his rivals, skinned his enemies alive, struck fear into the hearts of all who might challenge the cartel's dominance. As their victories mounted, so did their membership, as dozens of corrupt police officers and disgruntled special forces soldiers, and even had a handful of former U.S. Army personnel sought to join their ranks. Yet the Zetas didn't allow just anyone into their organization. Applicants were required to possess a certain level of fitness and weapons training. And of those who didn't impress the original 13 Zetas, they were subjected to extreme physiological torture to determine if they really had what it takes. Those who passed were welcomed into a brotherhood told they were mentally and physically superior to other men, and that wealth and prominence were theirs to be won by bloodshed. Over the decade that followed, and despite dozens of their numbers being arrested or killed, the Las Etas grew more and more powerful. By the year 2010, they both outnumbered and outclassed their parent organization, and after fearing that their pet monster had become way too big to control, the cartel decided the Zetas needed a reminder of who was actually in charge. The situation came to a head when Cartel Lieutenant Samuel Borrego was shot by a Zeta member after an argument over a drug trafficking corridor. The cartel demanded that the Zetas hand over the man's killer. Their response was to declare war. The Gulf Cartel were almost completely unprepared for what followed. After several of their top figures were assassinated by a crack team of Zeta operators, the cartel deployed hundreds of their foot soldiers to the border towns northern of Tamaulipas. The vehicles they drove were marked with acronyms and insignias such as CDG, Triple X, or M3, all of which denoted them as belonging to the Gulf Cartel, and they were armed to the teeth. But no matter how many gun trucks or machine pistol toting Sicarios they possessed, the cartel were in no position to weather the coming storm. Initially, the cartel deployed so many armed men to the streets of Reynosa that they believed the Zetas were afraid to face them. Daylight came and went. Not a shot was fired in anger. But as soon as the sun set, the Zetas began their offensive. Using the cloak of darkness to negate the tactical advantages afforded by the cartel's heavy machine guns, the Zeta operators used night vision goggles, silenced machine guns, to wreak havoc among the cartel's ranks. They sprang from the shadows at close quarters, executed well-hearsed room clearance drills, and by dawn, 
the city was awash with cartel blood. Following the capture of Reynosa, the city of Nuevo Laredo fell, and the border town of Matamoros, in turn. Entire cities were paralyzed by the violence, but in the end, the Zetas emerged victorious. By the summer of 2010, they controlled over 200 miles of the US-Mexican border, all of which was crucial to the illegal narcotics trade. In desperation, the Gulf Cartel turned to their old rivals, the Sinaloa, and begged for their assistance. The cartel then split into two distinct groups, those of who wished to make peace with the Zetas for their own sake and their own survival, and those who wished to wipe them out. Many of those in the former group ended up joining with the Zetas, while those in the latter became a little more vassal for the Sinaloa and the Michelin cartels, who formed an alliance due to their mutual fear of the Zetas. Nowadays, the Gulf Cartel still technically exists, but it's never fully recovered following its not-so-civil conflict with the group it had a hand in creating. The capture of the northern Tamaulipas border corridor marked the end of the Zetas' first major battle with the Gulf Cartel, but the war was not yet over. What remained of the cartel had retreated south to lick their wounds, and the Zetas had yet to properly stamp their authority on the twin states of Tamaulipas and Nueve León in order to assert complete control over the region's illegal activities. The Zeta's leadership decreed that all criminal enterprises owed them taxes, payable in either cash, material, or labor. Many of these groups complied with the order, but not all were so quick to pay tribute to their new overlord. Given its proximity to the Texan border, the state of Tamaulipas is home to dozens of criminal organizations who traffic in both narcotics and people. Many of these groups pledged fealty to Los Zetas and began handing over exorbitant sums in taxes. But others seemed to view the Zetas as beneath them and began to adopt identical tactics in an attempt to protect their own. In the city of San Fernando, gunmen aligned with the Gulf Cartel ambushed a group of Los Zetas operators, then strung their mutilated bodies from the streetlights. The Zetas response was nothing short of barbaric. On the night of August 22, 2010, a convoy of 73 Central American migrants were passing through the Tamaulipas on their way to the United States border. When they reached the outskirts of San Fernando, they found a group of Zetas. They'd set up a roadblock, and after hijacking the migrants' vehicle at gunpoint, they then drove them out to a secluded ranch somewhere nearby. There, the migrants were forced out of their vehicles, marched into a warehouse, and told to kneel against a wall. One by one, they were shot execution style in the back of the head. Only one of the 72 migrants survived that execution, when the bullet that was meant to kill him somehow passed through his jowl without severing any major blood vessels. This survivor then walked nearly 14 miles until he reached a checkpoint manned by Mexican Marines. At first, the authorities had their doubts regarding the survivor's story, but after a group of Marines were dispatched to the ranch, they confirmed that the story was in fact true. Authorities then asked that survivor to give them a complete account of his brief time in captivity, and this is what he told them. The 18-year-old Ecuadorian who called himself Luis had traveled from his home country of Honduras and had joined the migrant convoy. Once he reached Tamaulipas, Following their sudden kidnap, he and his fellow migrants were held overnight in what appeared to be an abandoned rural house, prior to being transported to the ranch in the morning. Then, once they'd been forced inside that warehouse, each migrant was bound and blindfolded before shoved up against the wall. Lewis said a voice started calling out to them, telling them to lie down, be quiet, and not to scream. That's when the shooting started. Once everyone was dead, Lewis said he took off out of the warehouse, then walked all night until he saw this small light in the distance. There, on the outskirts of a small town, he found the roadblock manned by the Marines. When news of the massacre hit the headlines across Mexico, President Felipe Calderon sent his most profound condolences, the families of those affected, and said the murderers were the result of the war between the Zetas and the Gulf Cartel. 
Some speculated that the migrants were targeted because their traffickers were being financed by the Gulf Cartel, and killing them was the Zetas' way of choking off the cartel's profits. Whereas others have suggested that the first San Fernando massacre was merely a dry run for the horrors that would follow. Mexican Federal Highway 101 is the largest and most important transportation system in the state of Tamaulipas. It extends from the border city of Matamoros to the state capital of Ciudad Victoria. And around March of 2011, the locals began referring to it as the El Camino de la Muerte, or the Road of Death. Those who traveled along this highway between 2010 and 2011 used to see burned out vehicles, shot up trucks on the side of the road, dead bodies, often decapitated, that the cartels would leave behind. Others witnessed the Gulf Cartel's checkpoints installed from Padilla to San Fernando, in which served as an early warning system for many Los Zetas incursions to this area. Cadres of Los Zetas gunmen would sometimes drive into the area, mostly at night to terrorize just about anyone that they come across. They would rob people, kill people, violate the women. Then at one point, Los Zetas started stealing entire busloads of innocent people. One driver claimed that after a masked gunman forced him to stop, 12 of his passengers were pulled off, then forced into a separate vehicle at gunpoint. One witness stated that the gunman would point at certain passengers, all of whom happened to be young men, and say, you, you're coming with us. Once the Zetas had taken their prisoners, the bus was then ordered to leave. This horrifying variety of wholesale, seemingly random kidnapping, happened time and time again throughout the entire March of 2011. The families of those that had been taken begged local authorities to act. Almost everyone was aware Los Zetas were the ones to blame. But not only did authorities have no idea why the Zetas were dragging young men off of buses, they had no idea where they were taking them either. Yet a few weeks later, all of those questions were answered, and the conclusions were nothing short of horrifying. On April 6th of 2011, local authorities were informed that a mass grave had been discovered, just outside the city of San Fernando. A total of 59 sets of human remains were recovered over the days that followed, many of which belonged to those who'd been snatched off of buses in those weeks prior. Two days later, the Secretary General of Tamaulipas announced the discovery of 13 more bodies, bringing the total body count to 72. But unlike the first San Fernando massacre, which had targeted Central American migrants, the bodies recovered from the mass graves all belonged to Mexican citizens. On April 10th, four additional mass graves were uncovered. Then two days after that, another set of graves were found. This process repeated itself until June 7th of 2011, when a final death toll of 193 was announced. The discovery of so many corpses sent shockwaves throughout Mexican society, and entire news cycles were dedicated to the investigation. But when the truth behind the second San Fernando massacre emerged, it horrified even the most cynical of investigators. On June 11th of 2011, a reporter from the Houston Chronicle named Dane Schiller shared details of an interview that he'd conducted with a supposed Zeta associate. He claimed to know where the kidnapped were being taken, but the truth was, it wasn't Los Zetas that were killing him. They were killing each other. Some said it was Zeta's novel method of recruitment. Others said it was nothing but a sick form of entertainment to the psychopathic cartel members. But after being dragged from their buses and transported to an unknown location, the kidnapped victims were forced into mortal combat with one another. They called it Mexico's next top hitman. The anonymous associate claimed, they give them knives, hammers, machetes, all kinds of things. Then they make them cut each other to pieces. I earn way more money with the Zetas, but I know the kind of evil crap they do. They like to brag about it. The Zetas associate also claimed that on one occasion, one of the unwilling victors to the forced gladrial combat completely lost his mind. The young man became completely detached from reality, didn't seem to believe what was happening was real. The Zetas told him he was dreaming, and in order to wake up, he had to do exactly as they told him. The Zetas then drove the young man towards San Fernando, 
put a gun in his hand, then pointed him in the direction of the golf cartel checkpoint. The young man walked forward, raised the pistol, and was immediately gunned down by the waiting Sicarios. Another cartel associate, who was arrested in Texas around that same period, claimed the gladiator fights had been arranged on the order of a high-ranking Zeta lieutenant named Miguel Morales. Yet, he also claimed that not all the participants were unwilling. The Zetas had instituted a policy of forced conscription around San Fernando as means of weaponizing the Gulf's own support base against them. But they also accepted many volunteers into the ranks during that time. This meant, for all intent and purpose, a terrified kidnap victim could be forced to fight a highly motivated, highly psychopathic individual who wanted to prove their value to some of the most monstrous men in Mexico. In the aftermath, several Los Zetas lieutenants were apprehended by the police, including the mastermind of the original San Fernando massacre. The Mexican attorney general offered a reward of 15 million US dollars for information leading to the capture of those responsible. And the information that flooded led to the arrest of 82 people thought to be directly and indirectly involved. 16 of those arrested were municipal police officers in San Fernando, and according to investigations, the officers protected Los Zetas and helped them cover up the killings. The fallout proved to be a massive hit to both the Zeta structure and their strategic capabilities, but wounded animals often proved to be the most dangerous. The Grupo Royale company runs the chains of casinos and entertainment venues in Monterey and Los Cabos. During the late summer of 2011, a group of armed Los Zetos men marched into the company's Monterey Casino and demanded a percentage of the monthly profits. The manager advised, if they wanted a share of the protection money that the casino paid, they should speak to the cartel. But the Zetas preferred action over dialogue. Just before 2 p.m. on August 25th of 2011, 12 Zeta operatives met for lunch at a restaurant just a few blocks away from Monterey Casino. About an hour later, the Zetas operatives were spotted at a gas station in the neighborhood of Valley Verde, filling jerry cans with gasoline. The station clerk said they drove off without paying, but was too frightened to call the police. 50 minutes later, a convoy of four vehicles pulled into the parking lot of the Monterey Casino. The nine heavily armed Zeta operatives stormed in its front entrance. In the aftermath, some survivors claimed that they're forcing their way into the casino. The Zetas did not target any of its occupants. Instead, fired their weapons into the air in order to gain everyone's attention. The operatives then ordered everyone out of the casino before dousing the place with gasoline and setting it ablaze. However, not all of the casino visitors understood what was going on. Upon hearing the gunmen announce themselves as representatives of Los Zetas, a huge proportion of the casino occupants assumed a massacre was about to take place. They didn't wait around to hear what the gunmen had to say. They simply ran off to find emergency exits and suitable hiding places. It's believed around 150 people attempted to hide themselves throughout the casino complex. But when they realized the Zetas had merely set the place on fire before withdrawing, panic surged and the people stampeded. Around a hundred of them made it out alive, but as the Monterey Fire Department doused the flames and began attempting to rescue those trapped inside, they discovered 52 asphyxiated corpses were strewn around the building. Following a brief investigation, the firefighters announced that the casino emergency exits had been locked at the time of the raid, suggesting not only inside involvement, but also that the Zetas did indeed intend to inflict civilian casualties. In the span of just 190 seconds, the Zetas had inflicted a major blow to the Gulf Cartel's funding, as well as dooming 52 innocent people to death. Although the war between Los Zetas and the Gulf Cartel had been waging for months, the Monterey Casino attack was the first time the conflict drew the attention of international media. US President Barack Obama called the attack brutal and reprehensible, while Secretary General Ba Ki Moon called it a deplorable act of violence. Global human rights charity Amnesty International demanded a detailed investigation of the incident and declared their solidarity with the families of the victims. 
The situation in Tamaulipas had become a source of immense embarrassment for the Mexican government, both internationally and domestically. So to reestablish trust between the states and the people that they were bound to serve, the president ordered a surge in regional counter-narcotics operations. In May of 2011, a battalion-sized task force of around 650 men, comprised mostly of Mexican Marines and Special Forces, was sent to Tamaulipas to combat the drug cartels. The task force was supported by police, military reservists, and civilian volunteers, and focused not only on physically combating Zetas and cartel gunmen, but also winning the hearts and minds of local civilians by providing them with health care, reconstruction services, and even free haircuts. Yet the only thing holding the project back was the one institution's job it was to advance their cause. Police corruption in Tamaulipas was so endemic that in November of 2011, the municipal government essentially suspended the entire force and allowed the Mexican Marine Corps to step in and enforce the law. Only then could the cleanup operation in Tamaulipas really gain any traction, but once it did, the Zeta's downfall was inevitable. By the beginning of 2012, the Los Zetas were no longer the same elite fighting force that had gone to war with the Gulf Cartel two years earlier. The quality of their leadership, manpower, and equipment had been seriously degraded, not only by the resistance of the cartels and their allies, but also by the continual operations of the Mexican Marines. Throughout 2012, Marines constructed four additional operational bases in the state of Tamaulipas and they brought the hammer down on Los Zetas wherever they found them. On October 9th, the Mexican Navy confirmed that the Zeta Supreme Leader had been killed in a firefight with Mexican Marines near the Texan border. Las Cano, who had been the call sign Zeta 3, meaning he was one of the group's founding members, his death was a huge blow to the organization's morale, as well as its effectiveness. The following year, a number of the other Zeta lieutenants were apprehended or killed, and several of their armories were captured by the Marines. By the end of 2014, international crisis group researcher Daniel Herring stated that Los Zetas were on their way out. The old networks have been disrupted, and the Zetas have been splintered, Herring said. They are now a series of smaller factions, with the primary competitors for power being the Hell Squadron the old school Zetas, and the Cartel del Norte. The rise of the Zetas may have been followed by their abrupt downfall, but their influence on the Mexican narco culture has been indelible. Back in the 90s, the cartels hadn't stooped for the kind of savagery they engage in today. Instead, they used what could be referred to as codes of murder. For example, a bullet through the back of the head marked a dead man as a traitor while a bullet through the temple made it clear they'd been executed by a rival gang or cartel. Many believe the first incident of cartel barbarism occurred in September of 2006, when Sicarios of La Familia Michoacana threw severed heads onto the dance floor of a Michoacan nightclub. But in reality, this incident was merely the first to receive international attention, and the practice of beheading one's enemy was introduced many years earlier. As we've already discussed, the Zetas spent their first few years recruiting only former and serving Special Forces operators. But recruitment was not only confined to those of Mexican birth. Los Zetas extended their reach into Guatemala inside the late 90s. They found rich pickings among a group known as the Cabeles. The Cabeles are Guatemala's equivalent of the Green Berets. They specialize in counterinsurgency operations and jungle warfare tactics and endure training which pushes recruits to mental and physical extremes. Those who earn the right to sleep are permitted to do so for only three hours, and before recruits are permitted to eat, they must run two miles in 18 minutes or less while wearing full combat gear. Recruits are then given exactly 30 seconds to eat before their food trays are taken away from them. During the final stages of training, recruits are flown deep into the jungle in the middle of the night forced out of the helicopter wearing nothing but their underwear, and given 24 hours to find their way back to base. Those who fail are forced to repeat the exercise over and over again until they either succeed or quit. 
But the Cabelis aren't just famous for their rigorous style of training. They're also famous for near limitless cruelty. Although the practice has since been banned among its recruits, its old ritual of the Cabelis was to give their recruits a chicken to take care of throughout their entire eight week training course. These chickens were kept in a coop not far from the recruits barracks who were in charge with feeding them, cleaning their coop, and most importantly, naming them. Towards the end of their training, the recruits were told to go out to the coop and collect their beloved chickens for inspection. Then one by one, the recruits were told to take tight hold of their feathered friends and bite their heads off. The chickens are then fed to the recruits as their first fresh meat in almost two months. As you can imagine, this kind of training breeds soldiers capable of unspeakable acts of cold-blooded savagery. But that's exactly what their recruiters were looking for. The Guatemalan Cabeles brought many of their traditions to the Zetas, but one of them was ritual beheading. Having their teeth cut during the Guatemalan Civil War, the Cabeles struck fear into the hearts of their enemies by displaying the decapitated heads of those they'd killed on operations. However, these heads wouldn't be displayed as trophies back at their bases. They'd be strewn over some prominent landmark in their enemy's heartland as a warning. Being in the business of brutal intimidation, the Zetas adopted the Cabeles tactics, and from the early 2000s onward, grisly executions such as beheadings, flaying, became even more commonplace. Every other cartel in Mexico was forced to adopt similar tactics in order to keep up with the Zetas' meteoric rise to power such as the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, who in September of 2011, dumped over 30 bodies into a busy avenue on the state of Veracruz. What we're seeing in Mexico is a process of paramilitarism, in which different groups seek to wipe out their rivals, said Mexican organized crime expert Edgardo Basquilla, shortly after the Veracruz bodies were discovered. But without a shadow of a doubt, the organization which started this process of militarization was Los Zetas. The story of Los Zetas comes down to, in the course of a decade, 13 disgruntled Special Forces soldiers rose to become the second most powerful narcotics traffickers in North America. They applied their elite, martial mentality to the most lucrative black market on the face of the earth, and in doing so, made the world a considerably more frightening place. Yet the original 13 Zetas didn't just become multimillionaires by killing hundreds, if not thousands of innocent people. They've made an indelible mark on the contemporary culture. From the beheading of Danny Trejo's character in Breaking Bad, to the fully militarized cartel enemies in the latest Call of Duty games, the Zetas have made their mark on society and changed the geopolitical landscape of the United States border territories forever. In the mid-1990s, I was a young college student somewhere in the Midwest. It was my first year attending, and I fell in love with the idea of the whole college experience. I leaned into any kind of stereotype that I could think of. I tried to date a lot, went to as many parties as I could, always said yes to drugs and alcohol. I was searching for that quintessential university experience. I wasn't attending a university, but it was a mid-sized community college that had a large student body. I lived a couple of towns over in a smaller, more rural community. Because of the distance, I had no interest in making a daily commute. This led me to the logical conclusion to pay for a dorm my first semester, like many freshman students, and really get my college legs underneath me, so to speak. Moving into the dorms was my first time moving anywhere, so it was kind of like being on my own or having my own apartment or something. It was exciting and new to me, and as I explained earlier, I was leaning into my college experience hard. That being said, I was a closed-cased homebody. I didn't have a lot of friends. My high school experience hadn't really set me up for the college encounters that I was wanting to have. There was nothing to be done about it. No quick correction to make me popular or anything. Hence why I was a yes man, and just tried to show up for as many parties and events as I could. College was cool, and so was the dorm, 
It was a 70s style brick building, really blocky with three floors and long, narrow hallways. I don't remember how many rooms or students that fit in the building, but I would guess somewhere in the ballpark of 60 residents. We lived in Whitney Commons. That was the name of the dormitory. I believe Whitney was the last name of a prior professor or maybe even one of the investors, some big wig in college history. To me at the time, Whitney Commons sounded like a Belvedere Apartments or some kind of fancy complex name. Most of these rooms were identical, outfitted to sleep two students with room for study and relaxation. I'd say the rooms were 10 by 15, maybe a little bigger, just enough for two single beds that stood tall as they fit a sliding desk beneath them, a closet, a chest for storage, and a sink in the corner, and a small separator to change clothes behind. Some of the other rooms were a little bigger and set up to sleep three. Each level had a shared bathroom with showers and all that. I got a corner unit in the far side of the first floor. To me, it was perfect, easy to find, no stairs to move in, and I got a rolling view of the campus because I was one of the few rooms that actually had two windows. It was nowhere near as cool as I'm making it out to be, but it was my first experience away from home, and I loved it. The guy I was rooming with seemed cool, also lived in a rural township, decided staying on campus would save him a lot of time as well. I only spoke to him two or three times before he withdrew from all of his classes and ended up moving back home. I don't even think he made it through the first week of classes. For whatever reason, he went home, and no one else enrolling in school chose to stay on the campus the rest of that semester. Somehow I lucked out and became the only guy to not have to share a dorm room. This made me somewhat popular with other people in the building because my unit was considered a potential party unit. This never really came to fruition though. School was trickling by, and like everyone else, I became buried under classwork. What little time I had left at the end of the day, I spent relaxing or wandering around campus or exploring other buildings. I find that when you lived on campus, sometimes buildings wouldn't be locked. We kind of had full 24 hour access to most of the school property. One day, I heard something that would capture my interest for months. I was sitting in my dorm, studying, and I heard the voice of a woman, a high pitched, playful, unmistakable. Because I didn't have a roommate, I typically left my door wide open so I could hear banter with anyone walking by. It was like an open invitation for people to bug me, although not many ever did. The Whitney building was entirely male, as most dorms are. The female dorms were newer buildings, nestled together across campus, closer to the academic buildings. Whitney was a bit of an outlying building, literally on the edge of the campus. It was so isolated by three massive parking lots. The closest building was the gymnasium dome, which had a big parking lot to isolate it and really didn't get used a whole lot, besides for the weightlifting classes. Since we were a mid-sized community college, we weren't really known for our sports teams. What I'm getting at here is our dorm building didn't get a lot of visitors. We were used to seeing the same people, the same cars in our parking lot. If the maintenance man paid us a visit, we would all know about it in a second. The heavier footfalls, the different voice. We all grew accustomed to our neighbors and what to expect. So when I heard this female voice in the afternoon, I didn't really know what to make of it. You probably don't really need me to tell you what I did next. I listened, leaned back at my desk, homework scattered in front of me. I let it all go and embraced this new distraction. Whoever she was, she was hanging with one of the guys in the room right next to mine. I didn't know either of the guys that stayed there. I'd seen them with a textbook and only ran into them certain hours on certain areas of campus. From this, I gleaned that he was on a vocational program like welding or something like that. Whatever the case, Welderman had scored a lady to bring home. This was the first semester, so it was the first interaction like this to happen in our dorm, at least to my knowledge. I couldn't help myself. I closed my door and moved my desk chair over to the opposite wall so I could listen. They just talked at first, at length too. They went back and forth for like three hours, talking, sharing, joking, laughing, 
even whispering. I know it all sounds creepy, but this is an anonymous story, which almost makes it a confession. So I'll say it was exciting to eavesdrop on them. It became my new favorite hobby for the rest of the school year. And I wasn't alone. The guys that stayed on the other side of the dorms in question were just as enthralled. We actually became buddies over our shared enjoyment of listening in. We'd high five in the hallways, talk after class, compare notes on different things that we were hearing and what the girl looked like. The guy in the dorm room in question quickly became a small celebrity on campus, at least for the Whitney building. He'd take requests from people in the building, like what sounds we wanted to hear, words said, things like that. It was almost like we were making our own interactive porno. The guy in the room, we'll just call him Hank, absolutely loved the attention. As the school year went on, Valentine's Day was just around the corner. Me and the guys in the room on the other side, I'll call him Mike and Tim, got pretty excited at the prospect. What could possibly happen on the lover's holiday? We joked about getting popcorn, drilling a peephole, all kinds of weird and creepy stuff, I know. You can imagine our disappointment when we realized for whatever reason, we had a long holiday weekend that week. Between the bad weather and the extra days off from class, most of the student body and faculty were dismissed from campus. What that means is, most people went home. Whitney Building was a ghost town, especially for those who stayed behind. In all of the Whitney Building, it was just me and one of the guys from the other room, Tim. Tim and I shacked up in my room, played cards, listened to music, watched movies. It was a very bachelor style living, eating everything out of fast food bags, being loud, not showering. That was until we heard someone come to the front door of the main room. Only someone with a key could open up the Whitney building, so that meant a student or a staff member. No outside visitors unless we opened up the door for them. Tim and I quietly just stared at one another, waiting to hear who it was. We were a little creeped out, almost like we'd been caught doing something wrong, so we just stayed totally silent. The reality was, we didn't have any drugs or anything, so we're in the clear. We just listened as they came down the hall, not up the stairs. Either someone who lived in our wing or someone coming to check in on us. Maybe a janitor had seen the light through the blinds on my window and was coming to turn it off. Our eyebrows raised and our breath hitched when we heard footsteps stop in front of the room right next door. It was the hometown hero. And as we listened, we could actually hear the pitter-patter of two sets of feet. It was the guy and his girlfriend come home early to get a quick bounce in before class started back up. We were giddy with excitement, but even then, we could tell something was different right away. There wasn't any of the excited whispering in the hall or the frantic energy to get naked once the door closed. All the actions sounded heavy, irritated. We kept listening, just staring into each other's eyes, waiting to find out what the hell was going on. Then. They started arguing. Something had happened during their first Valentine's Day together, apparently on their visit back at someone's house, and now they were mad at one another. That was at least the vibe that I got. Before long, they started arguing, nitpicking. It was such a change in the demeanor from what we were used to. Then the screaming started, and the slamming around. Finally, they started fighting for real, and Tim and I didn't know what to do. Clearly, this guy had no clue that we were here. Neither of us were particularly good friends with him, but at this point, something needed to happen. The fighting escalated from screaming to throwing one another around until finally, there was a big thump and then a gurgling. Tim and I jumped up to our feet, sprinted into the hall and through the guy's door. Thank God it wasn't locked because when we got in there, he was choking his girlfriend up against the wall. The same wall that I shared with him and the same wall I'd been listening through for four months. I shouted for him to stop and that we were going to call the police, but Tim went berserk. He speared this guy in a flying tackle and smashed him into the desk. At this point, the girl collapsed onto the floor and then tried crawling over to me. I got her up and led her to my room and then went back to join the fray. Just in time too. That guy had gotten out from underneath Tim, 
and was starting to get the best of him. I jumped on his back and tied his arms up, pulled him to the floor, and by then, Tim was back on top of him. We didn't kick his ass or anything, we just subdued him the best that we could until we could get the police there. They hauled that guy off and we didn't really ever see him again. We saw that girl around campus, but I don't think she really remembered us. They were both almost blackout drunk when that happened, which was a contributing factor to the violence. That girl finished the semester and switched schools. The guy spent at least one night behind bars and I think ended up on probation. I, on the other hand, stopped eavesdropping and developed some much more healthy hobbies. Still, if Tim and I hadn't been chronic weirdos that semester, we may not have been around to save that poor girl. I think I speak for everyone when I say that wasn't the Valentine's Day that any of us had in mind. I'm a female in my mid-40s. I live alone in a very rural area, on an island in the middle of Puget Sound. It's a 30 minute drive to the nearest grocery store, an hour away from the largest city. The island is made up of tall evergreen trees and surrounded by water. It's secluded, but beautiful. My house is situated on a tall bluff, overlooking a tiny inlet. It's just a short jaunt through the forest, down to a sandy beach where my kayaks are stored on a slip. I just need to pull them off the slip and then over the sea wall, and I'm on the water. There came a time when I found myself newly single. My last long-term relationship collapsed when I discovered he had several other romantic interests. Apparently, his business trips weren't all business. He moved out and I attempted to move on. I had some friends encouraging me to put myself out there. Have a fling or two, you'll feel better about yourself. It was well-intentioned advice. I knew what they were getting at. If I started dating again, I would stop feeling like this forlorn, broken-hearted woman who was about to celebrate the 20th anniversary of her 25th birthday. If I started dating again, I would feel attractive and desirable. But how exactly could you start dating again when you live in the middle of nowhere? A coworker pointed out that no one really meets organically anymore. Everything's done online nowadays. Tinder, Plenty of Fish, Bumble, OkCupid. So I went about setting up online profiles and it wasn't long before I was overwhelmed with messages. The flings did happen. On one hand, the new relationship energy I experienced was a good distraction. And on the other hand, I found myself making comparisons between these new guys and my ex. Often they were positive. This guy always asked me about my day. My ex rarely did that. Sometimes the comparisons were more about the things that I missed. He doesn't hold doors open for me like my ex used to. Or his hand doesn't fit into mine the way my exes did. And that made me realize I jumped back into the dating pool way too quickly. All these mental comparisons were a sign I was still longing for the relationship I had. I wasn't ready for anything new yet. So I decided to focus on myself, which is what I should have done from the start. I hiked all over the island. I kayaked. I trained my brilliant mini Aussie to use those talking buttons. I poured myself into my career. I rescued a kitten that was thrown from the window of a moving SUV driving right in front of me. To this day, my Aussie loves her kitty brother. They are still the best of friends. I bought a bright pink suitcase and I traveled everywhere. I learned to shoot a recurve bow. I did all the things that I've wanted to do and put off doing for some reason or another. Almost two years had passed now and I very rarely thought about my ex. And if I did, it was an apathetic in nature. That's when I knew I was ready to embrace someone new. So I logged on to my dating apps once more. It wasn't long after that. I received a message from a seemingly handsome and intelligent lawyer. He lived in a larger city about an hour and a half from me. We messaged back and forth on the app for a few weeks, getting to know one another. Thus far, he hadn't set up any red flags. I was hopeful. Finally, he asked me to invite him over to my place. Nope, red flag number one. 
I wasn't about to be in the middle of nowhere with someone who was still a stranger to me. And I'm sure he didn't suggest coming over to my place just to hold hands with me. I told him I didn't know him well enough to have him over to my place yet. He told me he understood and then invited me to dinner. He offered to let me pick the restaurant. I was hesitant. I was still contemplating red flag number one. That I really want to commit to spending an entire evening with this guy. After he insinuated that he was after more than dinner. But then again, he might not have been after anything but holding hands, right? I mean, he didn't come out right and say it directly. He wanted to roll around the sheets. And he was quick to understand when I said no to him coming over. But dinner? What if I got creepy vibes after just a few minutes? I suggested we meet for drinks first in the bar of one of my favorite Japanese steakhouse restaurants. It was about equal travel distance for us. I said if things went well, I would agree to stay on for dinner too. He said that sounded great and we planned a day and a time to meet. We continued messaging one another throughout the week and I really found myself liking this guy more and more. We seemed to have a lot of commonalities and interest. The previous red flag was all but forgotten now. The day of our scheduled date finally arrived. I debated on what to wear. I finally settled on a black blouse with a ruffled front, fitted blue jeans and black boots. I curled my hair, put on a little makeup, and nervously started my hour-long drive to that restaurant. I intentionally arrived early, ordered a drink, and sat where I could see the entrance doors of the restaurant. I was the only one in this bar. Here's where I need to explain that I'm not really that much of a drinker. I'll do it socially on occasion, but I don't do it that often. So I was slowly sipping on my drink, and I wasn't in a hurry to finish it. Besides, I still had an hour-long drive home ahead of me, so I wasn't trying to get sloshed. He walked in, right on time, and surprisingly, looked exactly like his profile pictures. He was the epitome of tall, dark, and handsome, and I was already smitten. I watched as he approached the hostess station and explained he was meeting someone in the bar. She motioned him over to me, and I smiled, giving a small wave. He sauntered over to where I was sitting and took the chair across from me. He smiled and exclaimed, Wow, you're even more beautiful than their profile pictures. Then he looked down and saw the amaretto sour sitting right in front of me, and a slight frown creased his brow. You already ordered a drink? Yep, I started without you, so you better catch up. He smiled again. Is that a challenge? He asked as he flagged over the bartender. As we sat there, our conversation flowed easily. He was intelligent and charming. I realized I interpreted the first red flag incorrectly, and I wanted to spend more time getting to know him better. By the time we finished our drinks, he suggested having the hostess seat us for dinner, and I was all in. In an effort to set the scene for you, this was a hibachi grill restaurant. If you've never been to one, picture a large rectangular stainless steel grill surrounded on all three sides by seating. On each of the shorter two sides, there are three seats. On the long side, directly in front of the grill, there are six seats. It's considered communal style eating, meaning you are seated next to complete strangers. When the hostess sat us, there were only two seats left at that particular grill, one on the end of a short side that was directly adjacent to the end seat on the long side. Instead of being seated shoulder to shoulder, we were sitting at the corner of the rectangle, with me seated on the short side and him on the long side, my left knee almost touching his right knee. It was ideal because we didn't have to turn to talk to one another. However, it left me with the stranger on my right side, and he had a stranger on his left side. If you're at all extroverted, communal dining can be a really fun experience where you can meet new people and participate in interesting conversations. If you're introverted, you can just ignore everyone around you and pretend you're dining alone. I'm not extroverted, but I also don't mind communal dining experiences, especially when they involve good food. Our waiter came over to take our drink orders, and Lawyer Man quite boldly attempted to order another alcoholic beverage for me. Oh, no thank you. I looked back and forth between him and the waiter, explaining, 
I'll have just water. I still have to drive home. That same frown from earlier now rolled across his face again. And very curly, he said, We're going to be here for a while yet. You can have one more. He looked up at the waiter. She'll have another, glancing back to me. What were you drinking again? An amaretto sour, but he cut me off, practically barking at the waiter. Just bring her another amaretto sour. I was stunned into silence, and so was everyone seated around us. And this was red flag number two, and for me it was a big one. For the first time that evening, he turned his phone over and looked at it. Then he typed something. I assumed he was just responding or sending a text. He flipped it upside down and set it back down on the table. He smiled again, then asked me what I was going to eat for dinner. It was almost like he just pushed play again because everyone around us breathed this collective sigh of relief and then went back to what they were doing. Myself, I was still stuck on pause. However, it took me a long moment to respond to his question because a huge part of me wanted to say nothing and put down my menu and get up and walk away, but I didn't do that. The hungry part of me wanted to stay for the food, so I finally answered. Uh, I think I'm going to have the hibachi filet. Just like Jekyll and Hyde, he returned to his previous charming self. He was attentive, caring. He kept pointing out to the artwork painted on the walls. I'd turn around to look, but I really didn't find it nearly as interesting as he did. I was still stuck on that red flag number two, so our conversation didn't quite flow as easily as before. There were a lot of lulls in between it, which gave him an opportunity to keep looking at his cell phone. He made sure to keep it angled away from me as it occupied more and more of his time. This was red flag number three. At one point, the man seated on the other side of him glanced at his cell phone screen and I'll never forget the look on his face. It was a combination of shock and disgust. He quickly turned to the woman he was with and whispered something in his ear. Then she looked shocked as well. Although I was privy to this, my date was completely oblivious as he busily sent another message. I asked him, is everything okay? Totally fine, just work, a case I'm working on, boring stuff. You're not drinking your drink. I am, just slowly. I took another tiny sip. Red flag number four. Why did he want me to drink this drink so damn badly? We alternated between stilted conversation and this new obsession with his cell phone until our chef arrived to cook and serve our food. He'd never been to a bocce restaurant before, so he was enamored with this whole process. The chef twirled around his spatula, tossed an egg into the air and caught it in his hat, created a volcano on the grill with the onion slices, and cooked our food to perfection. My date actually left his phone face down at the table the entire time. As we started to eat, however, he was back to being on the phone off and on. The guy seated next to him would glance at the phone screen, then whisper again to his date. His date looked up at me. She clearly wanted to say something, but couldn't. I figured he was probably back on the dating app messaging someone else, and that probably looked scandalous to them. For all they knew, we were married, and he was just some cheating bastard. But it mattered not. I remained fixated on red flag number two. This would be our last date. I knew I didn't want to see him again after tonight. As everyone at the table was in some stage of finishing their meal, he removed the napkin from his lap and set it out on his plate, pushing back his chair. I'm going to go to the restroom, and when I get back, I'm going to make sure you finish that drink. But before I could even protest, I watched as the couple seated next to him looked over at me their eyes as wide as saucers. They turned their attention to him, walking away. When they were sure he was out of earshot, the girl turned to her partner and shakily uttered, You don't tell her I will. He acknowledged her with a deep sigh, turning to me, very matter-of-factly. He said, First off, we think he spiked your drink with something. When you kept turning around to look at the art, it looked like you put something in your drink. He was definitely messing with it, so do not drink that. Secondly, he's texting someone. Another guy, I think. What? Another guy? 
confused. I listened intently as he continued. I think he's trying to drug you, so him and this other guy he's texting can do awful things to you. He's saying stuff like, we can tie her up and take turns with her. And the other guy is saying, let's use her up before we get rid of her. I don't know, but I think maybe you need to leave before he gets back here. The girl then anxiously stammered, it's too late, here he comes. I swiveled around in my seat just in time to see him quickly stride over and take his seat between us again. Now, he announced as he sat back down, about that drink. I had difficulty looking at him. I shared one glance with the couple and then forced myself to make eye contact with them as I stood and then grabbed my purse. I know, I know, I need to finish it and I will, I promise. But it's my turn to use the bathroom now. So I'll be back in a few minutes and then you can watch me finish my drink. I'm pretty sure my voice cracked, but even if it did, he didn't seem to notice. I turned and started walking toward the restrooms before he could even respond to me. As luck would have it, this particular restaurant's restrooms were located directly next to the entrance door, which also happened to be the same doors you exit. I turned down a corridor, silently thanking my good fortune that he wouldn't be able to see me actually leaving. I marched right past the bathrooms and out the restaurant doors and into the frigid night air. My hands were shaking as I unlocked my car door and got inside, immediately locking the door behind me. Somehow, I anticipated him running after me, trying to chase me down in the parking lot. That didn't happen. I started the car almost hyperventilating. As I exited the parking lot, I gulped in deep breaths of air, holding each one in my pounding chest before slowly exhaling. I frantically checked my rearview mirror. No one. No charming, handsome psychopath. Just me in traffic. About 20 minutes into my drive, I received the first message. Are you okay? I'm worried about you. A few minutes later. Did you fall in? <laughs> in all seriousness, please tell me if I can help you in any way. Then a few minutes after that. I just had the hostess go check on you. She said there's no one in there. You fucking left? What the f***? You're a fucking bitch. As more and more texts came through, I silently cursed myself for not having blocked him on the app before I left. I debated pulling over just to do that, but I wanted to get home, to put more distance between me and that would-be maniac rapist. I was still shaking so badly despite having the seat warmers on and heat blasting away in my car. As I stopped at the gate entrance to my house, I pushed the remote button to the gate and watched it roll open. My thoughts then drifted back to my ex, whom I hadn't even considered in eons. I silently thanked him for the sense of paranoia that had driven me to install a private gate in the middle of nowhere. I never did give this guy any direct information about where I lived, but even still, living on a gated property made me feel a little better. I parked in my driveway and practically ran for my car inside my house. I secured the lock and deadbolt. Looking out my living room window into the darkness of the forest filled me with a sense of dread, so I just headed upstairs. It was then that I looked at my phone. There were 17 more messages, all of them filled with hate and vile. I quickly took screenshots of all of our conversations, all his angry messages, and blocked him. But that wasn't enough. I also deleted my account on the app and then all the other apps too because I didn't want him to be able to run across me on another platform. I debated calling the police, but I didn't have any proof. I'm sure the restaurant had thrown away my drink long ago. I didn't get any of the other couple's information. I didn't actually see the text myself, but then I thought, what if my story is familiar? What if he's done this before? Who do I report it to? Not my sheriff's department, but maybe his city's? But what if he doesn't really live in the city that he says he does? I finally decided to report it to the non-emergency line of the city that we'd eaten dinner in. I honestly thought nothing would come of my report, but I'd done my due diligence. I didn't feel safe for a long time after that, especially at night. The blue herons arrived that spring, building their nests in tall pine trees on the bluff. They call out in these deep squawks to each other late at night sounding like what I imagined dinosaurs sounded like millions of years ago. 
Their cries used to fascinate me. Now, they frighten me. I don't often leave my house. My logical part of my brain would remind me that I was careful. You didn't give him enough information to know exactly where you lived. He doesn't know. You're safe. But my panicked, anxious brain would fill all the what-ifs. What if he figured it out? What if he starts searching and runs across you? You have an internet presence. What if he stumbles across it? What if the herons are crying out because he's lurking in the dark cover of the forest and they're trying to warn you? About six months later while in town, after work one day, I was doing some volunteer gardening at the local elementary school's garden. And this good looking guy, wearing a button up shirt, jeans and glasses, nervously approached me. He staggered through a few awkward questions about the garden and explained that he was a civil engineer who was working with the crew half a block up the street. They were putting in a ladder to help the salmon run. It was clear he was nervous. He hesitated, trying to think of something more to say, but probably thought better of it and then said goodbye. He took a few steps in the direction of the crew working on the salmon ladder and then stopped, turned around and faced me. Uh, look, you're really pretty, like stunning actually. I don't know what I'm doing here, but uh, do you think I could have your number? I smiled and put my number into his phone. As it turns out, you can meet people organically, without needing some kind of app. Fast forward about another six months, engineer guy and I are watching the evening news, when I see the handsome, cell phone addicted lawyer's mugshot flash across the screen. Next to his, another guy's mugshot. They've been arrested and charged with multiple counts of drugging and raping women, and two counts of murder. Subsequently, I was interviewed by an investigator for the prosecutor's office, and our conversation was recorded as my official statement. The investigator filled me in a little more. This pair was caught when the handsome lawyer invited himself over to his last victim's house. His accomplice followed him over there and waited until she'd been drugged. They weren't so careful this time. A nosy neighbor jotted down the car's license plate because he thought it was odd that some guy was just sitting in a car for hours and hours while staring up at this poor girl's house. Oh, and lawyer guy wasn't really a lawyer. And although the investigator explained I may be called out to testify, in the end, psychotic wannabe lawyer guy and his friend both pled guilty, so I never had to face him in court. That spring when the blue herons squawked in their deep cries, I was finally able to appreciate it again knowing that those two were in prison, and I was no longer afraid. It had all gone down around Valentine's Day, which was kind of an odd justice in my mind. These assholes were getting what they deserved, and I was getting to spend the time with the person that I cared about. I survived and they had to suffer. I was able to reflect on that on my first Valentine's Day in years. I'm sure there's probably more than one life lesson in all of this, but if you take away anything from my story, Take away this. Do not ignore red flags. Don't make excuses for them. Don't brush them off. If something sets off your dating red flag spidey senses, pay very close attention to them because it can mean the difference between living or dying. My story is kind of weird to tell. It took place in high school, so all the people involved are underage. Regardless, this was a very creepy Valentine's Day experience that ruined the idea of romanticism for me for many, many years. My senior year, I started dating a girl who was only a sophomore. The reality was that I was young for my grade, just barely turned 17, and she was old for her grade, going on 16. We were two grades apart, but really only had less than a year in difference in age. We'll call my girlfriend Ashley. Ashley and I weren't really supposed to be dating. She was a good girl, came from a good family, but we just clicked and liked spending time together. Her parents thought I was a bad influence and they really were put off by me being a senior. There was no one explaining the actual linear timeline of us only being 11 months apart. They just didn't even care. I was bad news from start to finish. That part really didn't bother me though, 
In fact, it probably made Ashley want to hang out with me even more. Our routine was this. I'd swoop her up from the bus stop around 7.30 in the morning, hang out until school would start. We'd see each other between classes, at lunch, wherever we could on campus. We'd hang out for 45 minutes or an hour or so after school, usually alongside the perimeter of one of the baseball fields. Then we'd split ways, head home or do whatever hobby we had going on. I was into romping around in my blazer, fishing, football, pretty average small town high school boy stuff. Ashley was in an after school art club that met a few times a week, which was to cover for why she was late coming home sometimes. The other time that we would rendezvous was around midnight, sometimes 1 a.m. I lived what is now called a latchkey lifestyle. As a teenager, meaning my parents were rarely around, and when they were, they weren't really interested in what I was doing. Ashley, on the other hand, was under what I would call lock and key. Her parents monitored her pretty well. This was before cell phones, so it was somewhat limited to what we had to do to be sneaky. I'd leave from my house, take the back roads to the neighborhoods, then kill my engine just a block up from her house. I'd roll down the hill and stop just up from her house. Ashley would usually be waiting for me. She'd hop in and I'd let the truck roll the rest of the way down the hill. Only after getting maybe a quarter of a mile away would I fire the engine back up and then roar off into the night. There was a place just outside of town that's kind of like a big parking lot in the middle of nowhere. It was the rec lot. A lot of people used it to offload their quads and snowmobiles, depending on the season. From that lot, you could follow dirt trails into pretty remote wilderness. In the middle of the night, there was never anybody else there, except for Ashley and I in my dingy red Chevy. We'd hang out until 3 or 4 in the morning, sometimes just sleep. Then I'd drop her off at home just before sunrise. We did this nearly every night for almost a year. It was exhausting, but being young and head over heels, it was really easy to keep up with. Honestly, it was all we wanted to do. We had delusions of living together, having kids, the whole idea of a future. It was very cheesy, but I bet you had a similar relationship once too. It's Valentine's Day. I believe it fell on a Friday, if memory serves. Ashley and I were keen to celebrate too. I went and picked her up at the usual spot, the usual routine, except this time I had a bouquet of flowers, a box of chocolate, a handwritten card, even a teddy bear and balloon. I had never bought anything like this for a girl before, so I kind of went all out, obviously. We got to our spot and exchanged gifts. We didn't do it at school because she couldn't risk bringing flowers or anything like that home. That stuff stayed up front. We slipped in the back and everything started to get hot and heavy. The back seat of my blazer were perpetually laid down flat, so we did have as much room as possible. An hour of kissing, heavy petting, and things start to get more serious. Clothes start to come off. Blah, blah, blah. Things move forward. Ashley ends up on top of me. She takes her shirt off then looks up straight through the windshield, and when she does this, she freezes. I think there's somebody over there, she says to me. Ash and I spent a lot of time together, so we would mess with each other all the time. I quickly assumed that that was what was happening now. She was trying to get me scared to tease me, and I said, Oh yeah, does he like what he sees? Ashley covered herself up and started to panic. And that's when I knew she wasn't messing around. I rolled her over, told her to get dressed, and then yanked on my jeans. The whole time I'm doing this, I'm staring through the windshield. Far off, all the way on the other side of the parking lot. It looks like there's just someone standing there. I can faintly see a silhouette by the light of the moon, but it's not enough for me to be sure. I didn't have a gun or anything, we were just kids, but I did have a crowbar that I kept in the back. And of course, a 10 inch mag light. I get myself together, and just as I reach for the door handle, we can hear some hollering outside. I freeze up immediately. Honestly, I wasn't feeling very brave to begin with. And now that the guy was screaming, I had no interest in getting out of the car. Instead, I hit the lock. We hunkered down with the big blanket that I had, and waited. The guy lets out a few more shrieks rip across the parking lot and started pacing back and forth. Now I knew he was really there. 
Part of me had been hoping it was just some weird shadow from the moon, but no luck. This guy looked agitated and sounded even crazier. Ashley reminded me that we had the key. We could just speed out of here. And I realized that that was the best move. This guy was obviously trying to mess with us, maybe even something worse. So I made the executive decision that it was time to go. I start creeping into the front seat, exposing myself to the moonlight, and therefore becoming visible. Something happens. I watch as the guy stops pacing and then just runs off into the tree line. This is spooky because town is a good seven or eight miles away, but it's a relief more than anything, honestly. I whisper to Ashley that he left, but she's not having it at first. We spent countless evenings hanging around this parking lot. We've never seen a soul. For there to be a grown man stalking around the perimeter, it's more than weird. I did my best to calm her down, and after a while, everything seemed to go back to normal. We didn't hear any more yelling, and we no longer saw the guy. We told ourselves a story. He was just some local drunk, stumbling his way back to town. We went back to kissing, did the dirty, and then promptly passed out in the back seat. It was only 2.30 or so in the morning, so we had a little time before I had to get her home. I hadn't been asleep for more than 15 minutes when I heard something that I couldn't place. It's so strange that I cracked my eyes open. My first thought is that shouting guy had returned. He's skulking around the outside of my blazer. I look back and forth between the windows until I see it. The rolling shadow of something passing along the backside of the truck. It glides off before coming by again, this time in the opposite direction. It's a car, no doubt about it. I feel a sense of relief because their headlights are off, being sneaky, so I assume whoever is driving is a kid like me. I check the clock and watch the car roll on by, and then try to get a few more minutes of sleep. Just as I close my eyes, Someone bangs on the back of my window of my blazer so hard that I think it's going to shatter. My eyes bug out, my heart stops, and I'm waiting to hear what the hell is going on. Again, my mind returns to that weirdo from earlier. I remember the car driving by and get hopeful for a second that some kids are just pranking us. Maybe this whole thing has been a prank itself. It's the opposite. Ashley asked me what's going on, now awake from all the commotion. Before I can answer, a man shouts from the outside. Get out of the car! It's Ashley's dad, and we both know it, as I can feel all the hope and confidence in our chest deflate in a second. We huddle together, terrified of whatever consequence waited for us outside. I figured he'd have a gun, maybe a bat, or just a length of rope, tie me to the back bumper of his car, and drag my stupid ass back to town. Ashley asked me what we should do, but the fear in her voice is all I can hear. I finish putting on the rest of my clothes, take a deep breath, and tell her to do the same. I'm going to buy some time by going out and talking with them. I step out and get hit by his high beams. He waited for me to open up the door before he turned them on. I hear his car door slam and then footsteps on the way over. I don't brace or cover up in any way. If he's going to beat me up, I'll let him. I probably scared the guy half to death taking his daughter out of the house in the middle of the night. He stops short and pigeon chests me against the truck and then starts berating me. Who the hell do I think I am? I'm lucky the sheriff isn't out here and he isn't pressing charges. He threw everything at me that you can imagine from insults to threats. The guy never laid a finger on me. I apologized and agreed with everything he said until Ashley finally climbed out the other side. Her dad looked us both up and down, asked if we wanted to share any last words. I told her I loved her, and she said the same, and she got in her dad's car. Her dad walked me up and down again, but this time his energy was a little different. He told me I'd never see her again, and then drove off back to town. I spent a good 45 minutes out there just trying to catch my breath. What a crazy night it turned out to be. From this weirdo serial killer looking guy to Ashley's father banging on my window. I literally couldn't believe what had all gone down. The road back to town sloped away from the parking lot that I was in, so I actually could see their headlights drifting further and further away. I counted myself lucky to be alive at all between both incidents. Never saw that weirdo again, but I did see Ashley many times as I asked her to marry me a few years after high school. 
Her father and I became good friends, spent a lot of weekends on fishing trips. It was truly full circle to become part of the family after putting him through so much grief. I attended his funeral a few years ago, even spoke the closing words. Ashley and I will celebrate our 40th Valentine's Day together this year.